great innovations start in the garage. Today we are exploring.
Good morning. Welcome, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Marcin Bozanski. I'm here with the Kazimir Pulaski Foundations, the organizers of this beautiful, fantastic event. And it's my enormous great pleasure to welcome you at the opening of the second day of the 2022 Warsaw Security Forum. We are very, very happy to greet you this morning. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, what an incredible, incredible day we have had during the first day. We have witnessed heads of state, heads of government, foreign ministers, ministers of defense pledge their firm support for Ukraine in their struggle, in their fight against the aggressor. We have seen military leaders and strategists discuss the defense of NATO, the defense of Europe against even the most daunting attack. And we saw what strategies could be taken forward. We have also heard from countless experts, from great, great specialists, looking at the most important security challenges of our time and finding solutions for it. Ladies and gentlemen, today, during the second day of the Warsaw Security Forum, we have much, much, much more to come. Let me give you a couple of, uh, a couple of housekeeping rules here today. Uh, we encourage everybody to use your social media. There's a hashtag WSF2022 uh, where you can share your thoughts and your experiences. Please do so. I will also welcome very, very warmly all our viewers online from all around the world who are joining us during the live stream of today's track. Um, also, if anybody would require translation, uh, we have simultaneous Ukrainian, Polish, and English. Uh, you can find the headsets uh, outside. Ladies and gentlemen, today uh, we are going to open the democratic resilience track of the Warsaw Security Forum. While security and defense are a threat, we are also fighting for the core of our values. And this is what today is about, discussing the values that connect us in the alliance that we're forming through NATO, through EU, through broadly Western countries. And we are going to look at what the challenges are and how to defeat them. Because it is the values that underpin us which lay at the core of what we are fighting for today. And we have an incredible group of guests that are going to join us panelists, great leaders who, who will discuss both the challenges to democratic resilience and how we can address them to secure uh, our, our way of life today and for generations to come at this pivotal moment in history. Ladies and gentlemen, so without further ado, uh, we will move to the first session of today. Uh, and I have the enormous great pleasure to invite for the session, the panel, values that we need to protect and how to discuss war with citizens in democracy. Incredibly important subject. Uh, a fabulous, great uh, moderator, uh, Madame Anya Weller, shock, uh, with the international editor for Der Tagesspiegel. Please, can I invite you to the stage uh, and ask you to introduce the, the guests. Good morning and welcome all to this very first panel. Thank you for the kind introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure for me um, to moderate this panel on such an important topic and how to discuss war with citizens in democracies with a very distinguished panel. Um, it's my pleasure to um, introduce to my right Rafael Traskowski, who has served as the mayor of Warsaw since 2018. He has already held several political positions, including that of Minister of Digitization for his country and member of the European Parliament. Mayor Traskowski, let me start by saying thank you very much for welcoming and hosting us in your beautiful city. And to my very right is um, Senator Chris Murphy, who has served as the junior senator from Connecticut since 2013. Um, times of crisis can be very trying for our democracies and the values that we have built our societies on. And the years of the pandemic and um, the consequent fallout have certainly shown that. 
With our panel today, we will be looking at how the Russian invasion has impacted public debate in both Poland and the US, and how we can strengthen the de democratic resilience of our societies to prevent negative fallout. With our panelists, we bring together two different perspectives on this issue. One from the US, which has of course been a key supporter in the Ukrainian pushback of the U uh, Russian aggression, but looks at the war, of course, from a distant perspective. And the other one from Poland, right next door, and the largest recipient country of Ukrainian refugees. Senator Murphy, um, let me start with you. Yesterday, the US announced a new 625 million security package for Ukraine. At your panel last night, you mentioned a statement by a Trump associate railing against a recent support package, which was published and then quickly removed. What is your assessment of the public debate on the Russian uh, invasion in Ukraine in the US? How strong are the voices opposing US support for Ukraine? Well, uh, first of all, it's wonderful to be with the mayor. Um, uh, thank him greatly for hosting us here uh, this week. Um, listen, the United States public remains squarely behind Ukraine, as evidenced by our ability to pass a new $12 billion authorization uh, just last week through the United States Congress with broad support from Republicans and Democrats. As I mentioned yesterday on this stage, if you travel throughout uh, the country, whether you're in a Republican-leaning state or a Democratic-leaning state, you're going to see Ukrainian flags out on the front porches of homes and businesses all across America. And I, I think there are many reasons uh, for that. Um, well, listen, we have a strong uh, Ukrainian-American and Polish-American constituency in the United States. But, um, you know, we're a country that um, has struggled with our own democracy, that maybe has taken our democracy for granted over the years. Um, we obviously had a very high-profile challenge to our democracy in uh, an attempted insurrection uh, in January of last year. And now we see Ukrainians um, putting their lives on the line to fight for democracy. We see how fragile it is. And maybe we have come to the conclusion that we should fight a little bit harder for ours. I do believe that there is a potential challenge to this consensus coming from President Trump. I do think his um, uh, political advisors are market testing some uh, messages of opposition to uh, continued aid to Ukraine. There certainly is a constituency in the United States who is always wary of sending aid overseas, and uh, Ukraine is certainly a long ways away. Um, but today, uh, I think Americans uh, are squarely behind the fight for Ukraine. I think they do worry about the post-World War II order falling apart. They have always been proud of the United States and NATO's role in defending that order. Uh, and right now, um, especially as the Ukrainians um, show such success and bravery on the battlefield, uh, continue to demand that both Republicans and Democrats uh, stand behind the Ukrainian army and the Ukrainian people. We're now uh, one month away from the U.S. midterm elections. Um, do you see the war in Ukraine having an impact on the elections? I, I, I don't, um, again, because right now um, there is really very little division between Republicans and Democrats. To the extent that there'd be any advantage to a candidate in the midterms on this issue, it would be uh, because a candidate isn't expressing enough support uh, for Ukraine. Um, and in fact, in the few instances where um, Republicans have voted against Ukraine aid, and there have been a handful of Republicans, some Trump loyalists who have voted against Ukraine aid, but a small handful, um, you know, they have been very defensive to explain why their votes against these um, budgets uh, were not related to the money for uh, Ukraine. So I I don't think this would be a, a factor in the midterms because of this consensus that I talked about. I think it's um, an outstanding question as to whether it will be an issue uh, you know, heading into the uh, presidential elections. Uh, a quick follow-up before I turn to you, Mayor Triskovsky. Um, you have been a, a strong advocate for um, stricter gun legislation. And when we look at the current um, security context, um, the, the war in Ukraine, recent tensions in the Strait of Taiwan with China, uh, narratives around a possible World War III scenario, um, do you find it even harder um, to rally support for um, uh, uh, gun control in the U.S.? 
Well, as much as the American public is very much focused on the security of Europe and the security of Ukraine, they are, of course, much more focused on their own security. And we are a country that has had a dramatic increase in gun violence. And that gun violence often comes at the hands of weapons of war. Uh, so you've seen a change in the American public over the last really four or five years, um, whereby there's now a consensus in the United States that there are certain weapons that need to be in the hands of the military. Uh, they want much more stricter control of handguns. And for the first time in 30 years, um, we were able to pass legislation this year uh, that begins to tighten uh, our laws around gun violence. Uh, and so, um, yes, in the United States, there, there is a, a, a celebration of the military. There is sometimes a um, what I would call a fetidization of military weaponry uh, in the United States, but um, the country is rethinking that position, and you're seeing now more support for a restriction of those military weapons in um, private hands than ever before. Mayor Truskovsky, um, Poland has been a true champion in welcoming refugees from Ukraine. Um, it is a country with the largest take-in uh, at the moment. Uh, about uh, 1.5 uh, million refugees are registered to be residing in Poland. Um, how has this been felt in Poland and particularly in your city of Warsaw? And do you risk, uh, see a risk that the warm welcome might be cooling off? Uh, first of all, good morning. Welcome to Warsaw. We're very glad that we're hosting this conference. What you've seen in, in Poland is this, this incredible uh, feeling of solidarity towards uh, our uh, brothers and sisters from Ukraine. It's, it's basically civil society in action. Of course, the central government did its part on the border, but uh, this welcoming was, was really done by the people, by non-governmental organizations, and of course, with the help of the local, uh, local governments. If you remember the crisis of 2015, the Mediterranean refugee crisis, there were 200,000 people coming to Europe in a month. And people were panicking, decision makers were panicking, uh, and we felt overwhelmed. Uh, 300,000 people came to Warsaw, to one city alone, in a matter of three weeks. And we, of course, welcomed them. Uh, many of them left Warsaw, they went uh, to other European countries, many of them returned to Ukraine, but we still have 200,000 Ukrainians uh, in our city, which means that the population of Warsaw has increased by 12% almost overnight. The problem is that most of what you've seen was uh, improvisation. I remember that uh, I had to call different cities in Europe and ask my friends, mayors of Amsterdam, Milan, and other cities to send us buses so that we could uh, send uh, people uh, to their cities and to their countries. Uh, there is no strategy on the national level. The Prime Minister has declared just a month ago that the refugee crisis is over. And unfortunately, sadly, there is also no uh, strategy on the European level because the Polish government didn't ask for it. So there is no voluntary relocation scheme. Uh, the budget is very, very small the new money which appeared uh, to actually help us out. And I know that that's a problem of the member states, not of the European Commission, because the European Commission and the European Parliament are well aware of the problem. Uh, by the way, I've seen American money on the ground first through uh, UN agencies than uh, European money. Thank you for that. Uh, my heart as a convinced European bleeds, as you can imagine. Uh, but, uh, but of course, uh, this uh, support is incredibly important, which came from the international community, uh, the United States um, as well. Now, what are the problems? The problem is, 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 is that, uh, yes, the support is still there, and it's, 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 not, it's not waning for, 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 for sure, but the problems are before us, long strategy. Uh, long-term uh, problems of education. We have 80,000 kids in Warsaw alone. We've uh, enrolled 20,000 kids already to our schools, but there's still 60,000 uh, in Warsaw. Healthcare, uh, social policy, and so on and so forth. Most of my psychologists who should work with the uh, inhabitants of Warsaw after two years of pandemic, after this vicious attack of this government on the LGBT community, uh, we need our psychologists. They work with, with refugees, and, and we are fine with that, but of course, that puts an enormous strain on the city, and we are at capacity. So uh, coming back to your question, uh, 
uh, the solidarity is still there. But if we do not have a strategy, if we do not share the burden, then of course uh, we might run into problems. Most of our Ukrainian friends are with us, with ordinary people. And once the uh, winter comes and, and you know, the energy bills are soaring, many people might say, you know, I cannot do it anymore. So the situation might get much more tricky, uh, and that's why we uh, should be watching closely what's going uh, to happen. But the Ukrainians, and that's what the senator said, I mean, we talk about values all the time. I mean, our Ukrainian friends are fighting for them and dying for them. So uh, we need to do our bid, uh, because in a certain sense, we are also on a battlefield here in Poland and in Europe. Everyone is watching. Every crazy despot in the world is watching. Whether we will stay united, whether we will still be tough, whether we will be welcoming, so we're also passing a test. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Traskowski. Um, you mentioned uh, the coming winter, rising prices, energy crisis. Um, what could be done to prevent uh, social unrest or uh, growing hostilities? Well, as I've said, uh, we, we need a strategy. Uh, we need financial support. We need European solutions. Uh, because otherwise it will be immensely difficult to deal with, uh, with the uh, effects of the war. Uh, the solidarity is there. The West was united. Uh, we were quite tough and uh, different, completely different reaction to that of 2014-15. Thanks, thanks, thanks God for that. But now, we, we, now we're really facing a test. Because now uh, there will be a price to be paid by our citizens with the soaring prices of energy, with inflation, and so on and so forth. Uh, and now uh, the task of all European and international decision makers is to fight the fatigue syndrome uh, and to keep on convincing people that if we relent, uh, if we renege on some of our promises, if we are not going to support Ukraine militarily, uh, then uh, we're going to fail as a transatlantic community. Well, you mentioned the fatigue syndrome, and I think um, uh, communication is key in times of crises. How can we bridge the dilemma? How um, can governments, politicians, experts uh, communicate transparently with their public about uh, looming threats, about uh, current crisis scenarios, um, while um, avoiding fear-mongering and panic among their population? Senator Murphy. Well, I think, you know, in the United States, um, the danger is that the war in Ukraine fades from the front pages and uh, from the top of news shows and uh, American, the, the, uh, the attention of the American public begins to fade. Now, over the course of the last 30 days, it's been back in front of the American public because of high-profile incidents like the attack on the pipeline and the uh, heroic progress of the Ukrainian people. But I think to the mayor's point, um, you know, we are trying to explain this in um, terms that the American public can understand, that this is a means to prevent future conflict, that the Chinese in particular are, are very much watching what happens here in Ukraine and their battle plans for Taiwan may be dependent on whether they see the Russian forces stop and whether they see the Russian economy falling apart. And, um, you know, China is very much a, a present daily conversation in the United States. Um, so there is an ability to message to the American people that this is, yes, about standing up for the Ukrainian people, um, but this is also about making sure that the United States doesn't get dragged into future conflicts. Now, it, admittedly, you know, we don't, feel the, the pain in the, the same way right now that um, perhaps Poland does. We have inflation, but not as high. We have energy prices that are um, increased above 2021 levels, but not as high as they are in Europe. So the, the, the pain is significant in the United States, but it's not at the, the same level as it is right now in parts of Europe. And so um, that doesn't mean that the American public are enthusiastic to Uh, endure that, but they, I think right now, see the connection between um, the prices that they are having to pay and the long-term benefit to U.S. national security. But again, um, you know, this, th there is a real risk that if we go back into a period of time in which people in the United States aren't hearing news about Ukraine, it will be just a little bit harder for leaders to explain why we continue to authorize 
12 billion, 20 billion dollars of taxpayer assistance for um, for this mission. I, I think we can do it. It just becomes uh, trickier. Um, I want to turn to the um, threat of disinformation. Um, uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki yesterday mentioned that um, Eastern Europe has uh, ample experience with um, uh, disinformation, but that the, he feels that the West has underestimated uh, this uh, threat so far. Um, Mayor Trzaskowski, how can we fight disinformation? How can we make sure that um, our societies are resilient against um, disinformation and political interference by bad actors? Well, yes. I mean, unfortunately, uh, our friends uh, uh, sometimes were wrong on many accounts. Uh, uh, but also when it comes to the uh, disinformation campaigns and the threat uh, coming from Russia, I mean, it is immense. I mean, wherever there is conflict, uh, wherever the, there are elections which are hanging by a thread, I mean, the Russians are, are there. Uh, and it's not just mischief. I mean, they are undermining our democracies everywhere. And this is one of the most serious threats. And this is not just like me, you know, picking up uh, a phone uh, and, and then having a Zoom conversation with a guy who uh, looks and speaks like Vitaly Klitschko, and then it turns out it was just some pranksters, pranksters from Russia, uh, of course, there to discredit Klitschko, to discredit, uh, to discredit other mayors. Uh, because that's relatively benign compared to what they do to our public uh, discourse. And this is incredibly important that, that we have tools at our disposals to fight it and that uh, also American companies, this is very important on, on the net, uh, make their efforts to, to take it down, to expose it, because otherwise our public will be, will be uh, disinformed all the time and manipulated into taking the wrong uh, decisions. Of course, that also puts uh, an enormous responsibility on some, of our, on some of our governments because some of our governments are also spreading propaganda and lies. Uh, so this is important that if you want to, you know, uh, point a finger at something, you, you should be uh, um, uh, heeding the call yourself. But this is one of the most important threats, that we are being manipulated, that, uh, that our democracy is being undermined, and, and that this is real information warfare. Uh, so, uh, I know that the European Commission is doing a lot in order to counter that, uh, but we should be doing more, much more, especially when it comes to, to the internet, especially when it comes to the social media. We need to expose it, we need to take it down, uh, we need to verify the information. And the last thing I want to say is education. Uh, I have kids, my, 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 my daughter is 17, my son is 13, they, sometimes I sit with them, we talk, uh, we check out the homework and so on, and I always say, what's your source? I mean, you know, Google, with all due respect, is not the only source of information. Uh, and Google verifies its information mostly, but sometimes you just get information out of the blue on the internet. So verify your information. And you have to teach children uh, to do exactly uh, that. And I know that American companies are working on it to also verify information and uh, to have uh, special techniques in order to fight misinformation and lies, but we need to do more. And we need to teach our children that they need to verify uh, the information that they use. This is a very important skill that we need to, we need to teach. Thank you, Mayor. And Senator Murphy, how can we fight disinformation without impeding freedom of speech, for example? Well, listen, I agree wholeheartedly with the mayor. We are simply not doing enough. Uh, years ago, um, uh, I wrote legislation along with R Republican Senator Rob Portman uh, establishing something called the Global Engagement Center. And this is a capacity of the State Department that helps fund um, independent uh, and objective media around the world that fight disinformation, um, the fact checkers, the truth tellers. And you know, we put about 60 to $80 million a year into that program. That's a drop in the bucket compared to the amount of money that the Chinese and the Russians are spending on disinformation. It just makes absolutely no sense that we are not um, putting more money into combating, dis combating disinformation globally. Uh, the, the problem in the United States is that this is becoming a very partisan issue right now. Um, Republicans increasingly take the position that the social media companies should engage in 
zero content moderation um, because their belief is that that content moderation is somehow um, uh, subverting and, and depressing conservative voices. So you are about to potentially have Elon Musk take over Twitter um, with a promise that he will not only allow President Trump back onto the platform, but um, really ramp down a lot of the efforts to stamp out the most extreme voices. So we're in a difficult position in the United States because um, one party right now is not taking seriously the issue of making sure that some of these incredibly nefarious actors aren't spreading lies online. At the very least, though, in the United States, um, the, the, the foreign-run media, um, we can do something about that. So we have um, a radio station, for instance, in Washington, D.C., one of the most powerful stations in Washington, D.C. that is owned by Sputnik Radio. So you have literally Russian propaganda being piped into the nation's capital every single day. You have TikTok, still largely unregulated in the United States, a Chinese-owned um, uh, social media uh, app that is right now the most popular amongst uh, our, our children. So w we're having a difficult time in the United States when it comes to sort of what we do on social media platforms, but some of it shouldn't be as difficult. We should be putting more money into these international efforts and we should be drawing some brighter lines in the United States, especially when it comes to the foreign owned information uh, propaganda sites that right now are proliferating inside the United States. I just want to, I of course agree with, with, with the senator, uh, and yes, there is a debate about, of course, as always, freedom of speech and so on and so forth, but, I mean, most of the Russian propaganda is propagated by, uh, by uh, bots and by artificial sites, and, and, and these can be readily identified. So at least let's start with that. It should be not that controversial, because I mean, if there is a real people, if there is a real person behind it, then we can debate it, okay? And of course, there are some people who are paid to spread lies, uh, and so on and so forth. But most of the propaganda is just simply, you know, mechanically generated. So, so let's start with that, and I think that that should be at least relatively uncontroversial. And before we turn to the audience for one or two questions, um, I wanted to ask you, you, Mayor Treskovsky, to speak a little bit about the Pact of Free Cities that you started in 2019 with the countries from the Visegrad group. Um, has this made a difference in Warsaw and can this be a, a best practice for other cities to build resilient democratic societies? Well, yes. Uh, you know, there are quite a, quite a lot of networks of cities, uh, both in Europe and in the world. I'm also a, a proud member of the Committee of the Regions, uh, EuroCities, uh, C40, which fights with global warming. But we've decided to uh, create a network of cities who are a bit more political and who want to fight for uh, values of uh, democracy, transparency, uh, tolerance and openness. We started the four, uh, the four uh, mayors of the Visegrad countries, Budapest, Bratislava, Prague and, and, and Warsaw, because we also wanted to demonstrate that our part of Europe can also stand for freedom and, and transparency and tolerance in those difficult times. But then other cities joined, such as uh, uh, recently Berlin, uh, Brussels, uh, but also Paris, London, Los Angeles and so on and so forth. Uh, and we are sending a message that we can collaborate uh, that we uh, can learn from one another and that we can be a voice for uh, democracy. Because it somehow happens that populists uh, do not win cities. It is much, much more difficult for them. It is also about direct financing uh, from the European budget, a little bit for city initiatives and so on and so forth. And I'm very glad that uh, the uh, administration of, of President Biden has very similar ideas because they have created this pact uh, of cities for, for democracy uh, and signed a declaration signed by, by so many cities in different parts of the world. And in a certain sense, uh, we all are getting involved in global politics. Uh, look at Warsaw. Uh, when I was uh, becoming a mayor, people were saying, yeah, we will just look into the future, construct infrastructure, and so on and so forth. And it turned out that it's sixth wave of pandemic that we're dealing with. We're running 11 hospitals. That it's the war, the migration crisis, and so on and so forth. And suddenly, because uh, the government, uh, the current central government in Poland cannot deliver on its promises, uh, two days ago the deputy prime minister said that we should be selling coal and distributing coal. Those are the ideas that the government has. Anyhow, we are at the forefront of all uh, of those challenges that are before us. Global warming, digitization, uh, fighting misinformation and so on and so forth. So that's why the, the role of the cities, whether we like it or not, has become global 
and we better do something about it and we better be recognized as important actors, especially for those forces who want to fight for democracy, openness, freedom, transparency, and tolerance. Thank you, Mary, for this passionate plea. Um, I, I'd like to invite you to ask a question to the senator or to Mayor Troskowski. Um, if you're interested, please raise your hand. Yes, the gentleman over there. Please go to the microphone in the back and briefly introduce yourself. Uh, dear Mr. Mayor, dear Mr. Senator, uh, I would like to ask you a short question. How do you evaluate um, last Twitter of Elon Musk about Russian-Ukrainian Peace Act and should the leaders of, um, of public opinion of such scale to express their opinion on such uh, important political issues? Well, listen, I mean, this isn't the first time that Elon Musk has offered a controversial political uh, opinion. It's not that uh, people in the United States don't take his suggestions and opinions seriously, but they form their own. And right now, as the American people watch um, both the, the, the heroism and the effectiveness of the Ukrainian army's ability to take territory back, it seems like a particularly foolish time to be uh, advocating for uh, a capitulation. Um, uh, so um, at the same time that Elon Musk was suggesting that we give away territory to the Russians, the United States Congress, as I mentioned, was supporting a new $12 billion dollar authorization of military aid. Now, I think my position is the same as the Biden administration's position. It is up to the Ukrainian people uh, through their government to decide for themselves when and if there is a moment to sit down across the table from the Russians and um, enter into a negotiation. But uh, right now, the American people, I, I think I can safely say, have no interest in forcing that discussion to happen. In fact, right now, uh, the very opposite is occurring. We are trying to provide more leverage and more support for the Ukrainian military. I mean, I, I'm just going to quote uh, President Zelensky because just an hour after Elon Musk uh, tweeted, he also made a quiz. Which Elon Musk do you like more? The one who was helping Ukraine with Starlink and so on and so forth, or the one who is uh, trying to make political statements? That's for you to decide. Well. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we've already reached the end of our um, discussion, so I'd like to thank our two uh, panelists and, uh, and stress that um, with uh, the winter coming, that will certainly pose uh, challenges. We need to make sure to stress openly and transparently to citizens uh, to um, stand by the commitment to support um, our friends and partners in Ukraine. And with that, thank you very much, um, Senator yes. Murphy. And Mayor Treskovsky. If I may, I, I was always finishing with one sentence, which is enjoy Warsaw and spend as, as, as much money as you can. Uh, but in those, in those difficult times, uh, I, I want to say just one thing. Looking at this incredible courage and resilience of the uh, Ukraine, Ukrainian people, we in Warsaw, we are helping because we know when a crazy guy wants to wipe out your city from the map. That's what happened to Warsaw, which was destroyed in 90%. So when we see Ukrainian cities, we are absolutely certain that they will be rebuilt, that they will be dynamic, and this incredible courage of the Ukrainian people uh, will carry the country forwards. Slava Ukraini. Thank you.
thank you very much uh, for the speakers of the first panel. Thank you, Mayor Trzaskowski. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we will now move to the second session of the day, uh, and it will begin um, with uh, remarks by uh, a great leader, uh, by uh, Madame Svetlana Cichanowskaya, who is the leader of the democratic uh, movement for the Be Belarus democratic movement and a truly uh, inspiring figure to tell us uh, more about um, uh, the resilience in action and fighting for a democratic Belarus and protecting her independence from Russia. Madame Cichanowskaya, if we can invite you uh, to the stage for the opening remarks. So, dear excellencies, dear friends, dear Minister Mantas Adamenas, Minister Chaputovich, Honorable Oksana Ustinova, Honorable Steve Cohen, it's an honor for me to be here today with you. Two years ago, Belarus rose up against the bloody dictatorship that has been destroying the country for 27 years. Thousands of people took to the streets not because of economic or social problems, but first and foremost because they wanted self-respect and democratic freedoms. They wanted a real independent state. In 2020, Belarusians decisively chose their future, that of a free European nation. But with the help of Vladimir Putin, the dictator trampled over people's choice. A free and independent Belarus terrified both dictators. They needed a political desert from which to launch missiles at Ukraine and threaten peace in Europe. Our story is an example of resilience and unity that Belarusians have shown in the face of repressions. Over 50,000 of illegal detentions and 4,000 years of stolen lives for political prisoners made Belarusians face fear, but it hasn't divided us. We, we have stayed united against the full force of Lukashenko's repression since 2020. In 2022, we united in helping Ukraine to win. 86% of Belarusians are against Belarus' participation in Russia's war. You may have heard stories of our railway partisans who stopped Russian trains. Dozens of them face up 20 years of prison and same, some face death penalty. We keep our fingers crossed for our military volunteers in Ukraine. 15 lost their lives already. As I speak, Belarusian battalion is part of Ukraine's counteroffensive, chasing the invaders away. We all understand that the speed of changes at the Ukrainian front opens new opportunities for Belarus, and it's moving so fast. So must we. To stay united and resilient, we have created the United Transition Cabinet as the central executive body of the Belarusian democratic movement. This will remain until new elections are held. The cabinet includes representatives of major political groups and will represent the interest of Belarusian people. We are working tirelessly to set out our Belarusian view, vision to leave the decades of darkness behind and create a bright future, a nation reborn. And I'm here to share it with you. We see democratic Belarus as the centerpiece of European security. We are a country that will be valued for friendship towards its neighbors cooperating on regional security. No longer a dark and threatening cloud hanging over the region. 
we also see a path there. Today, we have what we lacked in 2020. First, we have a united population who is even less supportive of the regime than in 2020 and disgusted by the war. Second, we have crumbling economic prospects for the regime due to sanctions. Third, we were unable to crack the officials and security apparatus in 2020. But now, for the first time ever, we have trained Belarusian units in Ukraine. And as you can see, Lukashenko is afraid of them very much. Fourth, we have a distracted Russia that is about to lose this war. It won't be able to prop Lukashenko up with money and military support as in 2020. And fifth, we have united and experienced Belarusian democratic leadership that has a broad coalition of friends. We have you. Right now is our window of opportunity. Right now is our time to act. We are preparing tirelessly, but we can't fully prepare it without your help. Right now, is when Belarus should be on the top of any international meeting agenda along with Ukraine. It became clear that there will be no safe Ukraine and there will be no safe Europe without free Belarus. Belarus is not only part of the problem, it's also part of the solution. I'm thankful to Poland, Lithuania, the EU and the United States for being our devoted supporters. Thanks to your consistent position, Lukashenko's regime was isolated and civil society and independent media resumed their work. But more can be done. First, distinguish Belarusians from the regime. We call it two-sided approach punish the dictator, but help the people. We should keep Belarusians in European orbit, keep and strengthen ties between the people of Belarus and the rest of Europe. Visa ban on Belarusians is not a solution. Instead, consider closing loopholes so Lukashenko and Putin cannot avoid sanctions. Second, we should maintain and expand our coalition. I was at UN General Assembly last week, and unfortunately, the rest of the world has a very little understanding what's happening in Belarus and Ukraine. Secure Europe is in the interest of the world, as the gas, grain, and migrant crisis have shown. Europe can't be safe with two rogue states in the east running around bullying neighbors and threatening nuclear war. Third, we also need your Ukrainian support. No aid delivery can help Ukraine as much as eliminating 1,000 kilometers of Belarus-Ukraine hostile border to defend. We should work together on building an alliance between Ukraine and democratic Belarus. We ask Ukraine to establish cooperation with the United Transitional Cabinet. We realize that nobody apart from Belarusians can bring changes to Belarus. We learned to be self-sufficient. We learned it is a marathon. Our independence, our security and democracy are for us to ensure. But we want you to stand with us and our vision. Dear friends, let's remind ourselves, unlike thousands of those behind bars, we have the freedom to act. Not to fake deep concerns, but to make a real difference. Now is our turn. Now it's time for us to lead. Thank you. Slava Ukraini.
Живи Беларусь! Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Madame Chihanovskaya, for those uh, inspiring words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, they have opened up for an um, incredibly important discussion where we have some fabulous guests uh, to follow. And uh, for that, I will invite um, uh, a great moderator, uh, Mr. David uh, Ignatius, an associate uh, editor at the Washington Post. David, please join us. Welcome to Warsaw. So. Uh, ...of Belarus. Uh, first, Alexandra Ustinova, who is a member of the Ukrainian parliament. Mantas Adomenas, who is the vice minister of foreign affairs of Lithuania. Jacek Kaputowicz, who is the former foreign minister of Poland. And I'm pleased that Svenlana has agreed to join us on stage for a few questions after her excellent address. So Svetlana Sikanovia. So uh, just to introduce our discussion, uh, Belarus is the other great freedom fight uh, in Eastern Europe. It's been overshadowed by Ukraine, but is uh, important in this broad story. And I want to, in the brief time I have with Svetlana, who's going to leave us after these two questions, ask you a couple of very simple uh, issues. First, what uh, can the Belarus opposition do for the Ukrainian people in the period of their struggle that's ahead? You talked about things that have been done in the past. Going forward, as this war continues, what can the opposition do to help Ukraine? Uh, so, first of all, it's uh, not opposition, but Belarusian people who would like to help Ukrainians to win. Because we, as I said in my speech, we realized that uh, without free Ukraine, there will be no free Belarus, and we fully understand this. So it's our task, it's our obligation, uh, not only fight with the regime in uh, Belarus, but also help as we can in our situation, Ukrainians to help, to, to win. So at the moment, uh, hundreds of Belarusian uh, volunteers, military volunteers are fighting uh, in Ukraine. It's, uh, you know, they are defending not only Ukraine, but also defending uh, Belarus. They actually on the uh, counter offensive of uh, Ukrainian army at the moment, uh, liberating the lands of uh, our neighboring country. Uh, then now we see that uh, there are signs that uh, Russian troops can uh, deploy Belarusian land again. And we are preparing our partisans, you know, to act decisively at this very moment. The acts of sabotage that took place in February and March uh, uh, can be repeated again, though people um, who are making these acts of sabotage can face death penalty. But it's like our uh, feature of Belarusians, you know, to step over fears and to act uh, to help uh, Belarus and help Ukraine. So I'm sure that uh, Belarusians will again uh, be involved in uh, uh, you know, sabotaging railways, in giving information to Ukrainian army, and uh, uh, you know to, to uh, uh, you know to. <clears throat> To, to prepare maybe uh, Ukrainians for possible attacks. Uh, also, we uh, in Belarus, we counter uh, to Russian propaganda. Uh, state television uh, in Belarus, they reiterate Russian narrative about Nazism, about uh, enemy, uh, external enemies, and it's our task to inform people what's going on in reality. And uh, if younger generation uh, can use uh, internet, they know how to um, uh, 
uh, look for alternative source of uh, uh, media, uh, of information. Uh, older generation, they, especially in, in villages, they don't know where to read the truth. So that's why uh, there is organized um, volunteer, uh, volunteer movement in Belarus they, that spread self-made newspapers. For example, in the war has started about 500,000 leaflets uh, have been spread to inform Belarusians about the war and who is guilty in this war. And of course, on political arena, we are fully supporting uh, Ukrainian cause. We are really appreciate all the help and assistance that Ukraine uh, gets from democratic, powerful countries, because as we explain this, now uh, it's not the fight, it's not the war uh, uh, between Ukraine and Russia. It's the war between democratic values and dictatorship on the territory of Ukraine. And this moral obligation of all the um, powerful democratic countries to be with Ukrainians at the moment. But of course not to overlook Belarus. I'm sure you saw Svetlana and our audience did. Uh, President Lukashenko said yesterday that, uh, you, that Belarus is in this war participating with Russia. And he also announced that Belarus is modernizing its railroads so that it can provide greater transport for the new Russian mobilization uh, to get into battle. So you have your work cut out for you. Let me ask you one more uh, question, and it's the reverse of, of what I asked a moment ago. What can Ukraine do for the Belarus opposition so that you have a better chance to break through yourselves in your country? You talked about uh, Ukraine recognizing your Belarus opposition. What beyond that specifically would help you? <clears throat> so first of all, uh, uh, Lukashenko uh, is not president. You called him President Lukashenko, he is not. I should have called you Madam President, I'm sorry. Yeah, he has lost elections in 2020 and doesn't have right to represent Belarusian people uh, anywhere. Um, you know, I think that it's high time for uh, Ukrainian government and Ukrainian people to install closer relationship with uh, Belarusian nation and Belarusian democratic forces. Uh, you know, it took us a long time since the war has started to explain Ukrainians what's going on in Belarus. You know, since 2020, we felt everyday pain for what's going on in, in our country, for political prisoners, for detentions, for tyranny and tortures. And we were sure that the whole world knows about this, that uh, Ukrainian friends also know about this. But in, uh, when the war has started, we realized that uh, we unexpectedly for us became co-aggressors uh, in this war, and it took us uh, well, you know, some time to uh, speak to Ukrainian people that regime of Lukashenko and Belarusian people are not the same. That it's regime, it's uh, Lukashenko who became collaborant, but Belarusian people are against this. So uh, since then, we, I think, I, I see that these ties between Belarusian and Ukrainian nation is closer and closer. And we, uh, I think that Ukrainians also understand the importance of uh, Belarusian uh, victory over dictatorship, it's uh, for the sake of both our countries. We say that Kremlin doesn't recognize no Ukraine, no Belarus as independent states. And uh, it's, we are like in one boat and we have to fight together. So that's why we are asking uh, Ukrainian government to install closer relationship with uh, our United Transitional Cabinet to work for um, uh, to work out like our common strategy, how to uh, fight with uh, these Russian uh, ambitions. Uh, so we already have contacts on the working level, but we would like to see more signs that we are together. I understand that uh, you know Ukrainian government face such huge you know difficulties, the, this war and you know all this stuff, but. Uh, I'm sure that if we show our unity, it will be a strong signal for our democratic political partners that we are together, that we are interested in uh, freedom of both our countries. So, and on, uh, on the level of uh, ordinary people, you know, it's so important to support each other. I know how uh, Belarusians are 
uh, trying to support uh, like Ukrainian cause uh, at least in in media because we don't have like other tools, and uh, we'd like uh, Ukrainian people to learn more about what's uh, how Belarusians lived before 2020 and what happened in 2020 and what we are doing now. So to uh, you know, to understand both our nations better. And moreover, we can clear understand each other even without interpretation because our languages are very close. Uh, we can understand each other without, uh, you know. And uh, so this is like uh, this ties between democratic forces and government and ties between nations should be strengthening. So I want to thank uh, Svetlana for these additional uh, comments, answering my, my questions. And I'd ask the audience to join me again in saluting a very courageous woman. I want to say, Madam President. <laughs> so let's uh, turn now to the question that uh, that Svetlana has, has put to us. Uh, and I want to ask each of you briefly to answer this in, in your own way. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Alexandra. Uh, she spoke in her, sp in her speech about a, a window of opportunity for Belarus, uh, given the war, given the dramatic evidence of Russian weakness. How do you think that Belarus can best exploit that window of opportunity now and make progress. Alexandra? Thank you so much. I think the best window of opportunities for Belarus would be Ukraine to win. And uh, I think it's, everybody realizes that Russia or the Russian empire, that's how Putin sees it, cannot exist without Belarus or Ukraine. He has to have it. And the best opportunity window is for us to fight back together and win this war. Because yesterday Lukashenko de facto acknowledged the Belarus Russian participation in this war. And there is no other solution but to stop it. If we talk about the opposition, and I'm, I can tell you that Ukrainians has, had been so supportive when the first uh, protests in Belarus started. I remember in 2020. I had friends coming and living in my house who were escaping. And we, as the parliament, had been trying to draw attention of the government. We had statements from the president supporting the opposition and not the self-proclaimed Putin's puppet, who Lukashenko is. But today, we as Ukrainians are asking Belarus and Belarusians to fight more. We are grateful for projects like Gayun that we know and we read and we know what is going on with the Russian army in Belarus. We are very grateful for the guerrillas, for people who are fighting for us. But we need more people to come out and fight. It cannot be comparable. You cannot compare Bel Belarusians and Russians because 86% of Belarusians do not support the war. And if you turn to Russians, the majority of people do support that. But it shouldn't be, but the resistance should be stronger for this opportunity window to stay open and for us to win. Bantas, what do you think about this window? And do you think the evident weakness of the Russian military in Ukraine is harming um, Lukashenko's standing uh, now in Belarus with his own people? I think it's very much a race against time. On the one hand, um, pressure by Russia to integrate Belarus more and more deeply and sort of uh, uh, give up the last uh, vestiges of uh, semblance of any sovereignty that it still possesses. On the other hand, uh, the disaffection of Belarusian society um, and of Belarusian elites, which is, uh, I think, also very important. Uh, in a sense, they, they see this as a losing sort of ship, well, a sinking ship they, they tied the boat to. But um, before going further, I, I want to take a step back, in a sense, David, and um, to emphasize what you said, and the, the strategic importance of Belarus. I mean, um, you, you said that you know, it tends to be overlooked in, in, the, sort of in the context of a much larger war of Russia and Ukraine. But, um, you know, 
Belarus tended to be in the strategic thinking of, uh, of the West, like a kind of blank area for many years. It was a sort of murky corner where nothing much was happening, with a kind of uh, pantomime dictator. Um, and uh, now it has become an absolute strategic center of, of the new geopolitical developments. You know, without, uh, if Russia did not control Belarus, there would not be, there would not be Suwalki Gap, which is a kind of, you know, strategic bottleneck for, for NATO. There would not be an opportunity to attack, as has been mentioned, Kiev from the north. Uh, there, there would not be this thousand kilometer. And uh, I think not less importantly, there would not be uh, a sort of uh, Soviet Union restoration project because uh, Belarus um, and, and, and Russia is what remains of this of the restoration project. So I think it's, it's absolutely crucial that we're prepared to take every in the window of opportunity, which I think may next come with, with sort of, you know, the earliest uh, big window of opportunity is uh, Putin's defeat in Ukraine and demoralization uh, both of, 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 of Russian army of, uh, as well as, as uh, the, the uh, layers of the elite that, that uh, sort of uh, will see themselves on the losing side. And that will be sort of major. And, and we have to be prepared for that. But again, sort of, you know, this is not, uh, this is not, should not be seen as a panacea because uh, such regimes can have strange tendency, tenacity, tendency for survival. So we should also prepare for the long game, for the long game. And the long game is building up Belarusian identity, helping uh, democratic Belarusians to build this identity of free European nation, which is at the center of Europe, at the center of things are happening. So we sh cannot miss this coming window of opportunity, but also uh, we should not sort of put all our eggs in, in that basket and uh, think that, you know, there will be quick win necessarily. I mean, so, you know, we have to prepare for the long haul, but we cannot afford to lose Russia, to, uh, Belarus to Russia. Yes, sir. Well, what would you say about, about uh, this window of op opportunity? You've been watching as foreign minister uh, of Poland, uh, uh, Lukashenko, for a long time. Uh, what, what thoughts do you have? I think that this window of opportunity will come after Ukrainian, Ukrainian victory. I believe it will uh, realize soon. And it may lead to the troubles, internal troubles in Russia. And Russia supports Lukashenko. The, without this support, he will not <coughs> remain as a leader of the country. Uh, so we have to be prepared, and I am pleased to hear from Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, uh, Tikhanovskaya that uh, that uh, opposition is being prepared to that by creation of this United Transitional Cabinet to be ready to act immediately. Because I believe that without uh, Russian support for regime, it will uh, not sustain, and uh, Belor uh, Belarusians uh, have to be prepared to fight for their independence. Let me add also to that, that our support for Belarus goes through the support for Ukraine. Uh, I fully agree with Alexandra that military support, financial support, economic support, political support for Ukraine in this war is the same as supporting Belarusian opposition because only Ukrainian victory can trigger changes uh, within the Belarusian state, uh, the Belarusian society. I believe that uh, in future uh, we will be in one, so to say, format. It happened that we in this panel represent three countries belonging to so-called Lublin Triangle, Ukraine, Lithuania, Poland, and there is the room also for Belarus there if there is a Belarusian state. So there is also a change of mentality in our region. We understand that we have to be united uh, against threat which comes from Russia. Let me ask uh, the two foreign ministers, uh, uh, current and, and, and former members of the foreign ministry, um, to explain something that puzzles me. Um, many um, of, of Russia's neighbors have been seizing this moment of Putin's weakness to find greater space, for example, Kazakhstan for example, Armenia, for example, uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajik Tajikistan, a little more distance from Moscow. We don't see anything like that yet from Belarus. Do you think that's uh, possible? L let me start with you, Montas, and then uh, Yasser. 
I don't think that's possible as long as Lukashenko is in power. And of course, he will try to put across this sort of narrative, which is a kind of a totally flogged de to death horse that, you know, sort of, he is the only guarantor of, of Belarusian sort of uh, sovereignty and independence, and something that he tried to put across. And time and time again, sort of democratic politicians fell for it. You know, sort of, we should support Lukashenko because what may come next is, is a, either the total surrender to Russia or something, you know, someone even worse. And, you know, but. Uh, to be manipulated is, is, you know, and to continue to be manipulated is not something to, to that is, can be can become a sort of basis for uh, a reliable sort of policy. So we should really see through through this narrative. Uh, Lukashenko is currently uh, becoming a, a total sort of uh, ventriloquist dummy for for uh, Putin, and his remarks about uh, Belarus participation. You see the game he's playing. He's uh, on the one hand he's forced to say that you know we are in the special operation. Uh, on the other hand, trying to portray that okay, well, we are sort of, we are sort of in, but but not with our troops. Um, so trying to w walk this tightrope, but the the game is becoming in more increasingly thin. So um, as long as Lukashenko is there, he is no longer in, in control of the situation. He's a, has, has been master manipulator, but has been out manipulated by by Putin. He has no uh, strategic uh, space and is not seeking to gain any. He's only trying to portray himself to those uh, uh, gullible. Um, Western politicians who still think that there is a sort of dialogue possible, that he's somehow a lesser evil uh, than, than Putin and uh, maybe should be somehow appeased. There is no hope in that. There is no perspective. Uh, it's, a, it's a dead end. Yes, what do you think about whether there's any space available for him? I think that you just mentioned these countries which uh, look for room uh, for their own policy. Um, they sense, they understand uh, the weakness of uh, Vladimir Putin, a weakness of Russia in this war. So without this glue, it's difficult to maintain this, uh, uh, this relations. Therefore, there are tensions. As far as uh, Belarus is concerned, let me also draw uh, uh, your uh, attention to the fact that, however, we can criticize Lukashenko for uh, breaking uh, human rights and I think sanctions are justified on Belarus, but on the other hand, he's not uh, side uh, to this war. So the Belarusian army uh, haven't invaded Ukraine. Uh, you could imagine at the very beginning that the, these two countries will act in alliance. So I think that um, he cannot be compared to Putin as far as um, responsibility for this is concerned. It is, of course, because he's clever. There is an um, uh, attitude amongst uh, Belarusians uh, that uh, war should be criticized. They c could not be involved in this war. But we can also, we, and we should also recognize that, uh, that, that they do not contribute to the suffering of Ukrainians. Of course, he can, could be criticized for allowing its territory for Russian army to be used and so on. But on the other hand, it is not uh, the same position. So we'll see what will happen. I repeat again that his uh, future depends on the future of Vladimir Putin after uh, probable, expected maybe, or we would like that it would be like that, collapse of the regime in Russia. We have to be prepared to this. His uh, end is obvious as a leader of Belarus. Uh, the society will elect democratic uh, uh, representations, definitely, I think, with the participation of uh, opposition, which is uh, now on exile. So I want to ask Ale Alexandra to follow up on that, um, and I'm going to put the question this way. Do the Ukrainian people see Belarus as a victim of aggression, or do they see Belarus as an aggressor? You know, I, I think we should talk we should separate Belarusians and the state of Belarus. Because we honestly believe that Lukashenko should be accountable and should be responsible for what is being done, but not the people who are suffering from this dictator at the moment. On the other side, of course, we as Ukrainians keep asking the Belarusians to stand up. This is the time, the best time for them, probably even better than in 2020, to stand up against him. Because Putin is weak. He has already betrayed Armenia with the conflict with the Azerbaijan, and that's why they're pulling back. And he will continue to become weaker 
with our army going north, east, and south. And the weaker he is, the better chances internally are there for people to stand up against their uh, tyranny and against, uh, for people of Belarus to stand up against Lukashenko. So we had always been supportive for people. But of course, we see that uh, uh, this is the government who is accountable. If we could consider all, all of these people being victims, on one, I would say on, the, on one hand, yes. On the other, probably every Ukrainians had never been so proud of their own country. We're paying a, an enormous price for that. Thousands of people die every day. And that's why when we hear from other nations that we are afraid to stand up, we as Ukrainians do not understand it. We did not understand it in 2014 because we died for our freedom back then and we do not understand it now. That's why we are asking not to be victims, but to be those who stand up and fight for their own countries and then it will be a common victory for everybody. That's, that's powerfully said. This may be the moment, it may not come again. Uh, Montas. I want to pick up on what Alexandra said. I think I, I totally agree that um, unlike uh, Russia, where I truly believe this is not Putin's war, it's Russia's war. It's a society which allowed itself to be indoctrinated, which has turned sort of in ideological fervor sort of to, to support this regime and is still supporting. And the fact that it tries to flee personal danger is not an indication of any resistance. In Belarusian case, is is different. It's um, very much Lukashenko's participation in the war. But then again, I would like to disagree with His Excellency Minister Minister, uh, on, on the evaluation of the facts. Yes, uh, Belarusian units did not directly engage, but they allowed military exercise to be turned into the beginning of the war. They allowed the territory to be used. They allowed the territory to be used from which um, missiles were launched. Uh, now they're preparing to train Russian troops and, and they're providing ammunition. So the fact that it is a sort of, you know, uh, Lukashenko is uh, a Mussolini to, to Putin's Hitler is not, is not sort of, you know, uh, does not relieve him of responsibility. The precise res amount of this responsibility will have to be evaluated by an international tribunal. I'm not uh, sort of prepared to sort of venture a suggestion, but responsibility is there. He's an, um, aiding and abetting this war. He's an accomplice of this war. And, and I think we should be very clear that you know, there should be no uh, principle sort of line drawn between the, between the two regimes and their sort of uh, complicity in this, in this uh, crime of aggression. So we're going to turn to the audience for your questions in a moment, uh, be thinking about them. But I want to ask one more uh, question of Jacek. Um, so I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts about what uh, a post-Ukraine war Belarus might look like, what role it might play in the region, and whether um, a, a, a Western-looking uh, Belarus will help pull Russia West with it. Does, does that make a difference or do you think the pressures are already there uh, to, to, to pull Russia westward? So I think that uh, first big question is the uh, end of this war, how it will finish and of course everybody uh, in Poland in the West um, supports Ukraine and wishes that uh, Ukraine win and I think now we have to simply uh, be prepared for the collapse of Russia as a, uh, as a state, because it would be very difficult to accept for leadership in Russia, particularly Vladimir Putin, a defeat, a failure in this war. So this is the, this is the big problem. I don't know if we in the West uh, are prepared for this scenario, which we, uh, may happen, and it will be no time to reflect on this. And it, it will be an opportunity for other countries and even regions within Russia to maybe to be more independent uh, or to be more self-governed. So um, again, I will repeat what was already here said. The only way to act these days to support this line of thinking and uh, this positive from our perspective scenario is to support militarily Ukraine and financially and uh, and not to be blackmailed by the Russians uh, um, in the field of energy security, uh, for example. Um, 
it is premature to say what would be the role of particular countries. I am sure that Poland will be a, a leading country in supporting Ukraine uh, until the end. But uh, I have an impression that more say will have these countries which support uh, Ukraine these days. So I see United States, uh, United uh, Kingdom, Poland, uh, countries of our regions. So now we can forge relations in the region between Poland and Ukrainians. I am very pleased to read that way of thinking about Ukrainians in Poland changed very positively and vice versa. So we treat ourselves as rather as, 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 as kind of a brothers, if you can use this word. We have these relations with Lithuania and believe also that Belarus will, will, will come to this camp. Yes, let me also refer to remark of um, Minister uh, Adomaitis that uh, Adomenas that, that I agree that uh, Lukashenko is responsible, but however, the fact that Belarusians are not fighting army, uh, uh, to arm with the Russians against Ukraine will help to reconcile uh, and to maintain good social relations between Ukraine and Belarus in future because the relations between Russians and Ukrainians um, it's difficult to imagine that they will improve due to the psychological effect of war, of killing, mass killing. So fully agree that Lukashenko is also responsible for enabling this war, but at the same time, I will repeat that there is difference between Putin and Lukashenko in terms of responsibility. Alexandra, you wanted to jump in on this one. Yes, I'm sorry. I just want to make it clear, and I think Svetlana Tikhanovska in her speech said about that as well. It would be a totally different war without Belarus. Because a thousand kilometer border and missiles, ballistic uh, uh, rockets and everything flying to Ukraine from Belarus is what is destroying the infrastructure and killing thousands of people. Irpin, Bucha, all these mass scares would not have happened if Belarus did not help. But the problem is the sanctions that are introduced now by the international community are weak. It's not even about the loopholes, it's nothing. Because there are sanctions at Lukashenko but none of his military men. Nobody is responsible for those who actually helped them launch those rockets or missiles. There is no responsibility for them, and they do not understand that they will end up in the uh, International uh, Criminal Court or International Tribunal, if this uh, ever is gonna be a tribunal, if it's ever gonna be established. We hope it will. So the problem is these people do not understand their own responsibility, and it's the West that has to pressure with more sanctions, more more powerful sanctions to bring justice and accountability, not only for Lukashenko personal and his family, but for the rest who are involved as well. So there's a specific uh, takeaway for me, the recommendation for more specific sanctions against Belarus itself now as a deterrent on its actions. So uh, let me turn to the audience. Um, please raise your hands, identify yourselves. Uh, we do have mic runners today. So yes, sir, in the first, second row. And if you have a, a, want to direct this to a particular panelist, please do so. Thank you, David. Christoph Marshall from the German Daily Der Tagesspiegel in Berlin. Uh, I have a question which arose from your discussion. Why are not more countries, people uh, fighting back? Um, normally we see in, in, in history when you have a war and it's the end game, every nation who has still some claims wants to join the fight in order to get their piece of victory back. So we have frozen conflicts all over at sea borders uh, of Russia. Do you expect a moment when people in Transnistria will uh, take the fight, when people in Georgia will take the fight, or why are they not doing it? Because of, I could also imagine that the West is not very much interest because it raises risks. Uh, it could uh, trigger the escalation we most of us don't want to see. So how do you see this d developing? Is it a question of time when others will raise up or is it not going to happen because so, the West doesn't encourage such a kind of behavior? That's a great question. Are we facing another 1989, in other words? Um, let, who wants to jump on that? I may start. Honestly, as a Ukrainian, I can tell you that I personally believe that frozen conflicts is a very comfortable term, probably, that the West has been using. And it was a very comfortable term for everybody since 2014, when we as Ukrainians, even here at this forum, were begging for help and crying that he's not going to stop, 
nobody was listening. And the same is any, in any other country, unfortunately. So it was the international community who pressured people to step back and not fight, fight against the evil, against Russia, who did not help back then. So hopefully, if there is help internally coming, these people will raise. I honestly believe that Russia will fall apart. And we are going to have, I don't know, what, 20, 25 uh, countries evolving. And the worst is the West is not ready for that either. There is no strategy for that, whether in the United States or in Europe. And that's why Ukraine is not getting all the weapons needed. And this is the problem because nobody wants us to win. Everybody wants us to hold Putin to fight it there so, and have a so-called frozen conflict. Because if we win, there is no strategy in the world of what to do with Russia and with any uh, 20 or 25 states with nuclear weapons that are going to uh, end up uh, the world with. So unfortunately, this is the problem that everybody has to sit down and talk about now honestly and not to pretend that there are frozen conflicts. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, well said. Montes. I think that's precisely what we're saying, that, you know, sort of, uh, um, <clears throat> there is going to be no stability and uh, security in Europe until Ukraine is restored to 2014 borders, the pre-2014 borders, and there are reparations and there is a sort of responsibility for the crimes of aggression. But I think it's also very important uh, to uh, realize that uh, the earlier pieces, uh, the, the 2008 aggression, the Transnistria, Abkhazia, they are also part of the same puzzle. It's, 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 we just see the culmination of the, of the uh, process of grabbing territories by, by Russia. So um, there should be no going back on the part of the West to, to sort of so reduction of sanctions until these uh, territories are also restored. And this is not a, a matter between Georgia and Russia, between Moldova and uh, Russia. Countries which for very different reasons are in a, in a weak position and uh, are not uh, trying to use this geopolitical opportunity to claim the territories back for different reasons. I'm not going to, uh, into analyzing them, but, but it is for us to make sure that, you know, sort of the uh, 1991 borders are uh, respected and, and, uh, and restored to, to the right, and the territories are restored to the rightful owners and the sort of territorial integrity. So the West has been on the learning curve since 2008. The reaction to the invasion of uh, South Ossetia has been extremely weak. Uh, Donetsk, Luhansk and Crimea were uh, totally unsatisfactory. We are still on the learning curve and we should realize that you know, it's not, uh, escalation is the word that we should sort of prohibit. All escalation that is needed has been introduced by Putin. What we are trying to do is to restore stability and order and that's not going to happen until Russia is pushed out of the territories and until it cannot sort of portray its uh, aggressive policy as leading to any sort of territorial victory. Because for that regime it's going to be an incitement for further acts of aggression. So until that happens there is going to be no lasting uh, stability in Europe. So uh, I'm going to turn back. Let's take a couple more questions from the audience, and we'll come back to our panel for closing comments. Is there anyone on this side who would like to be recognized? Uh, not seeing any hands. Yes, yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Amanda Rifkin. I'm in the newsroom for Deutsche Welle. And I would like to talk a little bit about when Russia does collapse, because I am with the panel on this. It's inevitable at this point. Um, in Poland, after 1989, we had an indigenous economist, Leszek Balcerowicz, totally overhaul the market and make it into a functioning market economy that we see today. What will this look like in Belarus and in Russia itself? What will the morning after Putin look like? My suspicion is, is that the person that will do it is the one closest to him. It will be Petrushev. I don't know if this is something that the panel would agree with or if there are other prognoses or thoughts on what that would look like, but I would be very curious to hear. Uh, the day after, let's take another uh, question. Yes, yes, uh, yes, you're in the uh, fourth row. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Rick. I'm a researcher from Maastricht University. Um, my research goes into uh, autocratic resilience and democratic promotion by the EU, so my question it's mostly um, directed to Ms. Radomenas and Chaputovic. Um, to what extent see the Poles and Lithuanians, uh, their voices heard within the wider EU uh, with regard to Belarus? Uh, are you finding roadblocks? Are you finding openings with your partners in the West? 
um, mainly Netherlands, uh, France and Germany, as these countries have less experience, um, less historical and societal experience uh, with Belarus and uh, the post-Soviet space. Thank you very much. So we have just over two minutes left, um, and let's have concluding comments. Ja Jacek, can you, you first? Yes, let's, let's be referred to the, the last question. Indeed, our countries support democracy in the eastern part of Europe, especially in Belarus. Uh, when you look at the policy of main uh, EU countries like Germany and France, in my opinion, they look at the region through their relations with uh, Russia, which they prioritize. And it was why they do not see these developments as clearly as we do in Ukraine on, in, uh, or in Belarus. So it was a mistake. It was recognized that you cannot look at the relations in the, um, or, or phrase them or understand them as a kind of a concert of Europe, 19th century concert of Europe where, where uh, Russia is perceived as an uh, indispensable uh, element of European security system. You have to also see these uh, smaller countries and nations and acknowledge that they have also the right to uh, independence, to sovereign development. So there is a difference. At, uh, um, Sometimes Poland is um, portrayed as a country which is against, so to say, uh, European values. No, these are European values. You have to support uh, a weaker side in the conflict, like Ukraine. You have to uh, understand uh, aspiration of nations like Belarus. This, these are European values. You cannot look uh, at uh, relations in terms in this realistic geopolitical power relations like it is done, has been done until now by Germany and France. Montas. There's been a window of susceptivity following 24th of February when uh, major powers of the EU uh, said, well, if only we had listened to what you were saying about Russia. Because before that, uh, Lithuania, Baltic countries, Poland had been branded as Russophobes, you know, sort of who are panicking needlessly. Our panicking turned out to be extremely accurate prediction of its behavior. So um, this susceptivity is somewhat decreasing, and there is a sort of uh, tendency to revert to, um, well, listening mode, which is sort of arrogance as usual. That's to say, we know better. What can you tell us? Sort of, you know, we are old established sort of uh, powers. I, I think it's very important. But e EU is a dialogue. It's, it, it is a sort of, you know, it's a polylogue. So the voice is heard. We, we do manage to, to put it across. And um, uh, I think sort of, you know, it's not, uh, it's, it's not impeded. The question about the day after. Well, that's precisely the task for the uh, United Transitional Cabinet, to work out scenarios for a uh, sort of viable transition. And uh, the more cogent, the more um, persuasive it is, the more likely it is to, to grab the imagination of the Belarusian people. I said, you know, the long game is building this sort of pro, well, it's European uh, independent identity of Belarusian nation as a sort of, as a nation in Europe. Um, and um, and this, is, this is a work which needs to convince that, okay, well, there is a viable Belarus without sort of Russia's constant injections. There is viable Belarus which can be sort of, uh, can be democratic and work and sort of, you know, not be reliant on the state sector. So it's, it's an Im immense task and I'm very happy that uh, Belarusian democratic opposition is uniting for, for this task and it's working together to actually work out the sort of the reforms and you know, not just political reforms, which are obvious, you know, free elections and all that and, sort of, and justice for Lukashenko, but, but also what are they going to do in, in sort of in welfare reform, in economy, in, in all these areas. You know? So, so, uh, so this, is, this is a work which is going, ongoing and we need to support it by all means. Alexandra. I'll be brief. On the second question, it's never too late to start listening. The world hasn't listened to us before. On Nord Stream 2 in 2014, you can start listening now and help us now. Unfortunately, this is not happening as well. As I have already mentioned, we're not getting enough weapons to win this war. And on the second question, I can tell you exactly what Ukrainians are going to do the next day, celebrate. So with that, uh, the last day after, what a wonderful thought that is. Um, thanks very much to all of our, all of our panelists for joining us, uh, and uh, please stay here for the next, next session.
Ladies and gentlemen, we have just uh, heard some very insightful remarks. We have uh, listened about the uh, importance for seeing the Belarusian regime for what it truly is. Um, we have listened about how incredibly valuable for the future of Belarus uh, the Ukrainian victory uh, will be. Uh, we have also heard that for us in the EU, for us in the Western alliances, we truly need to focus also on supporting the people of Belarus um, and other uh, former countries of the Soviet Union for their societies to stand up uh, to the dictators, to stand up to oppressors, and that those societies will be ready uh, to respond if the right uh, support is needed. So important messages coming from, uh, uh, from our panel. Uh, I think it lays uh, a very great ground uh, for the uh, following discussions, uh, which will also tackle uh, very important areas uh, uh, about our core values and will the next session uh, we will look particularly at the great example of uh, democratic values um, uh, translating uh, into true action. Uh, this will be uh, a session that is going to discuss the rapid mobilization of the Polish society after the 24th um, uh, of uh, February, after the Russian aggression, showing an example of uh, democratic resilience. Uh, and, uh, of course, uh, we couldn't have uh, a better place to discuss this than uh, Warsaw. Um, and we do have a uh, truly uh, great uh, um, uh, moderator to introduce uh, our guest and to lead the session. Uh, so I would like to invite now um, Ms. Greta von Susteren, who's a host of The Record uh, at Newsmax. And uh, Greta, if you are with us, uh, please, can you uh, join us at the stage to uh, invite our guests and lead the next session? Thank you, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here. Just as a short note, this is my third trip to the region. I was in Ukraine in March, and I'm enormously grateful to all of Poland, everybody's helped these refugees, which is the subject of our panel today is the refugees. And um, the ambassador, um, we're very proud of this ambassador. I'm an American, and this is an incredible ambassador. We're extremely proud of you, sir. And Kasia, um, with, with Warner Discovery, um, TVN24, I've been studying their journalism forever and hashtag jealous of their good work. Anyway, thank you very much. All right, so we're going to begin with all that. Um, Ambassador, let me start with you. Since February 24th, what has struck you about the refugee influx here into Poland? Greta, thank you for coming to Poland, first and foremost. Let me share with you a Polish formulation on a banner over the railroad in Przemysl, Poland. Three words. Tutaj jesteście bezpieczni. Here you are safe. What an awesome message for the people of Poland to send to that Ukrainian mom with two kids arriving in Przemysl at 11 p.m. at night, scared out of her wits and not knowing where she will go next. And that is a metaphor that is a metaphor for the rapid mobilization the Polish people have done since February 24th. It reminds me as an American of the American reaction after the attack on Pearl Harbor. It reminds me of the American reaction to the race to the moon challenge that unleashed rapid technological revolutionary change in America. And it's happened in Poland before. It happened during the Warsaw Uprising during World War II. It happened during the Solidarity Era. And now it happened in 2022 with millions of young Poles, especially young people, organizing on social media to go to one of the eight border crossings on the Polish-Ukrainian border to pick up a refugee family. And my prediction is this, that in 20 or 30 years from now, there will be that young woman who today is organizing a clothing drive for Ukrainian refugees in Bidgosh or in Torun or in Wrocław, who 30 years from now will be the president-elect of Poland 
And she will have been informed by this year, by this moment, will be a better leader of a country that will be better situated to take on a global role, thanks to this year. Kasha, um, you wake up on February 23rd, 24th, of course, when it starts, and the war is about to start. You've got this huge news organization. It's got a worldwide reputation for being fair and doing you know, great journalism. So tell me, what did your news organization do to put the spotlight on this crisis? Yeah, well, um, we, uh, we have uh, a, a, a very robust news organization. We touch uh, lives of people in Poland, but we also now uh, obviously are um, sister organization to CNN. And as the war broke, uh, I think that on the moment uh, in Poland, that was 4 a.m. in the morning, we started the coverage. So the first decision that we had, the first really editorial decision that we took was we're going to Ukraine. We're sending our journalists, we're sending our people to Ukraine. We have to cover, we have to show what's going on and, um, and inform uh, the public about, about the atrocities and about the, uh, about the war. That was our first editorial uh, decision. Our first business decision, which has been very difficult, is we're pulling out of Russia. Uh, we had our channels in Russia and we pulled out within one week. We pulled our business out of Russia within one week. And since then, I must say that on a, on a TVN24, CNN Worldwide, uh, we've, been covering, uh, we've been covering the war. We are true to, uh, to one message. We don't want the world to forget about the heroism and about the pain and, uh, and what the Ukrainian people are going through. On TVN24, from this 4 a.m. in the morning, on the day where the war broke, for the last next uh, two weeks, we had a special program, a special edition, where we were covering the war 24-7 without a single commercial break. Uh, we were just on the ground in, uh, in Ukraine showing what's going on, and we're still continuing. Ambassador, you talked about how, you know, how kind that sign is. And, you know, and like I said, I was in Ukraine in March and I, I saw the people boarding the train, women and children mostly. Um, there's 17.2% inflation rate in this country. I imagine this is a burden. Most of the refugees are here. This is a burden on the Polish government in that respect. Um, how, do, how, do you, how do you convince them to keep trying? How do you convince our, our government back home to keep helping too? Well, Greta, you know, capacity is a question that we all have. There was a Pew Public Opinion survey released just about a month and a half ago that showed incredibly that Polish public approval of taking in even more refugees was increasing rather than de decreasing, which is an incredible, I think, statistic. And Pew is a very authoritative platform. And this is, it's important to recognize this is a unique in history reception to a mass refugee movement. I served as ambassador in Sweden for four years and Sweden is rightfully proud for having taken in one million refugees over 20 years. The Poles have taken in, have received into this country over six million refugees in seven months and they are diffusely being taken care of, meaning family by family, apartment by apartment, rather than a national organizing place or structure for them to be in various focal points. It's completely different than any other refugee movement in history. And in the future, no refugee movement will occur without invoking the case of Poland regarding how those refugees are received. It's, it's, to, to me, a challenge, given the inflation rate that you mentioned, a, a, you know, close to 18% inflation is impacting every family. Everyone sees the energy prices. And at the same time, Greta, in my perspective, for the Polish people, this is 1939. This is another invasion, cruel invasion of Central Europe by an oppressor and the young generation is connecting their ability to organize through iPhones, through these things. This is the way they are doing it. They are organizing on these things while invoking the memory 
of World War II and the Holocaust when less was done for people being oppressed. So it's a remarkable story that connects the past and the future right here in Central Europe, and it's working. You raised the iPhone is that we had uh, an air raid sirens for what cities we were in. They would show up on our iPhones so we'd yeah. know, you know, if we couldn't hear the siren. Uh, Kasia, um, uh, how, I mean, you, you've got journalists inside Ukraine. How do, how do you balance covering other stories and keeping the story of refugees alive so they don't get sort of, you know, here in the United States, or not here, but in the United States, we can get war fatigue. You know, we've talked about the war so much, so much, much, but this is such an important story. How do you keep it keep it so that people are interested in it every single day. Something like refugees, which could perhaps get, the sadness can get overwhelming, and the same story almost sort of repeats itself. So uh, to the point that the ambassador just made, uh, that uh, it's historically unique in the way how Polish people mobilized, how they opened their homes, uh, because those refugees really entered all the individual homes of, uh, of people, yes? How they opened their homes, how they opened their families, how they opened, uh, how they felt responsible and opened their hearts. I think this is unique. It's unique for the, uh, for, for the world, it's unique for us, uh, a very, um, very unique moment. And there's a very important role that we as a media, we feel we, we have to play here. And it's also about showing that and bringing and supporting that mobilization and helping uh, with this, uh, with, with a, maybe also a structured way. So one thing that I wanted to, to mention is like uh, over the weekend, just after the war broke, uh, during the weekend, uh, we pulled together, we, we set up a special website that would inform people. We got a lot of calls. We got a lot of calls from people. How can we help? How, how, can, how can we help? There were a lot of people going to the borders. There were a lot of people doing a lot of stuff. And we thought like, okay, this needs organization. We need to show, we have to put information because there's so much misinformation. We need to put reliable information out as we put on the news, but also to the people, how can we help? Within 24 hours, we pulled this website. It's still working. It's still operating. We put new information where we put, you know, organization. It's open to any organization that is providing help, credible organizations that provide help. We check how we can, uh, how we can help from legal perspective, from aid, um, you know, humanitarian perspective, any type, finding jobs, finding uh, schools for children and so on. So there is this place on Good Morning TV and where you can, you can find all of that. And we believe that we also have a role to play to make sure that the world sees that. And that's why our shows, the shows that were produced by our journalists from Supervisor down in, um, in Ukraine, are being broadcast on our networks around the world and on our uh, digital platforms around the world, reminding people of what's going on, how, we are being, how people are mobilizing, what it takes to really make sure that it st stays top of your mind. If I could just add to what Kasha said, because I think it's so important, the role of the private sector in responding to this crisis. And I'm just so proud as the U.S. ambassador in Poland that so many American companies have played such an incredibly constructive role in this. Kasha and TVN have been incredibly responsive in organizing and helping, you know, the, 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 in terms of the conditions of refugees. I will add to that Google $38 million announcement when their CEO was here for refugees. Um, Hilton Hotels, Amazon, Uber, thousands upon, thousands upon thousands of rides. And from a historical perspective, Greta, this is really the first time where you had an incredibly well-organized and feared military conduct an invasion in which there was a really massively diffuse response against it from people, the Ukrainian people, the Polish people, businesses jumping in, and it has managed to stop this invasion in its tracks. It's, it's, it's a unique and kind of precedent-setting event. The thing that I worry about, the Ambassador, is this, is that everybody wants to help in the beginning, yeah. but the burden has fallen primarily for geographical reasons on this country, on Poland. And it really, you talk about the private sector and they're helping it and good for them. But it's got, the momentum has got to go on or this sort of this honeymoon of help 
will end. No country can endure an influx like this. And so how do you sort of, I mean, how do, how do, how do you keep it going so that you, you know, the people realize beyond these borders what a, what a burden it is on this country and what a big heart this country has so that people continue to help? Greta, I can't give you a perfect answer to that, but let me just put it this way. I'm bullish, I'm bullish on the Polish people and their ability to improvise, their ability to endure, and their ability to support. Is the, is the economy perfect? No. Might we see more refugees? Possibly. But I'm absolutely convinced that there is a national ethos to do what's right for the Ukrainian people and to see things through even if it gets harder. I hope I don't have to prove that thesis, but I'm convinced that's the case. And I'm also convinced, perhaps ironically, that today and this year will behoove the people of Poland for years to come because they have generated an identity that is amazing in 2022 as a humanitarian superpower and doing the unexpected. The Poles could have easily closed their doors and said, we feel your pain, but we can't take you. And they did exactly the opposite. And I think we would see more of that if things get worse. I hope that doesn't happen. Ashley, you've covered, TVN24 has covered so many important stories over history. Um, and like I said, I've, I've watched it. I've, you know, I, know, I know the work, the great work it does. Um, look, what's been the biggest challenge? Because every new story, and this one's so uh, catastrophic, what's been the biggest challenge to cover the story? Well, one of the things that we, we take very, very seriously is actually in a, in a moment of, of, of such crisis and in a moment of, um, of fear, let's be honest, because there's, there's obviously there's fear in Poland as well. There's so much misinformation that's going around and, uh, and uh, a lot of, and you know, we, we cannot obviously control uh, what's happening on, uh, on in internet or what kind of misinformation is happening, but this is probably one of our biggest focuses and a very difficult thing to, uh, to, to, to strive for, to make sure that we are a reliable source of checked, fact-checked information. And we can see that, um, you know, from a simple measure like viewing results, that people do turn to us to, go, to, to check and to have reliable information. And I think this is hugely, hugely important in, a, in a situations like that. We do it obviously on air, but we also have special services that are kind of um, fake news checking services like Concrete 24, uh, where we actually disclose what's, what's, what, what is being manipulated uh, and, and how to approach those information. I think that this is probably one of the, of the, of the biggest challenges uh, we have to, to make sure that people can rely on it fully. Could I add to that? Because fear, I think, is something that the U.S. really wants to align with the polls to address. What's happening in the East is scary, and we don't know what Poland will do next. But we are absolutely in the game in terms of Poland security. We have now more than 10,000 U.S. troops in Poland, all on Polish basis. We are helping the Poles arm with the most sophisticated military technology that one can find anywhere in the world. And we are ready now for any contingency, but also more broadly, are absolutely committed to Poland when it comes to indivisible security, not just military security, but energy security, the security of democracy and so forth. We are on the cusp of a very important civil nuclear power deal here in Poland, which if it's consummated, we, the, the U.S. Department of Energy will place its regional center of excellence for nuclear, for civil nuclear power and clean energy in Poland. That will connect Polish nuclear development to the national labs that the U.S. has all across the United States and to our best universities when it comes to the study of nuclear technology. That's the kind of meshing together that we want to do across the transom when it comes to security. You know, Kasia, um, I, for some reason, you know, as an outsider to Poland I, I, and looking at history, it almost seems like it's built into the DNA of the Poles and the history in this country to, um, to Polish people to really want to help too. 
um, you know, historically, it's almost like this generation is ready to do this. Uh, you're talking about uh, bringing help, yeah? Bringing help. Yeah, I think that, you know, uh, well, obviously this is, this is the best testament to, 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 to what you are saying, yes? And I think that um, it has been a remarkable, a remarkable movement. And, um, and remarkable movement from every single person, but also from the organizations. And as I, as I mentioned, you know, you, you, could, you could probably talk a lot about a lot of things. I think that one thing that's really important and what we really wanted to also do from the beginning is there was so much goodwill, so much goodwill, so much heart. But you need to, we believe, I believe strongly, that when you organize that and when you have those moments of like, you know, media or the other organizations to organize that help, we can do so much more even. And, and that was something that we were putting a lot of, a lot of emphasis to, to really support the organizations or support those that really know how to handle refugee crisis, that know how to wor work in a war zones. Our cooperation with um, uh, Polish humanitarian action was one of those, because we know that they know how to handle that, yes? And our goodwill alone is not gonna, you know, t t coupled with their know-how, can bring a real change. Bastian, we give you the last word on this, but uh, it, it's interesting to watch you know, the, all the different nations participating and helping. It's like you know, the world is, is deeply divided, but it does show the good people trying to fight, fight together to do this. I mean, helping. Absolutely. There's every couple of days a meeting in Jeshuf called the Community of Interest Meeting which brings together the towns and the villages and the regional government, but also the national government and international governments, all working together to generate a collective response to this. At the table is, of course, the United States, but also the UK, Australia, Switzerland, Sweden, France, and so forth. It has brought the world together around the local roots of this crisis, but giving global reach in terms of the way it is seen and the response to it. And I might just, as my own business journalism, is that I tip my hat to all the journalists who've been, fight, who've been covering this and Absolutely. bringing the word out so that people can make reasoned, smart, compassionate decisions. So I tip my hat to TVN24 and, and all the other journalists over there. And with that, I'm gonna conclude it. Can you give a applause, please, to Kasha and the ambassador. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, what a fascinating discussion we have just heard. Uh, please remember to uh, tweet, uh, to give your reactions uh, in social media under the hashtag um, WSF2022, as uh, I'm sure you have a lot, of, a lot of thoughts. And again, a great thank you to uh, the panelists. Uh, thank you to the words about the importance of media um, in showcasing uh, the resilience and showcasing the incredible support that the Polish society has given to, um, to Ukraine, to the Ukrainian population, welcoming millions of uh, refugees into our country. And I think very important words from uh, the American uh, ambassador 
Ambassador, Ambassador Mark Brzezinski, about the US commitment to support our support for Ukraine and to support Polish security, uh, which uh, I think is also incredibly uh, important for our for our society to continue uh, to continue their uh, our struggle uh, in support of Ukraine. Now we have also heard uh, about the role of the private sector, uh, and this lays great ground for our next discussion, um, where we will be discussing, looking at the role of businesses in strengthening resilience of democratic uh, societies. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I have an enormous pleasure to invite uh, for opening remarks for this session, uh, Mr. Karan Bhatia, who is the Vice President uh, for Government Affairs uh, and Public Policy at Google. Dear Karan, if we can invite you to the stage, please join us. Good morning, uh, and thank you for this incredible opportunity to be here at the Warsaw Security Forum. I'm particularly pleased to uh, have been asked to share some thoughts on this topic uh, leading into the panel discussion um, about the role of business in strengthening the resilience of democratic societies. You know, it's a topic that obviously is particularly resonant given the war in Ukraine and the role that private sector companies can play and are playing in strengthening Ukraine's resilience in sectors ranging from defense to agriculture to technology. But while Ukraine is rightfully top of mind, the question of what role business should play in strengthening democracy really isn't just limited to one country. It's a topic that's relevant to many countries, some where democracy is deeply seated and robust, and others where it's much more nascent and more fragile. It's a topic that I've given a lot of thought to over the course of my 30 years working with a variety of businesses operating globally uh, as a lawyer, uh, then in the US government as a trade negotiator, and then at two major American headquartered companies, General Electric, and for the past four years, Google, where I lead the company's government affairs and public policy team globally. My thesis to you today is that business has a fundamental and profound role to play in strengthening the resilience of democratic societies, perhaps as much or more so as any other major societal institution, academia, religious institutions, the military, or even government. But to be sustainable, the role of business in supporting democratic resilience doesn't reside in philanthropy, uh, nor as an arm of any government's foreign policy. Rather, private sector companies contribute most when they're able to do what they do best, innovate and bring much needed goods and services to markets, invest in their employees and communities, and work to achieve their missions. In short, I believe that companies contribute to the resilience of democratic society when they focus on the three Ps, products, people, and principles. I wanna share a few thoughts using the example of Ukraine on each of these three. Um, I will say that the uh, war in Ukraine for us at Google has really been an all of company, um, top-down priority since the war began earlier this year. So let me start with the most straightforward and probably obvious way uh, that companies contribute. They help just to help uh, strengthen resilience, um, and that's by bringing their products to market. Um, good products make societies more productive, they make economies stronger, and they help people live their lives better. I certainly felt this when the company I used to work for created machinery that generated electricity, transported people, or diagnosed and helped uh, heal sick people. But I feel it even more so in the case, frankly, of Google, where the products we bring to market have a special resonance to democracy. Products like Gmail and Android help people connect. YouTube and Google for Education help students learn. Google Maps help people move around. Ads enable small business to operate. And Google Search supplies people with authoritative information to help better live their lives. Of course, it is critically important that these products be responsible, that they res res protect people's safety and security. In the context of Ukraine, we've taken those responsibilities very seriously. First, we sought in a time of crisis to provide good, desperately needed information into the country. 
Working with government authorities, we rapidly created new information products, new tools to allow Ukrainians looking for trustworthy, authoritative information about the war, about refugee resources, about how to, about routes to, to be able to escape, and, and enable them to access such information easily um, on, the, on the web. We've also created new technology, for example, to transmit air raid alerts to people's mobile phones in advance of hearing the siren, often giving them precious additional minutes to seek shelter. As importantly as getting good information out there, we have focused on combating disinformation. In an unprecedented step for us and going beyond what any sanctions required, we took down all Russian state-sponsored media off our platforms globally. We shut down our ads business in and to Russia because we were concerned about advertising being a possible vector for disinformation. And we've removed hundreds of YouTube channels and thousands of videos that promoted disinformation about the war. And we have deployed our products to combat growing cybersecurity risks. Google is the world's most attacked website in the world. We have had to become best in class at security to protect our own online presence and recently, we have extended that protective umbrella to Ukraine's ministries and institutions. I can tell you from a personal perspective, it's been inspirational watching our company, like many others, spring into action following the invasion earlier this year, working 24-7 to build and evolve products to meet this extraordinary challenge and protect users. And we were so gratified when President Zelensky recognized Google with the first Ukrainian Peace Prize Award granted to any private sector company. So that's products. The second area of focus I would suggest is people, employees and communities. Companies strengthen resilience when they invest in people, specifically uh, employees and the communities they live in. Democracy, democracies thrive when people have good, fulfilling jobs and healthy, prosperous communities. For many companies, including Google, that of course has meant continuing to invest in the people of Ukraine. Um, in Ukraine, and as people have been forced to flee as they move to neighboring countries. In our case, we've continued to maintain our presence in the country itself, but we have also grown our activities in neighboring countries. We have been inspired by the support that the Polish people, including many Google employees in Poland, have shown in helping refugees fleeing the war. And we felt moved to act as a company and have contributed more than $45 million in humanitarian relief. Everything from Chromebooks for kids to money to help displaced people build new lives. But perhaps as important, we've continued to demonstrate confidence in the region by continuing to invest here. Just weeks after Russian tanks rolled across the border and with the world very jittery about what would transpire in the Central and Eastern European region, we decided to expand our presence with a significant $700 million real estate investment here in Warsaw. And contrary to what some had urged, lest we make ourselves a target, we didn't do that quietly because we knew the world would be watching. And an investment of three quarters of a billion dollars by Google would send the message that we wanted to be heard, that the global business community was not going to be intimidated, that we would continue to invest in this important region. Lastly, businesses support democratic resilience by being true to their principles, by how they do business, by setting a model of transparency and responsibility and integrity for the countries in which they operate and by being true to their commitments and their mission. At Google, our mission is to organize the world's information and to make it universally accessible and useful. It is giving people uh, access to information, which is fundamentally, we think, a democratic mission. It empowers people. It vests, invests them with dignity. And it is no surprise as a result that when democracy is threatened, one of the first actions one often sees is shutting down the internet. Authoritarianism doesn't sit easily with the free flow of information. We just saw this in Iran in response to protests against the regime. And there, as with Ukraine, Google has taken action to try to afford Iranian citizens ongoing access to accurate information through virtual VPN services. It bears noting, though, that access to information globally has never been more under threat than it is today. 
Around the world, we see an explosion of regulations and government actions that seek to limit what content internet platforms can surface, often under the threat of enormous fines or even criminal liability to our employees. We see these threats not just in classic authoritarian regimes, but even in countries that would, would sometimes normally deem democracies. And this is where I believe democratic governments do have a responsibility to help business. They, and in particular, Europe and the United States need to come together. They need to align on forcibly defending companies from these threats, and they need to ensure that their own actions aren't inadvertently used to justify or facilitate anti-democratic action. So let me just close by recapping my thesis. Businesses have a profoundly important role to play in strengthening the resilience of democracies, and they can best do so by focusing on what they do best, on creating great products, on investing in people, and on remaining true to their principles. Thank you very much. Uh, Karen, thank you very much for those uh, remarks. Uh, extremely important to listen about uh, the contributions of uh, the private sector for democratic resilience. And uh, you did underline uh, also the great uh, struggle for cybersecurity uh, uh, when it comes to taking on that, uh, that public mission of the private sector. And uh, this is what our next panel uh, will discuss. Uh, the panel, uh, which will be moderated by Joanna van der Merwe, who is a privacy and protection lead the Center for Innovation, Leiden University, and non-resident fellow of the Defense Tech Initiative at SIPA. Uh, Joanna, I invite you to the stage. Hi, good morning. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to our panel today, including those who are joining us online. Um, my name is Joanna von der Marwe, and like he said, um, I'm actually a senior policy advisor now at the Leiden University. And, um, you know, I'd like to welcome, we have four brilliant panelists who will be joining us here today to talk about how do we build resilient societies in the digital era, with a specific focus on the cyber threats. And first, I'd like to welcome to the stage Ms. Lucinda Creighton, who is a senior fellow with the Digital Innovation Initiative at SIPA. Um, and was previously the former Minister for European Affairs at Ireland. She is also works very closely with the Extremism Project, so we'll have some interesting discussion about that. Next, I'd like to invite Minister of Defence uh, Hanno Pevkur from Estonia, uh, who has previously also been Minister of Social Affairs, Minister of Justice and Minister of Interior, so a full, rounded, holistic approach to this matter. Um, next, Mr. A Ivan Vad Peterson. Uh, State Secretary to the Norwegian Minister of Foreign Affairs, who's previously also been uh, a foreign defense and political advisor, as well as worked at, as a diplomat at various Norwegian embassies. And finally, once again, Mr. Karen Batia, please join us back up on the stage to delve a little bit more deeper into what you opened for us. So, as you know, Russia's invasion of Ukraine in February highlighted the important importance of military preparedness, um, but it's also revealed the need to be prepared to respond to actions in a holistic way. Um, digital technologies have increased the breadth of what needs to be responded to in these situations, with tech enabling um, Russia to reach beyond just Ukraine, um, but also carry out disinformation campaigns in NATO member states and throughout the world, um, as well as cyber attacks uh, you know, in countries that are not actively in, uh, in the war. So I'd like to start maybe with looking at, you highlighted how you've been supporting um, Ukraine, Mr. Bhatia, but I'd like to ha uh, delve a little bit deeper into what Google has done to support the response to Russia and support, um, and how the sanctions have impacted the way you do work and how you've supported those sanctions and changed your business for that. Great, thank you very much. Um, so yes, to dive in a little bit deeper into some of the things I quickly alluded to. So um, again, at the beginning of the, of the war, uh, as, as literally in the hours following, um, we basically launched an all of company effort to sort of identify what the key results, what the impacts were likely to be on us and what were the steps that we needed to take, recognizing that this was really uh, an unprecedented uh, situation. And so 
four main work streams coming out of that. Um, the first was, and I alluded to each of these briefly, but just to dive into it, the first was focusing on helping the people immediately on the ground in Ukraine. We recognized that there were going to be some amount of chaos, effectively, as um, you, you had people desperate to figure out what was going on, how to be safe, uh, for those who needed to escape, how they could do so safely, where they could turn, where there were missing loved ones, how to actually uh, connect with them. So the first thing we did was immediately stand up, which is our bread and butter. We know how to get information out to people. And so, but we needed to do so in local languages. And the, the real challenge is getting the most authoritative information. So just quickly on escape routes, you know, it was very unclear to begin with whether these routes that were being marked, you know, were in fact being protected or not, to what extent they were safe or not. So it involved a great deal of collaboration with the Red Cross, with government agencies and so forth. So one significant body of work simply getting information. The second was from the very beginning we recognized that this was going to be a war fought like no other war in terms of the threat of disinformation. And we saw that early on. We saw everything on our sites from simply claims that there was not, there was no war, there was no invasion, there was nothing going on, don't look here, to uh, claims about, you know, the Ukrainian government being Nazis, the, this being coordinated uh, by American or European government officials, whatever it was. And so we recognized that there was a new threat and very quickly moved in advance of sanctions, you referenced sanctions there, to take actions to deal with the disinformation challenge along the lines of what I had alluded to, removing state-sponsored media, shutting down ads, et cetera. Um, I would note that that disinformation challenge has continued, it has evolved, it has become very targeted around different regions of the world. The messages have varied based on where the targets are, there's segmentation on it. So it's an ongoing challenge that needs to be addressed. The third area was cybersecurity where we saw, I think there was an initial concern about um, simply takedowns of entire sub, you know, bits of critical infrastructure. We were obviously watching for that, but we were also watching for DDoS attacks. We were watching for the kinds of other things that one sees. We have uh, a, what we call a threat assessment group that conducts those reviews. We were undertaking those on an hourly basis, sharing that information with relevant government authorities. And then the last, obviously, was the humanitarian efforts that I referenced before that from a very early sign, was, it was clear that we, along with many other companies, were gonna need to significantly step up our, our acts in those regards. Minister of Defense Pivkur, I, Mr. Bhatti has referenced the relationship that the working relationship that he's, that had to be established with various partners. Um, yesterday, you were on a panel and you discussed the exercises that Estonia has been undertaking to uh, practice responding to such crises. Um, I'm wondering what the relationship looks like in those exercises between the these tech companies that play such a vital role, uh, and and um, obviously your public sector bodies and what does that relationship look like and how we, what lessons did you learn from those exercises and how are you developing that relationship, especially in light of lessons that are being learned in Ukraine? Well, good morning. Uh, first of all, we have to go back in time, about 15 years. So we, when we go back to 2007, this was basically the first like cyber attack, large scale cyber attack to, to any country. Uh, the Russians uh, uh, then attacked Estonia and, and then uh, what we did that time was that yes, we are lucky that we are a small country that we uh, were able to close basically all the, all the lines into Estonia and then uh, we started to open uh, bit by bit uh, the gates again and, and uh, this was like very simplified approach how we uh, dealt that time with the Russian cyber attack um, towards Estonia. But uh, now also giving or taking these um, lessons, what we, what we saw then, we created uh, a, a new system, or not a system, but a new approach that uh, in our defense league, which is a voluntary uh, unit uh, in our defense system, um, basically we've created also, or actually it was an initiative from the uh, private sector 
to create Cyber Defense League, which means that uh, those people who are involved in this kind of act, act, uh, activities, they are still working uh, somewhere in the companies uh, as uh, tech leaders or IT uh, heads of IT or speci specific uh, experts. And when there is a need, or if there is a need, then they will join our state experts and we will uh, basically make a joint task group immediately how to tackle these uh, attacks. Uh, and this is a very good example, you know, how, it, how you can engage the private sector towards to, uh, uh, to the attacks. Uh, now, when we take Ukraine, then uh, I must say uh, for the beginning that uh, Ukraine has been extremely successful in Stratcom. And part of that Stratcom is definitely also the dig digital uh, approach, what they did, what, what kind of messages they are giving out, what kind of videos they are uploading uh, to, to uh, increase the, the, the defense will and, and all that kind of activities. And I'm very happy to see as we have had very good cooperation with Ukrainians throughout the years. And we also shared our experience from 2007 then they were able to prepare themselves uh, for such kind of uh, war and such kind of attacks, uh, what, what they see at the moment in Ukraine. And, and definitely the Defense League or the Cyber Defense League, what we, what we told them is one of the approaches. So also in Ukraine we see that many, many private sector companies and, and also experts are helping at the moment in, uh, military uh, to, to tackle with the cyber attacks. Because cyber attacks can be very, very different. We, we heard the DDoS, but DDoS is just one of the easiest attacks. We, you can see also hybrid attacks in, in cyber uh, sphere. So you can see that the, they will uh, publish uh, decision makers phones just to give people uh, just overload of the calls. Uh, you see fake news, you see uh, falsificated uh, uh, acts or, or papers. Uh, so it's, it's, it's like wide range of possibilities. But, but what we have to understand is that, you know, probably alone the, the government sector cannot uh, tackle all these challenges. Thank you, and I think that leads really well into a question I have for Mr. Vad Peterson. Um, we know that in hybrid war, there, we're facing a lot of threat vectors, crossover between different ones. And I was wondering, how do you view the intersection of uh, cybersecurity and energy security given Russia's threats in both spaces? We've seen Nord Stream 2, we know that the Baltic pipeline also had uh, to pay attention to security issues recently. What is the crossover between those two? And I'd, if anybody wants to jump in, I see Mr. Batio already nodding. If you want to jump in to add on at the end, please feel free. Thank you. The, <coughs> the two are obviously connected. Um, a few years uh, back, uh, we had the example in the US of foreign hackers managing to infiltrate uh, US companies uh, in charge of a significant uh, uh, portion of the US electric uh, grid. Uh, so obviously, uh, uh, cybersecurity, energy security uh, have been connected for a number of years. It is a paradox, however, I believe, um, bearing in mind the, the images we saw um, in the Baltic Sea uh, a few days ago, that whoever is responsible, uh, there are more cost-effective ways of, of achieving the same aim, using cybersecurity, uh, uh, cyber uh, tools, uh, which again leads me uh, to the preliminary conclusion that a major motivation uh, of uh, whoever is responsible uh, was the symbolism. We've seen, we've seen the, the, the images of, of the methane gas uh, literally uh, uh, bubbling up uh, 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 and, and with the consequences it has uh, had for increased worries fair, uh, across Europe. Uh, we have, of course, taken our side of the responsibility uh, uh, as now um, Europe's largest gas provider. Norwegian companies from the Norwegian shelf, 8,800 kilometers of pipelines to Europe. Uh, on the kinetic side, on the military side, with the, uh, with the Navy, the Coast Guard, the Home Guard, uh, and a number of other uh, uh, visible and non-visible uh, measures. But I, I uh, come back to uh, the simple fact that there are easier ways of achieving the same aims, which uh, again uh, leads me to the preliminary conclusion that what happened there uh, uh, 
could have uh, many motivations, one of them being us to, to worry about different things, uh, get uh, steering our attention away from, for example, what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, but coming back again to the, uh, the connection energy cybersecurity, uh, uh, my experience from, from the past week is that um, I'm not complacent at all, uh, but from energy companies, they are much more used to this than to the, the threat posed by what we saw in the Baltic Sea. Uh, this was a, not a whole new world, but um, linking up with, with the military side, with, with the government agencies on that side, uh, was not something that they were that used to. Handling cybersecurity threats, they are certainly uh, used to. If you're a big company, uh, this is uh, something you, you deal with on a daily basis. So um, not, not complacency whatsoever, but uh, luckily the companies have, have significant experience and expertise in how to handle this. Just to follow up on that, has there been any, any change in threat perception as um, I know that Russia conducted some of these attacks on energy infrastructure after the 2014 annexation of Crimea? Has there been any change in threat perception based off of the change in the way, um, in, in the level of belligerence that Russia is willing to go to um, at this stage? You know, we're hearing them say we're going to possibly use nuclear weapons. Has there been any change in, in uh, the threat perception of what Russia would be willing to do using cyber means in Europe or specifically in Norway as one of the main providers of energy security for, for Europe in this situation? In keeping a cool head and taking the threat seriously, uh, the answer uh, nonetheless obviously would have to be yes. Uh, uh, and I, uh, it's also clear Bearing in mind, I mean, just the the the, the cost uh, analysis of uh, analyzing the, the costs of, of if you if you want to create harm, that's one of the most cost-effective way of, of doing doing things is is, is to, to to attack through the the, the, um, the on on the digital side. So certainly, um, uh, after what we saw in the Baltic Sea, um, um, threat perception has changed somewhat, and, and measures have been taken. So you've mentioned, each of you touched upon in, in some of your answers, the discussion around disinformation, misinformation. Um, Ms. Creighton, I'd like to talk to you a bit about a topic that may be not being highly talked, uh, on the high on the agenda, but are you worried about fomenting extremis extremism that from the Ukrainian war and what that means for misinformation, disinformation we're seeing online and whether we have an, the, that is causing a concern that is not... Uh, being taken seriously enough yet? Yes, is, is the short answer. So uh, I think, um, uh, firstly, I think it's, it's fair to say that, um, you know, the large tech companies have uh, responded, as indeed have um, governments uh, around the world in terms of the immediate action of banning, you know, RT and specific state-sponsored media outlets and that was very swift and immediate and I, I think had an important and positive effect. I suppose what's much more difficult and intangible are the multiple millions of um, uh, social media accounts and different platforms where um, the, the, the Russian state long before February 2022, has been building a, a really effective and very sophisticated disinformation uh, presence across um, across um, technology platforms. Um, and I think that that is something that has, has been having and continues to have a profound impact um, across the, the world. Um, and I think particularly um, with a geographical focus on Europe. Um, and that's something that, um, you know, the European Commission, uh, governments across the West are very conscious of and have attempted to respond to, but it's very difficult um, and uh, has, I suppose, met with mixed results. Um, and that obviously is a heightened threat and a heightened risk since uh, the invasion of Ukraine. Um, I think when you look at look at Ukraine, so the risk here um, is, I suppose, you have a theatre of war, you have an attractive destination for um, far right and far left extremists, both of whom have 
travel to Ukraine um, and have participated on both sides, actually, which is interesting, um, and across the, the ideological spectrum as well. Um, and in a sense, it, it, it doesn't often matter um, to some of these um, far-right extremists or far-left extremists with whom they're, um, they're aligning. Um, so there's a huge, um, a huge groundswell, if you like, of um, extremist propaganda fueled by the conflict um, in Ukraine. Um, and um, that has not just happened since February. It, it, it's been the case um, going back to 2014. We have seen uh, recruitment campaigns online, um, uh, radicalization um, it, it, to some extent online, and we've seen individuals. Now, I think it's estimated about 20,000 um, uh, potential foreign fighters had declared their interest in traveling to Ukraine, most of whom would have um, been coordinated or inspired um, online through online propaganda campaigns. Um, in reality, um, that number hasn't travelled to the theatre of war. It's it's much closer to uh, I think around maybe a thousand since February. So it's it's much smaller actually than than the period from 2014 onwards, when about 17,000 Western foreign fighters travelled uh, to 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 Ukraine to participate um, in in um, with primarily with pro-Russian forces. Um, so so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a threat, it's a risk. I think we've learned a lot uh, in terms of how to deal with um, um, radicalization and recruitment in the context of um, uh, uh, extre extremist content online um, and indeed terrorist content online, um, which emanated from the, the wars in Syria and Iraq. Um, and I think some of the lessons that have been learned in those contexts now need to be applied in terms of um, evaluating and assessing the risk and the threat um, from the war in Ukraine and the risk of um, you know, potential violence uh, uh, down the road, not, perhaps not immediately, um, but certainly it's something that um, um, uh, policymakers and legislators need to be really, really aware of. And from your viewpoint, would you say that that reaction from the tech companies, that swift reaction at the beginning, was a result of having learned lessons from other areas where we saw this online propaganda? And would you, would you have seen them do more? Or do you think it, it was enough of what they were capable of? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think not just in the context of um, the war in Ukraine, but, um, you know, if you look at elections uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, I think a huge amount of pressure has come to bear on particularly the large tech platforms to respond, to be more responsible, um, to be more transparent in terms of uh, how they actually address um, the, the, the big significant problem of illegal content online. Um, that pressure is, it's moral pressure, it's pressure coming from, from sponsors, it's pressure coming from policymakers. It's also materializing now in the form of regulation and legislation. So we've seen in the European Union um, in the last uh, two or three years, we've seen the terrorist content online regulation, um, which puts significant um, responsibility and burden on tech platforms. And of course, um, recently agreed and finalized the Digital Services Act, which again um, imposes really significant obligations on, on tech platforms around um, disclosing um, revenues from advertising, uh, transparency, around political um, messaging and also, um, of course, requirements around the removal of extremist, uh, illegal content and, and terrorist content. So a lot is happening, um, both, you know, from a sort of a, a, a voluntary perspective, um, but also from the point of view of regulation, which is obliging um, tech companies to respond. And I think um, from a reputational point of view, I think they, they really do want to be seen to, to do it. Um, and increasingly, that is the case. And I think that's partly, you know, why we saw a fairly rapid response um, when it came to, to um, the invasion of Ukraine in February. 
You mentioned um, the different uh, laws coming out, governance structures. Mr. Bhatia, I'd like to talk, uh, talk to you maybe a bit about, we've got European views and, and, and the US views here, and, and we know that there is um, a move to create a more transatlantic approach to how we govern tech and, and the different uh, regulations. Do you, um, we know that the European Union has been imposing stronger and stronger regulations. How do you view those regulations and the possible divide across the Atlantic on, on the ability to be, build truly digitally resi resilient uh, um, societies, but also partnerships between the two? It's a terrific uh, point and very timely, uh, given some of the things Lucinda and others sort of referenced. I, if I could just maybe comment very quickly, though, on the last I, point, which um, I think that from my vantage point, one of the most interesting things to see having in the in the Ukraine context was how um, tech companies, or at least I can speak for, for Google, reacted as quickly as we did. I think it was in part due to uh, what we had learned before from the you know experiences in Syria and Iraq and so forth. But I also think that there was, you know, on some of these, there were no, there wasn't regulation. The sanctions and things had not yet kicked in to sort of dictate outcomes on the disinformation side. What I saw that was impressive was just the degree of informal, immediate coordination that was happening. So, so in a certain sense, it's a question of, you know, this was outside of regulation. This was, this was, now it may have been reputational concerns. It may be that, uh, as an archivist, you just didn't want to have disinformation on your platform. It is not the kind of platform, you know, it's not what you want uh, as you're looking to build the business. But what allowed the action to happen was actually a level of informal, practical coordination. People on the phone sort of saying, what about this? What about that? What about this? That, in fact, I think was an incredible model and something that we've learned from this so that maybe to the point the minister was making, it's, it's actually a partnership that we really need to, to have take this stuff on. It's, it's, no amount of regulation is going to sort of yield that result at the end of the day. It really has to be done through that level of coordination. On the, on the point that you were making about transatlantic, yeah, I mean, look, from our vantage point, we have seen the last 10 years, unfortunately, be a period where we've actually seen more less and less coordination, I would say, less, less, to some extent, divergence, to some extent, it's just been two ships sort of going in different directions here between the United States and, and uh, Europe. The U.S. has, in some significant measure, simply not acted at all. We've been pushing, for instance, for stronger comprehensive privacy legislation in the United States. Europe obviously acted. Uh, but more broadly, if you look globally around the world, you're seeing a proliferation of regulation in a variety of different spaces, which even for a big company like Google becomes incredibly challenging to comply with. You know, if you are going to have to comply with 200 or 500 when you start dealing with sub, you know, uh, national level privacy regulations or content regulations or whatever. It, it's, it's not just a tax, it's really prohibitive for many to actually get into it. So, so thus the point that this, and I do think the Russia-Ukraine, the Ukraine war is a little bit of impetus potentially for the two sides to start coming together. There's been the launch of the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council, a terrific thing. We've urged it from the beginning. I'd say the results thus far are modest, good, but modest. There are much more, much bigger things that need to be addressed, real, co real coordination. And what is ultimately at stake, I would suggest on this, is if the US and Europe can't come together as the world's leading democracies in this space, the field is being entirely opened up to others to set the model or simply for there to be no uh, alignment whatsoever. So hugely important topic. Yeah, I mean, that leads to the question of if, if we don't come together, do we open ourselves up to not being able to compete with China and China's model of uh, building digital technologies? I mean, look, I think you see a variety of countries out there that are pushing uh, less liberal, less democratic um, view, visions of the internet, frankly, not even a globally integrated internet. So yeah, I think, I think uh, that's certainly a threat. And then the other threat is just simply, you've got this explosion of divergent uh, forms of regulation. There are 
elements of protectionism that work their way into these things. There are elements of, um, uh, you know, uh, authoritarianism that sort of work their ways into the, into these forms of regulation. So yes, I think the the imperative is there. So I'd like to take a bit of a futuristic look now and look at what we need to do, where we're going with building resiliency, cyber resiliency as we move forward, especially as the geopolitical situation is changing a bit. So I'd like to start off with uh, Minister Pevko. Um, what do you see going forward for Estonia, one of the leading um, cyber countries in the world? I mean, I would say at the forefront of it. What do you see next for Estonia um, in how they're building their resiliency? And maybe what can the rest of us learn from your country? Well. <clears throat> You can learn many things from Estonia, for sure. Just come to visit us and we will show you. Uh, we don't have much time for that, so to go through all the details. But nevertheless, uh, when I'm just trying to think about the future, so then uh, first and foremost, uh, resilience definitely is important. And, and our readiness to, uh, to tackle all the challenges we have ahead of us. But uh, just imagine for a moment uh, what also the... Uh, social media platforms, uh, what, what role they play also when we take that, what is the responsibility? Uh, for instance, let's imagine that there will be a video in Facebook circulating uh, where the President of the United States declares uh, nuclear uh, uh, bombing to Russia. It, it, it comes out that it's a deep fake, but as the deep fake is, is just, you know, like evolving so rapidly that uh, it's not so far away and actually it's, it's doable already today. And now when we don't have the approval to that, so even when the approval comes in 10 minutes, then by that 10 minutes it has been circulating all around the Facebook already to millions and millions of viewers. And we can only imagine the, the impact to the global markets, to the economy, to the financial markets, to the decision makers, etc. So uh, just, you know, I, I believe that deep fake is something we have to fight very, very heavily uh, in, in, in that matter that uh, it's a huge threat to the security of our people. And then this is the, like the sad part of the story. The, the good part of the story is that tech industry is always uh, inventing something new also for the military side. So when, even when I take my own Estonian companies like Vegvizir, who is producing the uh, virtual reality glasses for, uh, for instance, tanks, uh, so basically the, it's, it's much more secure and, and it will uh, get more information to the, to the operators. Uh, or the census queue who is uh, producing the intelligence gathering information for, from the battlefield. So that kind of new inventions will help on the, on the battlefield a lot. But once again, uh, when we take the technology, then uh, we have to separate the civil side and the private sector and the military side. So it's, uh, but on the other hand, both of the sides, especially you know, the bad people, can, can use this technology against us. And, and in, especially in that sense, I, I truly believe that you know, we have to be very, very careful with all these new gadgets, new things in the market. Or on the market, so it's um, it's a it's a quite a big challenge for us to understand what is the fake news and what is the reality and 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 how to, how the, and also when I now bring also the third component, which is the uh, like the real cyber attack to our uh, uh, different uh, infrastructure object objects like you know. Uh, pl um, power plants or whatever, basically everything is linked today. So when we take out uh, and, and uh, create the perfect storm in the, in the energy sector, so then we all understand what that means to the societies. So it's a great challenge for all of us, but uh, I believe that uh, Estonia is one of the, one of the countries who is, the, who is well prepared for that kind of attacks. Um, I'd like to open up to the floor, if anybody has any questions in the last 10 minutes here. Um, are there any questions? There is a mic runner, I believe, today who will bring the microphone to you. Uh, we have one here at the front.
Thank you. Um, my name is Greg Domber. I'm an American academic here in Poland on a Fulbright Fellowship for the year. Um, my question is particularly to, to Google, but um, to everyone on the panel. Um, uh, with each passing day, um, the likelihood of Ukrainian victory seems more and more present. I think that's something we're all asking for and, and fighting for. So my question is about the day after the Ukrainian victory and how lessons from the past seven months affect strategic thinking um, in terms of cyber threats, in terms of cyber response for the other panelists, but for Google in terms of investment. You spoke about investing in people and products. How has your thinking about uh, engagement in the Russian sphere been shifted by the brutality, by the immorality, and by the actions of Russians and, and the Russian government in these past seven months? Thank you. I'm happy to take a, a, a quick stab at that. The, 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 just to, to, I'll come on, I'll talk about Russia, but I also, let me talk about investment in Ukraine for a second as well, which is, I actually am very excited by, notwithstanding the fact that the Ukrainian government is dealing with this unbelievable challenge of uh, the ongoing aggression, they continue to be focused on building a robust digital system for their government. Um, and we've had the privilege of working with uh, some of the Ukrainian government officials. Uh, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Fedorov in particular has been a leader in sort of thinking through it. So it's a very, it's a remarkably forward-sighted thought about how to construct a um, e-government system uh, that in any event we're, 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 we're excited to be thinking about how to work uh, with them on. I think with respect to Russia, look, the reality is that um, sanctions alone, I think, have made uh, the prospect of ongoing um, economic engagement uh, in, in Russia um, something that I don't think anybody is uh, seriously thinking about. Uh, at least I will tell you our business is there, uh, is, is shut down. As I mentioned before, we've shut down our... Uh, uh, our ads business, our, we actually had to declare bankruptcy because we were having our assets sold, uh, or assets seized uh, by, the, by the government. So um, honestly, there's not a lot of thinking, I, I think, going on about uh, anything in the future there. Well, very briefly uh, about Ukraine. So trust me, every country at the moment is looking very closely what is happening in Ukraine and, and trying to uh, take the lessons learned from there. Um, and, and for sure, you know, the day after will be that uh, one thing is theory, what we think, how uh, everything is working, but the battlefield shows clearly how they uh, work in reality. And, uh, you know, we have seen some, or we have taken already some of the lessons of that, you know, that you think that, uh, or everybody had a understanding that Russia's army is very advanced and, and that we have some new gadgets on the battlefield, the reality was different. Yes, they are using some of uh, the possibilities, but, but the reality still is that they are using the same methods as they used uh, in the Second World War. So, uh, but nevertheless, when we take uh, the intelligence, when we take the possibilities for the for the information gathering uh, with other means like with with a satellite or with some other uh, equipment then definitely for the battlefield and then for the lessons learned this is something we have to and we have to look very carefully uh, and and uh, we we will collect a lot of information from from that and we will do our conclusions from that and we will implement or adapt our defense plans accordingly um from my perspective, I think um, the, the lesson learned um, from this experience um, and the approach that must be adopted the day after, um, and I hope that your prognosis is, is correct, um, it is that there is no alternative to the trans transatlantic alliance. Um, and the United States and Europe has to face these challenges collectively. I think, um, you know, we've seen in the past the pivot, the pivot away, the pivot to, to, to Asia um, in the United States. We, we saw in the last administration, the European Union literally being deemed an enemy of the US. Nothing could be further from the truth. And I think we see more clearly now than we have probably for 60 or 70 years that Europe is absolutely essential 
to, to US security and vice versa. So I think that's a really important takeaway and it goes to your point, Karan, around the TTC. We have to make that work. Um, the results are very modest to date, but we have to make it work. And then the other point, I think, is when we look at uh, security and defense, generally speaking, cybersecurity is core, it is fundamental. I think still we think in old-fashioned terms about security and defense spending. When we talk about um, um, uh, contributions to NATO, we're thinking in terms of um, traditional expenditure, traditional uh, infrastructure, and I think we have to change that attitude. And when we talk about forms, you know, the, the regulation and legislation that's happening in Europe around tech, at present, I think we have to have a greater input from, for example, uh, cybersecurity agencies, national and European level, and US. Um, we have to actually listen to cybersecurity experts when we're framing this type of regulation to ensure that it is robust. And that's something that has shocked me actually in the last number of years as the DMA and DSA have evolved at European level, that actually cybersecurity experts and agencies have really not been part of the conversation at all. Um, and I think that's something that we need to learn from. Uh, we have a time for, I think, one more question. There's a lady at the back. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. I'm Anna uh, from Portugal. I'm a former member of the Portuguese Parliament, lawyer, and a researcher in Cambridge University for uh, defense and security issues. My question is uh, for uh, Google. Uh, sorry, <laughs> but I really want to, to know uh, your politics in terms of fighting against misinformation. As a tool of research, very powerful, you uh, pass um, an image of trust for the researchers that uh, research on Google tools. So what will be your politics in terms of fighting and contribution in terms of fighting against misinformation? Because as a lawyer, I already try to, to um, um, denunciate so many uh, sites that are selling, for example, uh, tickets, uh, false tickets to concerts and things like that. And I don't know, I just want to know much more about that because you will have um, a very strong, you, you could have a very strong contribution to, to this uh, problem. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much for the question. Um, uh, look, as, as I mentioned before, I think the R Ukraine war is maybe the most tangible example, but of, of the challenge of disinformation and misinformation in recent, in recent months. But it is a uh, pervasive challenge. It exists um, uh, n not just in the context of, of Ukraine and not just um, Perpetrated by by state-sponsored actors or by one government, uh, we see we see unfortunately it growing. Um, the elections that you referenced, I think, were an important wake-up call for a lot of technology companies uh, in that regard. And I think there's an enormous amount of effort going into it. Uh, you know, the, to, there are an array of ways that we try to tackle it and think about it. Um, one is through the application of new and more technology to address the challenge. And one has to imagine the scale of the problem is almost unimaginable. You know, the hundreds of hours of video that get uploaded every second into major platforms. Um, the, 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 the fact that misinformation and disinformation is not happening just in the English language. It's happening in thousands of languages and it's often incredibly subtle and being done with uh, references and dog whistles and things that one doesn't fully appreciate. So one needs to invest in research to understand what the nature of the challenge is. One thing I will mention about Central and Eastern Europe specifically in the context of this is uh, we announced a multi-million dollar grant to invest just in this region on understanding how disinformation is being perpetrated. You know, what is the narrative that would work in any particular way? And then, of course, there is the array of tools that one has to use with Within the technology itself, so raising up authoritative information, uh, you know, taking out, reducing, adjusting the algorithms to 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 eliminate uh, m uh, misinformation and disinformation, utilizing business models to try and reward 
uh, authoritative information. So it is a comprehensive approach to a huge challenge. Uh, there is no single solution. There's no company that's perfect at it, I will tell you, but I, it is among the top challenges that we, we think about. So unfortunately, that brings our time to a close. Um, I think, as you highlighted, when we're talking about digital resiliency and cyber threats and opportunities, we could talk for hours um, because it is all-encompassing and it is a massive challenge we face going forward. I'd like to thank each of the panelists for joining us today. Uh, very interesting conversation and brilliant insights. Maybe I'll come visit Estonia so that I can learn, uh, learn a bit more about it from you. Um, and thank you to the audience and the uh, people who have submitted their questions. Thank you very much uh, to all the panelists for this uh, very important and interesting discussion um, on how to address the cyber threats uh, uh, for democratic uh, resilience uh, and how to build on uh, opportunities in um, this area. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, as we progress with the democratic resilience track at the Warsaw Security Forum 2022, um, we will be faced with a very important question which I think uh, all of us have somehow in the back of our heads when we're having all the discussions in this great event. And that is, can the international rule-based order be saved? Is there a way to continue it for peaceful means? And in order to tackle this very important question, we have a special guest today. Uh, and the special guest uh, will be interviewed and will be introduced by uh, a great friend of the Warsaw Security Forum, uh, the president of the Center for uh, International Relations, uh, Ms. Małgorzata Bonikowska. Małgosia, please uh, join us on the stage. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Uh, we know that we don't have much time. We are slightly late, but I hope it will be an interesting conversation. First of all, welcome uh, Cathy Ashton, uh, Lady Ashton. Uh, I don't need to introduce um, her to the Polish audience and to the international audience here. British politician, a European politician, former um, high representative of the European Union uh, for foreign policy and defense policy. Also commissioner for trade earlier, and now still House of Lords uh, and academician, active in the academic field, uh, fellow in Woodrow Wilson Center. Well, a lot of all these titles, but then that's the reason why we can confront this very difficult topic we are having. And we are grateful for the organizers also to jointly do this session with my center, Center for International Relations, because we political scientists, we put these questions to ourselves all the time. What is happening? Where are we in this global disorder? So, Kati, how do you feel now, being a person who was responsible, at least partly for the foreign affairs in the European Union, when we have such a different world now because the war happened in war. What's your feeling about the world order? So I think we need to be careful in not allowing Russia to not only create this dreadful war uh, with Ukraine, but also allow them to upend and change what we know to be true, which is an order based on rules that are based on our commitments to democracy and freedom and human rights are fundamental and core to the way that we want to organize ourselves. And the organizations like the UN that, if you like, are trying to 
build the structures that enable us to promote those values are valuable not just with the Security Council, and I appreciate how difficult the future of the Security Council is, but for particularly smaller states who have opportunities through the UN to raise the concerns that they have, and we shouldn't want to lose that. But let me jump on that, because we just face a situation where a powerful country like Russia just questioned all that. It questioned, Putin and generally Russian Federation questioned the international order, order, rule-based order, the role of the international law, because it's broken, the international organizations even. So do you think, is it possible, is it possible to keep this order going? Or it's just a wishful kid thinking it will not happen because it's a beginning of something much worse? So Russia has decided that it wants to have a different order. There's a, for those of you who are interested, there's a really good article on this by Sergei Lavrov, written last November, where he asks the question, why should we follow the United States and the West view of what an international order should be? What about other nations, other approaches? But they may choose to ignore what they have signed up to and been part of, that does not mean that we should say, in that case, it is broken. And actually, one of the things that has been reassuring to that extent has been the commitment of European nations, the strength of the Ukrainian people, the determination that we see across the United States and elsewhere, many countries across the world, who have said, we do not recognize what Russia has done. We will not support this war. We will support those who were trying to defeat the war and prevent this reality from changing so that Ukraine ends up as a nation free and determined of itself to be the country facing the directions it wants to face. And I think it is the response that tells us that there's still opportunity for the international order to, if you like, pick itself up a bit, brush itself down and keep moving forward with the commitments that it makes to the values that we hold. Well, I understand this approach that we, uh, I mean, back Ukraine, not only because of Ukrainians, but also because we believe in the world based on rules, international laws, that we just can't accept such a move, like invasion. But do you think the world, generally speaking, we are talking really about global issues, uh, is going to keep peace or that war is just a signal that, you know, there's no more possibility of peacefully cooperate because countries, especially powerful countries, not only Russia, China, maybe some other newcomers, would question everything and peacefully we can't resolve it. Well, the world is an incredibly turbulent place. And one of the things that I think we have to recognize, and I say this from having been the chair of the Foreign Affairs Council with the then 28 countries of the EU, now 27, is to listen more carefully to those who know. One of the things that I remember very consistently were Polish foreign ministers, Baltic foreign ministers, consistently and determinedly saying there is going to be a problem from the East, that Russia is a much more dangerous uh, country than we believe it to be. And we have to learn both to be more vigilant, to listen more carefully to those who see the signals and the signs that things are changing. And in terms of thinking more strategically about countries like China, we need a strategy. You know, we have a lot of tactics, but we don't seem to have a strategy. We, don't we as the European Union. We as European we... Union. Well, I think actually it's hard to find countries that do have a strategy towards China because there's a huge amount of economic interdependence that goes on. There's a huge amount of political concern about what's happening with China. And somehow we don't seem to have built together a collaborative approach that says, okay, this is how we're going to look China for the next years. Now, I know within the EU there's been, there's been a lot of work done on this, so I'm not being critical at all of anyone. I just simply think that if we learn anything, we're going to have to look 
after this is all over, all of the lessons that need not only to be learned, but to be implemented, one of them will be that. But let me push you a little bit uh, about that, because you said when this will be over, but maybe it will not be over. Maybe it will not be over soon. Maybe it will, maybe it will be even worse. Who knows? Uh, we are all worried that the time comes that stability is finished. Now it's a permanent instability, and this can be a first war. Maybe there will be more wars, proxy wars, how we call it. Maybe we are facing a new Cold War, or like some political scientists name it, Cold War 2.0. All of these possibilities, um, and it's depressing for us, but my goodness, what it must feel like for people in Ukraine who are thinking about where this could go. We have to be absolutely clear in our objectives, which is to help the people of Ukraine to win. We have to be absolutely clear in our objectives of what kind of European architecture, as we call it, for security we're going to create. We have to be absolutely clear in our objectives about what the relationships in 20 years' time will be with Russia, whether we're able to support countries like Georgia and Moldova to make sure they too have the opportunities to tackle the problems of those who have taken their space, and of course for the people of Belarus. So there's a huge amount of work to be done that is in part about how we support militarily, in part about how we support politically, but in part too about building the coalitions across the world that can help us come up with some of the answers, but also determine how the architecture is going to move forward. Because actually, that's going to be the best option in the end, is to create the architecture for the next 100 years, not the next 50 years. Well, that's uh, easier say, to say than to do it, <laughs> of course. We have our own internal issues within the European Union. Uh, well, your country just, you know, did Brexit, yeah. uh, which didn't help. Uh, so, uh, to be a little bit more uh, even pushy, again, I want to ask you about the future, because we also discussed the shape of this international order. And now we have, well, we used to have unilateral world when the basically Americans really kept the things going, kept the globalization going as well. But it seems like finished. This phase is finished. We hope that multilateral world will be able to, to be kept, especially for Europe. But what about bipolar perspective, which is also a possibility from the American side? China is a major rival. American, Americans push Europeans to have a clear stand. What is your uh, perception? What will be the evolution of this? So let me start with what I call tankers and yachts. That on the sea, the tankers can stay at sea a long time. They're difficult to maneuver, but they keep going. They are heavy, they are grounded, they know where they're going and what they're trying to do. The EU is a tanker, the UN is a tanker, NATO is a tanker. And then you have the yachts. And the yachts can move quickly, they can go at great speed, but they don't stay at sea very long, and they're often going from one place to another. They're not trying to continue their journey. They are the coalitions, if you like, the things we put together that are not based on the depth of values and ideals. You don't sign up to the constitutions or the rules. You're simply brought together to try and solve a problem. And one of the things that I observe, and this is, in my view, partly about my own country, is that we, we get involved with lots of yachts. We're less involved with the tankers. And it's the tankers that we have to build and keep at sea. Because although they get buffeted, although things can be very difficult, they do keep going. And all of this, all of this terrible time that we are living through, and especially, as I say, for the people of Ukraine, but I'm conscious of just how close all of this is and the contribution of the people of Poland and other nations closer to Ukraine. 
However bad this feels, it is not forever, one way or the other. In other words, we have to keep moving with the tankers, not dismantle them, not see them as being like yachts. And we have to be sure that though the yachts are useful, that they can be about solving a particular problem, they will not survive in the long term because they're not based on the rules and the values that really make the difference when you have to come together. However challenging the EU is, and I chaired meetings for five years of the Foreign Affairs and Defence Councils, so I have some experience of that. However challenging it is, it always kind of gets there. Maybe it takes longer, maybe it does it a bit too much in public so everybody knows what everybody thinks, ambassadors briefing all the time, but it gets there because the purpose of the organisation is to find an answer. And that's where tankers really come in. Their job is to find solutions, not to just have problems. So you need both. But I'm more worried now that we're not spending enough time on building and securing the tankers. We're too busy having yachts to deal with a few problems, and we need more tankers. So at that moment, I would like to ask you a little bit more about powers. Because, you know, that's also what we hear, that uh, the rules, international law, is not anymore so, you know, so uh, well protected because there are, again, countries who use power uh, to break it. They just don't care, like Russia did with Ukraine. It's invasion is a breaking of international law and, and Russia did it. So we say maybe it's, we are back to the game of powers, that it's not anymore, you know, so much important what are the laws. There will be an importance of power and the power projection will be uh, more often seen. Is this what you, what, you, what you think we can expect? Well, power projection's always been a factor in every aspect of foreign policy. It's also been a reason to build the coalitions and to strengthen them because it's the vulnerable countries who often suffer. And these are all about people whose lives get ripped to pieces and torn apart because of the desire of another nation. And the protection for them lies in the strength of the coalitions that are built. And it really matters. It matters on everything. It matters on climate change when you look at what's happening to small island states who don't have the voice and don't have the power projection, that they need to both come together as a group as a yacht, but they also need the tankers to be prepared to support them. And it really is important that we don't get caught up in looking simply at saying, because Russia has done what it's done, because Putin's Russia has behaved like this, that somehow everything else is no longer valid. Quite the opposite. This shows us how important it is to keep the rules-based organizations and to be determined that our values will win out. One more question concerning this uh, world order. Do you believe that we need something new in that? Because you, you use this comparison with tankers. And, but what about new organizations maybe? What about, you know, well, UN was also created as a reaction on the war. Do you think what we have is enough to keep this world peaceful, or we need, we need something else? There is no issue that we could think of here or in any forum that any nation can resolve by itself. From the pandemic to, to economic security to, of course, defense, nothing. So everything has to be done in some form of collaboration with someone else. Everything. You can't look after your population as a government on your own. So everything has got to be thought of in that context. Now, if you're thinking about, do we need to create more organizations? I'm not sure. I'm not sure we need more organizations. If you're saying, do we need to strengthen them? I think there is an argument for looking again at whether we've made them as effective as they possibly can be. And if we're thinking about how do we go forward, I would say that it's worth examining all of these interconnections that we have and looking at whether we've 
currently got the right mechanisms to do it. Because you've got these interesting hybrid organizations of which the work on climate change is one, the EU, EU3 plus three, the P5 plus one, whichever, it's six either way, of nations who came together on the Iran negotiations. These were kind of strange hybrids because they had the power behind them of the UN and support, but they were operating as a kind of one-off mechanism. And so creating ways in which you use the power of the rules-based organizations, but use it more creatively, will probably be something that we have to think about more carefully in the future. But I'm not convinced we need to start creating new organizations, because all we're going to do is run into all of the problems that we've currently got. And I'm not at all of the view that we want to see the world split into two big groups who face each other. I think the more we can try and hold as much as we can to the rules-based organizations we've got, the better we'll be in the future. Well, that sounds very reasonable, of course, but I have a question in, inside my own you know, heart. If everybody on this earth is really thinks logically, look at Putin, everybody was thinking this invasion wouldn't happen because it doesn't make sense. But it happens, so we cannot be sure that everybody would, you know, be so rational. And my question will be about the West now, because uh, all this world order was created in a way by us, by, by Western world, after the Second World War, then especially after the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you rightly said Russia just questions all that, not only Russia. We have China also who is not happy with this. We have India who for years wants to be a member of Security Council of the UN. It doesn't happen. So generally Asian countries, African countries, Latin America maybe don't feel uh, equally represented. And we have, in a way, newcomers like informal organizations like G7, G20. They are not formal organizations, but they exist because of the incapacity of organizations like UN to deliver. So what, in your opinion, what could be in 20 years to come, 30 years to come, the role of the West in such a complex, difficult, and changed world where the the countries from Asia, Africa, Latin America want to speak up and want to organize this world uh, the way they want it, not the way we want it. It's a really big question. And I, just, I would say this. I would say that the point about the organizations that were created, whoever created them, was that we based them on, in a, in a world that had been torn apart, the principles that we believed to be true that we wanted a democratic future for people, that we wanted to see human rights at the core of what we did, that we wanted the values we espoused and all of the elements that build the kind of democratic societies that we believe in, civil society and so on. All of that remains the case now. It remains true. It's not about compromising that into somebody else's view of the world, but it is also about trying to build organizations that can bring in nations who do not necessarily share all that we do by a long way, but with whom we can start to build relationships and try and at least influence where they go forward. And I just think we have to keep going. We have to look at reform. It's a very British approach. Very <laughs> British, I know. But it's a classic keep British thing. Carry on. When in doubt, just keep going. But it served me reasonably well. And keeping going and not giving in not being prepared to say, we can't do this, it's too difficult, but keep going and being prepared to continue to promote the values we hold while recognizing that maybe that does mean the organizations have to be tweaked, be changed, be reformed, whatever words you like. But what it does not mean is that we, A, got it wrong, because we didn't, and B, that we need to start again and build something different because that would be incredibly complicated. And I think we would end up losing so much of the things that we hold dear. Thank you very much, Catherine Ashton, ladies and gentlemen. Let me just warm applause for our speaker. Thank you very much for this talk. We have to stop here because the time is flashing.
much, Baroness Ashton, Małgorzata Bonikowska. I will now invite uh, Alina Inaye from the German Marshall Fund of the United States to lead the next session uh, of the Democratic Resilience Track, protecting democratic election from malign actors and the power of algorithm. Alina, please uh, join us on stage. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for still being here with us. Um, it's not an easy conversation that we are going to have, although the title seems to be extremely specific and clear. We've been trying to dig a little bit into what it is that we want to talk uh, when we were in the green room. Um, and as I said, the conversation could last for three hours or could last for the 45 minutes that we were assigned. And we went for the second choice. So we'll keep it as crisp as possible. And I have four wonderful speakers with me to help uh, uh, lead the conversation who are not only extremely knowledgeable, but they are also very, very disciplined when it comes to time. Um, and we'll start a little bit with the very title of the session, which is extremely specific, as I was saying. It refers to elections, it refers to malign, uh, malign interference, and it refers to algorithms. Um, and I will turn to John to help us um, explain a little bit the title. Um, malign interference, is it only external? Um, is it only elections? What do we do about respecting freedom, respecting democracy, yet still um, limiting the malign influence, interference? Thank you, Alina, and thank you to the Warsaw Security Forum. What a pleasure to be here with such a great group. So when I read the title, I found myself thinking, what's the problem we want to look at here? Because when framed in that way, and sometimes I feel like the discussion looks to me like it's a concern about the weeks leading up to an election in which social media platforms are used usually to confuse voters. But I feel like we know now at this point, this began probably in 2014, frankly here in Ukraine, in Ukraine 2016, we know this is part of a much broader effort of global authoritarian malign influence. It's not just algorithms. I'd like to talk about algorithms, but it's also about media content sharing arrangements all around the country, all around the world. It's also about the use of oligarchs and kleptocratic resources that are being stored in democratic financial institutions and used to exert influence on political elections in Europe, in the United States, but then again also in places like Brazil in the Philippines where we see these issues coming. So I think we have to recognize that the algorithms piece is one toolkit, and I'll leave you with one data point, and I'll turn you there, that really struck me. Some of the folks I think who do some of the best work is Grafica. And Grafica has a report about the 2016 US election that shows indeed, in the weeks leading up to the election, there were some six million bots, fake news, conspiracy theory links. Four months later, there were nearly five million still. This is a much broader pattern. And I'll stop there because I do want to get into algorithms, but I don't want us to get, lose sight of the bigger problem of sort of malign influence upon democratic elections. Of course, it's a problem at home. The research shows that indeed, much of this information comes from domestic sources as well. But I think that we really have to sort of situate it broader, or it's really easy to get lost in a kind of technological discussion that misses, I think, the, the issues of the democracy dimensions that we should be talking about. So if we are talking about algorithms, maybe I should um, uh, turn to Martin and ask you, are algorithms enough to, to safeguard uh, freedom of speech, but also to limit malign influences? And are they usable? Is there anything else we should be using, people should be using, or sh who should be using behind and besides algorithms? Well, thank you very much, and thank you for the invitation. I would just uh, very... Um, shortly just like to call John that um, algorithms are just one element of the whole puzzle uh, but of course they can be helpful or harmful like anything uh, they are a tool um, so definitely there's work to be done to improve the way uh, algorithms which you know we know that they are a huge part of our online experience 
with the amount of content, especially user-generated content, that is basically being produced every day. Without algorithms, we would be swimming in a completely chaotic uh, sea, uh, and the internet would be unusable. So yes, algorithms play a, a, a role, and they can be improved. And we have done this over the years. We just spoke before the panel that a lot has been changing, especially as uh, since, um, uh, let's say, uh, 10 years ago. Uh, and one of these things that we've been doing is moving away from an algorithm, I'm talking very generally here, moving away from an algorithm that is a pure representation of what's out there and what people are looking at, for example, which was, which was the way it was uh, initially, to one that is heavily taking into account the quality of information um, and the reliability of the source where it comes from. Uh, so a lot more... Um, is being placed on who is talking uh, in terms of both quality, and these are, of course, mostly traditional, and in large part, traditional media organizations, um, but also uh, the transparency angle. So you can see who is talking. And if you look at the trust project we're running with some media organization, that is an important element. So we both, uh, we know who's talking, and, and these people are identified, and the algorithm surfaces these sources that are verified and, and quality and, and, and um, uh, helpful and not just popular. So there is definitely a lot to be done and there is work being done, but that's definitely not going to just solve the problem in itself, especially depending on the kind of social media. Sometimes the users have a very heavy influence on what is being shared and there, no algorithm will help you if the people really want to share this kind of content. Let's, uh, let's be a little more, more specific and talk about um, elections coming up um, in November, the midterm elections coming up uh, in the States, um, elections that we just recently uh, held in Italy and in other parts of Europe, um, but focusing a little bit on, on, on the US. Um, Carl, do you think that both Russia and China, let's be even more specific now, um, will succeed in having a, um, an interference in the, uh, in the upcoming elections? And is there any way that th through the social media or the social media should be, um, um, should be disciplined in order to, to minimize this influence? Yeah, I think the answer to the direct question is, of course, I mean, we've seen the evidence of this uh, previously in previous elections, and it's not just the US, it's all over Europe. Uh, I, I take exactly, exactly what uh, John was saying, which is this is just one tool in the toolbox for malign influence and for the destabilization of democratic regimes. But uh, I think we have to ask ourselves, why is this the, the tool of choice? Uh, for a lot of these authoritarian regimes. Why do they invest so much in it? I mean, take a country like Bulgaria, uh, which has just had elections recently. And uh, in Bulgaria, we know that there are strong links with, with Russia. There have been Russian influence offline, Russian influence operations around pipelines for many, many years, decades now, for example. These are the kind of classic subversion techniques, I would say, influence techniques. But also the Kremlin invests uh, something like 200 to 300 billion per year on Facebook advertising in Bulgaria. And you can tell the effects of that right now. Bulgaria has had, effectively, its uh, oil and gas supplies cut off unilaterally by Gazprom and the Kremlin. Uh, and yet, the amount of support online for Russia uh, expressed by the Bulgarian population is amazing. It's particularly important because 70% of the Bulgarian population get their news from Facebook. Yeah? And I think this is why there is a specific responsibility for these platforms, because they are now the ta town hall. They are the agora for these public debates, not just in, in countries where, say, Facebook is the internet, like Myanmar or large parts of Africa, but even in a country like, like Bulgaria. So I think there's, there's specific responsibilities. I have to, we have to look at why it's so attractive to authoritarian, authoritarian regimes. And I think a lot of that is around the business model, around the micro-targeting that these platforms use. This is a holy grail to anybody who's involved in political influence campaign, that you can create a kind of digital clone, a model of somebody, something, a, a model that people aren't even aware of, and you can influence aspects of their choice and behavior in ways that they are only dimly aware of and aren't labeled as political advertising. You know, for dark ops, for political influence, this is, uh, this is amazing. And I think, so we need to, well, there's a lot we can talk about uh, transparency of algorithms and, and, and so forth uh, that's downstream. I think we also need to look upstream 
at the way that uh, these, uh, these platforms collect data, make these models using data that we haven't given them. It's often inferred data. Uh, and then they essentially sell that to the highest bidder. So again, uh, in order to, to, um, to minimize the influence through the social media, through the platforms, um, what should be the rules? The Brussels is, uh, Brussels is trying to put, on, uh, to put out some rules um, in, in order to, to discipline this a little bit. Are these efforts so far enough? Are these rules enough? Should there be something else, Nadia? Mm. I think it's a process, and because the technology, the internet uh, evolves, we will have to think of the further ways to address the rising challenges that come with the use of algorithms, with the, uh, maybe the reasons why authoritarian regimes are trying to influence, manipulate information in the public sphere. So I think that the constant process of improvement, of uh, uh, addressing these threats um, in a relevant, meaningful, and timely manner will continue to be the case. So what has been done so far, for me, it's just a uh part of this process. Uh, we see uh, the adoption of the Digital Services Act, M Markets Act, uh, the updated code of practice and disinformation, which is not a directive, it's not a um uh, it's more of a kind of uh, self-regulatory for the companies, but we do have now more companies, we do have more platforms, we have more actors uh, signing the code, and uh, that is kind of sharing the responsibility and making sure that the wider ecosystem is involved in addressing these challenges. So what Brussels does, we also have to come back, it's what the member states also um, make it possible for uh, Brussels to legislate on in many ways, so it's also in the interest of of the democracies of the member states that do show that they do care and that they acknowledge that these are rising challenges that must be addressed to defend democracy or ensure uh, the protection of the democratic values, the rights of freedoms of expression and gatherings, etc. But uh, what more could be done, I think, is um, actually on this front of what has been mentioned a little bit on the front of transparency and accountability. The fact that we do not have, or certain companies, social media platforms, giants, uh, are still uh, restricting the access to uh, the algorithms, to the ways of how the system, ecosystem works, how are these messages spread, um, uh, how are they financed, the financing of this, what is allowed, the, the scale, the magnitude, the frequency of all of this matters in order to make the right regulations to, um, to engage in this debate in really tailored way. So we don't uh, kind of swim in the pool of the um, you know, quantity of information trying to find the right way, but we actually do have more of a, um, a coordinated, cooperative, and, uh, and therefore more uh, effective way uh, to counter the spread of this information. So I do think uh, uh, there is definitely much more to do, not only by Brussels, definitely by democracies themselves, but beyond that, it's not only, I think, the responsibility of the states. We, we need to engage the wider uh, stakeholders uh, groups like um, the civil society, academia, the media companies. I mean, the whole fact that it's also the, the media companies that uh, sometimes share this uh, information that come from the social media platforms, it's it's a circular kind of system, and we need to engage more actors, advertising companies, marketing companies, as, as you said, um, uh, you know, personalities, influencers, also individual private people, we see it now, maybe we'll discuss further as well, have uh, now rising power in the public sphere. So we, we need to also consider that there are more actors that need to play a role, and therefore this ecosystem is, uh, is uh, something that we need to engage those actors as well. I mean, I'd like to echo that point very, very strongly about uh, bringing more people into uh, the investigation of these algorithms, right? I mean, there's a, a proposal on the, on the table from the European Commission that would make, give regulators access, but I think it has to be, there has to be access from, for independent academics, uh, civil society, for this data as well, because, again, this is just about applying standards that are in other sectors to these big platforms. For example, there has long been the principle that if your product creates safety risks, the risks, it needs to be independently inspected and verified. And I think we're just asking that in this case where there are risks to our democracies, to some of the most precious things that we have, that these things can be independently verified. And one example of that is, for example, we, we, all, feel, we all feel the effects of the kind of content moderation algorithms in our Twitter feeds and Facebook feeds. You know, why, why don't we know 
you know, exactly how these work. And, and there should be more interoperability. We should be able to choose between different content moderation systems. Uh, and I, I, the sort of resistance of companies to these kind of, I think, very simple measures is a little uh, incomprehensible. Thank you. If I can, I'd love to build on some of these points. To me, it seems that there are two dimensions to this challenge that we should and can identify. I mean, the first is really sort of the defensive agenda, countering malign influence from outside on our countries. And on this, I would certainly think very clearly that it's not that engaging civil society is important because, in fact, it is civil society that is often the organizations that are out there identifying, advocating, raising, and speaking up on these issues. It's independent journalists in some places, in some very risky places where they're, who merit our support and our protection. But the other, if we're just playing defense, it's not going to get us anywhere. The question is, how can we have a proactive agenda that advances the democratic principles, the principles of transparency, of accountability? And how can we recognize that there was Ron Diebert of Citizen Lab in Toronto has written some really compelling work that warns that even that basic business model that you talked about is one that is in many ways more aligned with authoritarian values. Their values, it's about monitoring, surveillance, and manipulation. But how do we respond to that in a way that is true to the democratic values that, frankly, I think are going to be the key to the democratic success? We, how do we recognize what is the relationship with the private sector, which will remain the private sector? And how do we then come up with a process as well that engages really our strengths of these kind of bottom-up approaches that authoritarian regimes lack? Is where vibrant civil societies that can play that role and advocate and respond both sides of this agenda. Um, the role is this distinction uh, between democracy and the extent of freedom of sp and freedom of speech and uh, and the fear of, of encroaching about this freedom of speech when you come up with any sort of regulation, any sort of censorship, even self-censorship to a certain to a certain extent. It's obviously much easier in countries like China and Russia where they just cut off the internet, hence there is no problem. We cannot do this. We are democratic. We operate in democratic uh, in democratic societies. Um, so, however you look at this, this question always comes up to my, uh, you know, to my mind and to, to a lot of people's mind. Isn't this, uh, um, on, on, you know, stepping it into my own personal liberties and freedom? Um, so again, coming back now to the to the to the uh, company part of it, or to the company perspective uh, perspective on this, are there ways that the companies that big platforms can behave differently, still ensuring freedom of speech, yet still limiting interference, malign interference? Well, interference. Yeah, I, th I think this is the the, the biggest question. Uh, and one that, that, that is a bit of a, both a thin line to walk uh, and also a, a bit of a moving line to, to hit. And we've been talking about how, how these policies have changed over time already. Um, I'd just like to quickly touch upon what uh, Carl and Nadia said. Some, some of these, I, I completely agree with the, um, uh, the, the way you, you propose we, we move and, and, and a lot of this stuff, at least I cannot speak for all the platforms, but if you look at what we're doing, Transparency, you have the uh, electoral ads transparency register where you can see the ad, you can see who paid for it, you can see how many times it was viewed, you can see how it was targeted, and the, and the targeting has been very limited. For electoral, uh, for political issues, you can only uh, target by general location, age and, age and gender. So it's very limited. There's no way of micro-targeting people by, you know, especially sensitive data. So th a lot of this stuff has already been done. At least, like I said, I cannot speak for any other platform, but at least as far as Google goes, a lot of, I completely agree with what you said, and, and, and I think we have, we are mostly there. We are signatories of the code you mentioned on disinformation and many other things, and there is the regulation on political advertising also coming, which to a large extent, I think is, we're already compliant even before it's been enacted. But the question you're saying is actually uh, uh, quite um, pertinent to this regulation as well, because the, one of the biggest issues is that how do you define a political, a political speech? Like what issues are political? Because once we start um, regulating this part, like where is the line? What, what issues 
are to be considered, you know, is, is, is environment political? You could argue it is, right? Is science political? Science has become political in recent years, to, to my surprise. So I think the, um, the balance between freedom of speech, and, and, and we said before the panel, no medium is completely transparent. So there's always some sort of um, noise introduced into the system by the medium that's being, that's being used, but we do have to I do see personally that there is sometimes voices that go a little bit too far. Uh, you know, people claim something to be disinformation just before, because it disagrees with their worldview, right? So there is a very difficult, uh, and we as platforms, we as the medium must be super careful about this. I mean, this is a great responsibility. Of course, we have a responsibility to protect democracy, as Carl said, as, as, uh, as corporate citizens, I think no one is denying that. But on the other hand, the, the freedom of speech angle is also very important, especially us coming from the U.S. with, you know, First Amendment, and we're very, um, uh, very attached to the whole openness of the internet and of our platforms, which is a, generally a very, a, a massive, I think, um, a great boon to society. So, in keeping the core of freedom of speech, we do have to try and limit as much as we can. Of course, acknowledging that we can never eradicate everything. But through transparency, through responsible policies, and through cooperation, like uh, was just mentioned ago, I think we can at least limit, we have some metrics like w that on YouTube, the views from uh, uh, infringing content should not be more than 0.5%, right? So we should uh, have realistic goals, and I think we can definitely make good progress, but try not to, uh, not to throw the baby out with the bathwater as well. Uh, some may argue, and I, I, I tend to agree with them, that uh, we can have the most perfect um, um, regulations and we can have the most understanding and disciplined and well-intended, um, you know, platforms. Yet, as long as there is something missing, this will not work. And that's something, we talked a little bit about this earlier marching in the room, and that something is education, personal education, the way each one of us approach um, the platforms, use the platforms, um, the way each one of us are able or not able or willing or not willing to discern uh, information and fake, and fake information. And I'm coming to you, Nadia, from, from, your, from where you sit in Brussels, from what you're looking at, at you know, European Commission and everything that's being done um, in, in, in the direction of limiting uh, malign, uh, malign uh, interference. Do you think there is enough accent effort being put on education as well? I think there is actually a lot of um, effort put to media literacy, digital literacy. There is a rising uh, awareness building um, uh, whole system and investments into this across different member states. There is a media literacy day or few days uh, per year. I think uh, the commission has been in need of that. Uh, civil society as well has been increasing the number of the trainings. What I and I think education will and always um, is useful to enhance, to counter, or be able to be resilient to this information. But um, one of the main issues is that it's not that sometimes people don't, um, uh, don't, don't understand or don't recognize something being manipulated or being in a, a falsehood or, or just a disinformation to a certain extent. They will still spread it further because it does uh, somehow support their beliefs or they want to have this message out for whatever reason. So uh, the education is only uh, part of the puzzle to solve this. And I think coming back on the uh, idea of like the, the political communication and how, how, like what role is science now, political, uh, and every other domain. The idea is uh, not necessarily focusing so much on the content because we do have freedom of speech, opinions, uh, people will be finding a way of sharing their views. It's more about the reach and uh, the, the, the speed and the scale of spreading those messages, which are uh, not only happening in the social media space, it's also uh, through emails and other tools and applications. So uh, I think some of you, and uh, this is a very valid point, it's not only about uh, freedom of speech, but also is it about freedom of reach? Is the freedom of reach uh, you know, deserving the same uh, rights as freedom of speech? And then we also have heard several times Commissioner uh, Viera Jourova, who has uh, also stated that you know, the, the rules that apply offline should also apply online. So why should we have different rules for these spaces? I mean, we can debate um, uh, how to address those things, but um, 
there is absolutely the role of education putting also the responsibility on the consumers and the citizens, uh, let's say the users of the social media platforms, but let's be realistic here and see who has the real accountability and the real power to uh, adjust this kind of uh, behavioral patterns, uh, the, the, the algorithms, but also the other ways of amplifications of those narratives. Um, and here we have the other uh, major actors, such as social media companies, such as the state regulators, such as the advertising companies, marketing companies. So it's also about how to protect the people's private data, because a lot of this information uh, that is being then used further, sold, as you mentioned to the companies, is actually like to marketing companies that have the phone numbers. We saw it in 2018 elections in Brazil. They were so-called WhatsApp elections. And why were there WhatsApp elections? Because there were thousands of messages which were able to be spread to, uh, to huge groups of WhatsApp consumers. Uh, these are encrypted messages, so it's very difficult to also expose, to kind of intervene into this process. And uh, the data, that the phone numbers that were gathered by the companies uh, were you know, received and purchased from, uh, from other, other companies that had access to it. So afterwards, one of the measures was to actually uh, not allow this type of uh, so, uh, you know, selling and purchases of the of the private information. Uh, there was there has been limit uh, put on the number of the the um, uh, groups and the messages that you can spread in one go across WhatsApp or other applications. So there have been measures since, but um, we have seen that even uh, in the elections last weekend. Of course, there was a lot of reference in Brazil to the previous elections four years ago, the WhatsApp elections. I mean, some things changed, many of things stayed the same because you can. You have seen only certain uh, restrictions being implemented. So we also speak about the, this kind of encrypted, more closed groups, which are extremely used for also the spread of this information. So how do we address those? Um, I want to take the conversation a little bit further because we've been talking about malign interference, we've been talking about disinformation, but the, there is another, it's not, only, it's not only another term that is being used, but there is another reality which is, which is being well, inflicted upon us, which is psychological warfare. We are beyond disinformation, we are beyond fake news, we are well even beyond malign interference, we are in the middle of a psychological warfare. And I'm coming back to what you said earlier, Glenn, that, um, um, John, sorry, um, that uh, it's not enough to be defensive. So what do you mean by that? How can you be offensive? How can you be offensive when we are in the middle of, or the victim of, victims of a psychological war? So it's a really important point here. And I actually think it brings us to one of the conversations we've been having throughout these two days, which is Ukraine. Alongside Russia's unprovoked military invasion, it has been using the tools of information warfare along it, side it. And what's been really interesting is it's not hard to read folks saying that Ukraine seems to be winning the information war, actually. And it's because they've had eight years since 2014 to be learning the lessons. Suddenly these new phrases that we hear about pre buttles this effort of civil society groups to cooperate happened so quickly. But I tell you, I, the reason I think it's important and the reason I pulled my notes out here is because in this early era, when we're talking in some ways around issues around science, it can sound like, and the response is about fact checking. Is it true something is not true? But when we get in this situation, it's different. And I want to read, just quote one sentence here, but I was struck last week listening to Tim Snyder talk about the referenda that were being sham referenda in the uh, republics of, of Ukraine there. And he said, the way Russian electoral propaganda works is to tell a lie that everyone knows is a lie. And then to show by force that there is no alternative to living as though the lie were true. And I think this is when we get in the sort of incredibly difficult moment in which it's not just enough to say, oh, we'll just show that that's not true. We'll just fact check it. We'll just teach people to recognize falsehoods. And that's why I think there, and I actually think though that in Ukraine, it's difficult in some ways to, to say far, this conflict isn't over, but we're seeing an acceleration of learning in the information space that I think we, we have a lot to learn from. Carl, your, your organization, the organization you represent, um, works in a lot of difficult societies, I would say. Um, how do you 
First of all, how do you deal with everything, with, with, the, with the psychological uh, warfare, with informational warfare in these societies? How do you help societies deal with this, with this informational, uh, informational warfare? And what do you think would be, if there would be one, is there a golden bullet that could solve, silver bullet that could solve the problems of all these societies when it comes to informational warfare? We know exactly who the actors are, so it's, at least that it's easy. Um, well, indeed, we, we are very active in lots of very challenging environments, as I think the euphemism goes, and uh, uh, I think we've been in the business long enough to know that there are no silver bullets when it comes to questions like promotion of democracy and, and human rights, right? Uh, that's that, uh, but I, I, what, what I will say is that uh, uh, the situation is very different in, I would say, mature democracies than it is in some of the most vulnerable regions in the world. I, what I said before is that for some regions, we saw it in the, in the Rohingya massacre in, in Myanmar, uh, Facebook, Meta, is the internet. This is you know, how people access the internet, right? And, so, uh, and it's even worse than that because uh, there are understandable pressures uh, on companies like Meta in their home jurisdictions like the US to clean up their act ahead of the midterm elections and the presidential elections. Uh, but they don't really invest the same in other, they, 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 uh, they invest very aggressively in these regions in terms of their business, but they don't invest the same in terms of the kind of basic safeguards you would expect. So one very critical fact here, right, is that even though only 9% of Meta's users speak English, 90% of their investments in content moderation are in the English language, right? So if you, if you then look at uh, what's been happening in India, for example, where exactly this kind of psychological warfare takes place, uh, or psychological influence uh, techniques, I would say, because let's go back to the original business model. You're building a psychological profile of somebody, and you are trying to uh, not deal in arguments, but to, you're, you're trying to manipulate their emotional reactions. And there aren't even very basic standards of transparency around this. I mean, I, I, mean, I realize that some platforms have made greater, gone to greater lengths than others uh, in this respect. But I mean, again, just to take another example from a recent uh, US election, there were lots of um, videos going around, viral videos going around, s supposedly showing uh, France or the Netherlands under Sharia law, pictures of uh, the Mona Lisa in a burqa, for example. Now, these weren't labeled as political content, but they were targeted at people who, whose fears were about migration, and they were intended to support the candidate who was going to purportedly do something about Muslim migration to the US, right? Now, we only know that this was actually paid for by a super PAC by the, by the Trump campaign at the time because of a mistake in the accounting firm who uh, actually accidentally released this detail into the public inf uh, domain, right? So this is so far from basic standards of transparency that apply offline, uh, we really need to up our game on this. And I think this is, this is absolutely critical. And I think some of the things that are being done in Brussels now in political uh, advertising transparency will help, um, but I think there needs to be a lot more, a lot more done. Well, we have about three minutes before we lose one of the speakers. So if there is um, a question, or if there are two questions from the room, we could take them. And I cannot see anything. Yes, go. Yeah, yeah. The, the gentleman in the third row, and then the lady over there. Thank you very much. My my name is uh, Christian Bissinger, I'm a volunteer at the forum and I was wondering uh, especially what uh, social media platforms were doing um, in the sense of content moderation when it comes to outsourcing um, those tasks to third countries and especially in, in link to human rights and uh, working conditions. Thank you. And that's a question directed to... It can can be to, to the, uh, to the um, to panel at, at a whole, but yeah. um, mainly addressed, um, yeah. Well, uh, I'm not sure I can again speak for the whole industry. We have, I think, about 20,000 content moderators all around the world. Um, and I do know generally that they are really spread out all across the world. Um, and I, the you asking about conditions and they have a uniform set of working conditions and standards etc so if I you know the question was quite general but uh, um, from our perspective the it's a, of course it's a tough job and we 
we are aware of that and they get the whole package of support and psychological help and all the safeguards against uh, over overexposure and that kind of stuff including machine um, machine learning that helps limit the number of actual human interactions they need to have with a really brutal extreme content so we are of course uh, looking into uh, constantly improving their um, welfare so um, thank you for the question but uh, I don't know if, if such a general answer is uh, satisfies you but I just like to quickly touch upon some of the themes that were just mentioned um, including uh, education and I think this is something that we really learn to uh, understand that this is a, some, something we need to invest, especially if you, you mentioned, uh, Indiana, uh, psychological warfare. Like we need to build resilience of societies. That's, that's the bottom line. So uh, through media literacy, through um, we have, now we've launched, I don't know, maybe some of you have seen ads running on, on all sorts of media about uh, pre-bunking, this new technique of kind of inoculating against common misinformation techniques. So we have one that is dedicated for this region as part of our uh, special commitment. Uh, especially there was also mention of, of, of lower resources for these um, niche, say, markets. We have also looked into that and, uh, and our CEO has committed an extra fund of 10 million to improve this exactly in the region. But this campaign is directed at the situation with Ukrainian refugees in the region. So specifically targeting the kinds of propaganda tropes that we're seeing in the media um, to try and debunk it before it actually impacts people, there's hence pre-bunking. And there's going to be another media literacy on YouTube, which is already launched in the US, where it's coming localized all around the world. So definitely um, education is one of the key elements uh, uh, for raising resilience. So this is psychological warfare, as mentioned by John, it doesn't have to work to our disadvantage. If we are uh, a resilient uh, society, a well-educated uh, society that can use social media as a, as a tool for good, I think this is the right path. Thank you. Uh, Carl, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I'll be and very quick because we'll uh, I know we're out of time. And so uh, basically in answer to your question, and there's no easy answer, but I think we have to understand that right now these platforms are essentially the operating systems of our democracies. They're part of the critical infrastructure of our societies in the same way that financial institutions are and the energy infrastructure is, and they need to be heavily regulated in the same way that these uh, sectors are. And it goes beyond the regulation. I think there just needs to be a constant dialogue between these platforms and regulators and civil society about how we manage our democracies. That's the basic responsibility uh, that uh, I'd like to see anyway in the next few years. Oh, we'll take this last question and then when you answer the question, I will also ask the speakers to make your, your final remarks so we can wrap this up as close to the deadline as possible. Yes, go ahead. Uh, Joanna Fonamava, Senior Policy Advisor at Leiden University. Um, you're talking about education and whenever we're talking about protecting democratic elections, democracy, the focus tends to be on media literacy, digital literacy. I'm wondering whether we're not paying enough attention to teaching the basics of what democracy looks like. What does civil society look like? A lot of the students that I encounter, you know, don't understand the basics of how democracies actually work, you know, separations of power. And then when you see the rise of authoritarianism, they, they fall victim to, to some of the misinformation about how a democracy works, what it looks like, and then therefore cannot see people, you know, doing undemocratic things. So I'm wondering whether you can comment on whether we're failing on education beyond just media literacy and not updating our curriculums, especially at a younger age, high school level already. Um, maybe we're catching it too late. Great question. Thank you. I would add history as well to democracy. So uh, who, wants to, who wants to answer first? Uh, you all will have to answer, so who answers first? John, you want to pick it up? Sure. I, unquestionably, this question of civics and civic education, but interestingly, I, I, I like the way that you phrased it. We said, this is part of our democracy now, so how are we updating our understanding of these pieces? Let me take just a moment to say that part of what's interesting to me here, and what I appreciated the mentions of Brazil, the mentions of other efforts that are being made here, is this is a problem that can often seem eternally new, sort of starstruck by the problem, and we spend a lot of time, as some say, admiring it. I think we're further than that now. And what we're, we're at a period, maybe we're still in trial and error and we're figuring out what works. But really what's incumbent upon us now, and I think I heard on this panel's discussion today, is how do we identify, let's just call them, not the solution. I understand, it's not tomorrow, we'll fix it. 
but what are the elements of an effective response in the, res in the respective and appropriate situations? And I really feel that that's the element where I'm really interested in this conversation and where it's going and where I hope the experts who are with us will join us in that, because that's really where we are, I'm, in some ways in my mind, is how can we learn together from our experiences to go forward? Well, um, just very quickly, I, I think uh, I'm very sympathetic to the question because I think uh, the solution to a lot of our issues around disinformation are to create more curious citizens. But that's a generational project, right? That will take 15, 20 years. And the idea that we do nothing in the meantime or that we do nothing about the way that this disinformation circulates is obviously inconceivable. So I, I, and then I would refer you to my previous answers on that. Yeah. So we do have civic education, we, we do have also these other trainings, media training, so history, uh, social sciences, so people do learn about how their democratic system works, especially in their own country. And the democratic system is not the same in every single country. Democracy is not a universal thing, I meaning the same things across the whole world. But I do agree that, of course, it is important to engage uh, and perhaps enhance this or connect these issues with other existing curricular items, such as critical thinking also, uh, across different classes. Um but again, I feel like uh, education is only part of the puzzle and this resilience building is only going to go as much, as far as, uh, as we can to actually address the, the, the challenges and the threats of, uh, of spreading manipulated information, having access uh, to millions of people uh, by, by people who have money or the companies, etc. So I think it's only part of the puzzle, definitely uh, playing an important role. Um, but also I think uh, how we teach democracy matters. It's not only what we teach. It's also that it's not just I have the right to say what I want because I live in a democratic country. No, we are part of the community. We are part of the society. It's not individualistic approach to addressing these threats, like what I as a user uh, am protected or can do. So thinking of also the other values of empathy, of how do we relate one to each other is also something that should be part of the education and, and um, it seems that the focus is becoming more and more on the individualism than this collective value. So I do think that it's kind of cross horizontal um, discussion. Thank you and Marcin very quickly because you have to run and we all have to run. I have to run just quickly on that very good point. I think you'll see some of that thinking in what we do ahead of elections, where we do special doodles on election day. We post information about how to vote, where to vote, or information on candidates, and that kind of stuff, exactly trying to promote the ideas of democracy. So I think that definitely is also a very important question. And just to sum up, I think everything's been said, and uh, as John said, we have a puzzle, but let's move beyond the kind of being surprised with the puzzle and to the solving of the puzzle. I think a lot of work, I, I feel from since I've been at Google, a lot of work has been done and we're moving quite in, in, the, in, a, in a good direction, but more education, more collaboration with civil, civil society, even, even smart regulation. I think they're all elements of this puzzle, but um, uh, we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction. I'm optimistic. On this optimistic note, please join me in thanking the, the wonderful speakers who are very disciplined and very substantive, and thank you for your patience as well. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very, very much for participating in the Democratic Resilience Truck of Warsaw Security Forum 2022. We will invite you back in this room at 1.15, at 1.15 for the Global Outlook Track. Thank you again very, very much and uh, enjoy the break. Thank you.
Good afternoon, and welcome to the Global Outlook track on day two of the world of the Warsaw Security Forum. My name is Terry Martin. I have the honor of guiding you through the program here on the stage in the Warsaw Room this afternoon, and what a program it is. We have government ministers and parliamentarians from many countries in Europe, Asia, and North America. We have officials from NATO and the European Union. We have military leaders, security advisors, representatives of leading think tanks, and civil society. The Warsaw Security Forum is always interesting. If you've ever been here before, this is my fourth year in a row. But this year is special for obvious reasons. As the Prime Minister of Poland said yesterday, Russia's aggression in Ukraine has unleashed demons. But the clear message coming from this forum to the rest of the world is that those demons will not prevail. This afternoon, we'll continue to talk about events in Ukraine, of course, while broadening our, our scope. We'll discuss challenges facing Europe and its partners around the world, from the transatlantic realm to the Mediterranean, from the Black Sea to the Pacific. We'll look not only at where we are now, but where we want to go and how to get there. So, let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce our first high-level conversation focusing on U.S. foreign policy priorities. And I believe we have a slide that goes along with that. Let's see if we can get that up on the screen. A poll was conducted, a transatlantic poll, so this is taking in North America and Europe, uh, in May and June of this year. And the results concerning Joe Biden, President Joe Biden's handling of international affairs, you can see on the screen there. 55% approval, so he's on the upside, versus 32% disapproval. Of course, there are lots more numbers going along with that, and I'm sure my colleagues here at the Warsaw Security Forum can give you details on that if you wish. I haven't seen all of the results of the poll myself, but it's very different in different parts of the world. Right now, we're going to get an idea of where U.S. policy priorities lie. We have this high-profile, high-level conversation led by news anchor Katarzyna Swabinska. Good afternoon, welcome to our conversation, and I have a great privilege to welcome Mr. Philip Gordon, the National Security Advisor to the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you. And again, I'm Katarzyna Sławinska. I'm, with, uh, I'm foreign news editor and reporter at uh, TVN's nightly news show called uh, Facte. And the topic of our conversation is the U.S. Uh, foreign policy priorities in the era of uh, global rivalry. It's impossible, of course, not to start with uh, what's going on in Ukraine, Ukraine with uh, Russia's aggression on Ukraine. The U.S. has uh, stepped in decisively, offering military support and financial support and in many other areas. Uh, my question is, what's the U.S. aim uh, in regard uh, to Russia? Is it uh, to weaken Russia? Is it to defeat Russia? Or is it to topple Putin's regime? Uh, thank you, Kasia. Uh, and first, let me just say how pleased I am to be here at the forum and in Warsaw in general. Um, we've got such important business with the government of Poland. I had a chance this morning to speak with some counterparts and we are truly aligned on these issues of Ukraine, NATO, and our bilateral alliance. On your question, look, I'm not going to speculate about the future of what happens in Russia. What I can do is tell you what our policy is. And what our policy is uh, consists of imposing severe costs on Russia for its uh, outrageous and unjustified invasion of Ukraine, by which I mean severe export controls, financial sanctions, a uh, ban on purchases of Russian oil, hopefully soon a price cap on Russian oil. 
all of which uh, we think undermine, or we know, we know, we are quite confident it is already undermining Russia's ability to wage war in Ukraine uh, and to threaten other countries in the region like Poland. So Russia has to pay a severe price for this, and we with our allies are imposing that price. We're also, as you mentioned, providing extensive support to Ukraine that goes on. And I think a lot of people suspected or worried that by now the initial support would start to wane. But just this week, uh, Congress added another $13 billion to what we've already provided, which is over $26 billion in security assistance, uh, financial assistance, humanitarian assistance, budgetary support. And then just yesterday, after speaking to President Zelensky, President Biden announced another 600 plus million in support for Ukraine. And that is also part of our Russia policy. And we're doing this all very closely together with our allies. Um, uh, and we think it's having a, a great and positive effect. Uh, we have to look uh, a little bit into the future and uh, what it would mean for Ukraine to win. The support is clearly visible on the battlefield. Putin's army is losing currently on the battlefield in Ukraine. Uh, he's becoming more and more uh, desperate and uh, his future uh, is becoming more and more unpredictable. So is the US ready for what may come next, possibly the collapse of Putin's regime or even uh, disintegration of uh, Russian state? Yeah, you know, it's hard uh, to look too far into the future here. And that's why I'm reluctant to like speculate about what's around the corner. Uh, we've been wrong about many aspects of the conflict so far. And, you know, it's not helpful to just uh, speculate about what comes next. What we've said is, for now, what we're doing is resisting this Russian aggression and helping Ukraine take back territory that Russia has illegally grabbed or claimed. And thanks to the bravery of the Ukrainians, with support by uh, many of its partners and allies, uh, they're in the process of doing that. And what we've said is we are going to help them take back that territory and put them in a stronger position. I think, uh, Kasia, the answer to most of your questions so far is up to the Ukrainians, like the definition of victory and what it consists of and you know what happens next. We are trying to strengthen Ukraine's position. Ukraine has said uh, that eventually there needs to be some sort of negotiation and we want them to be in the strongest possible position for them to determine what victory consists of uh, and we're committed to that. Uh, President Zelensky uh, recently said after the Putin's annexation speech that he is willing to negotiate with Russia, but not with President Putin, for, for, with whoever, whoever may come after him. And uh, President Biden famously said here in Warsaw during his March speech, uh, for God's sake, this man cannot remain in power. So I understand your point about uh, not uh, speculating about the future, but being ready for, uh, for this future. Is it a, a, a US policy to, to try to see Putin um, go away? Um, I, no, that's not US policy to create regime change in Russia, and we've been very clear about that. Um, you mentioned the president's comments, and what we said about that is that is a natural comment for anyone to make looking at the atrocities that are taking place uh, caused by Putin. And I think that's a perfectly understandable reaction to have that feeling. Um, and I think it's the feeling of many around here uh, and in Ukraine. And, and it was what President Biden expressed um, when he was here. But we don't have a policy of regime change. Our policy, as I said, is to impose severe costs on Russia for this aggression. Uh, to support the Ukrainian people in, uh, in liberating their territory. Uh, everything what Russia does in Ukraine uh, attempts at land grab and also aggression on Ukraine is really closely watched in Beijing, of course, in the context of its uh, ambitions um, um, about Taiwan. Uh, what's, uh, do you think that all this concert, concentration on NATO's uh, eastern flank, on uh, this conflict uh, going on Euro in Europe, has downplayed the US commitment to the security in the Pacific? So we have to do and can do more than one thing at a time. Um, there's always speculation, does a pivot to Asia mean abandoning Europe? 
you know, I would say two things. Yes, we are still focused on Asia. Uh, China is a colossal power that can in many ways rival the United States. And we have to be focused on that strategic challenge. We're not shy about that. And we've said that, that uh, much of the history of this century will be written in Asia and we need to be prepared for it. And we are. I actually just got back from a trip with the vice president to Japan and the Republic of Korea, other allies that are concerned about a, a, a big neighbor. And that mission goes on, and we're not shying away from underscoring that China is central in our foreign policy. But it doesn't mean, and I think our actions underscore what I'm about to say, doesn't mean in any way you know, abandoning other important theaters like Europe. And even as we have focused on our hugely important challenges in Asia and our alliances in Asia and the challenge in China, we have managed to find tens of billions of dollars in the US budget to back Ukraine and provide unprecedented military assistance and to reinforce our NATO allies, including Poland, with additional force presence and troops and equipment. So it's, it really isn't zero sum. Obviously, you know, you have to make uh, some choices and there is a limited number of resources. But I think two things are true at the same time. We face enormous challenges in Asia and we're committed to dealing with them but we are also uh, in total solidarity with our NATO allies. And just last point on this, because there actually are some analogies between the two. In both cases, we're doing it with our allies. You know, I mentioned just going to Japan and, and the Republic of Korea. We can't succeed in Asia without strong allies. We can't succeed in Europe without strong allies. And we need both to do more and be aligned with us. And we think they're doing just that. So what's the U.S. planning to do to counteract this uh, rising offensive policy of China towards Taiwan? I think we've been pretty clear about that. I mean, we were most recently clear after Speaker Pelosi's visit and China took actions that we thought were a wild overreaction to a congressional visit. There are congressional visits all the time. We have made clear our policy on Taiwan has not changed. It didn't change with that visit. We are for uh, peaceful relations in the Taiwan Strait. We are for the status quo politically. Um, and we believe that no one should be unilaterally trying to change the status quo. And we were troubled by China's actions of crossing the center line and shooting missiles and destabilizing the relationship. Uh, so one thing we're doing is being clear about our policy with China and with others. We are underscoring our continued uh, willingness to uh, sail and fly consistent with international law uh, throughout the area. Freedom of navigation, freedom of the seas is, is critically important. And we're doing it together with our allies. And it's one of the things we just consulted about on the vice president's trip to East Asia. Uh, another quite telling words from President Biden from his recent interview with uh, CBS uh, station when asked uh, whether US forces would defend Taiwan, uh, he answered yes troops on the ground? Uh, I don't have anything to add to what the president said. He was asked that, and he was asked it in Tokyo previously, and he said the same thing. So there's consistency there. As I said, our policy on Taiwan uh, has not changed. Um, we believe that the status quo should be maintained and no one should challenge it. But the president was asked a hypothetical question about what would he would do. He answered it. He's been consistent on that point. Our job is to uh, avoid that hypothetical situation from taking place. We're trying to avoid conflict, and that's the reason we have uh, strong allies in the region, military presence in the region, and diplomacy in the region, so that that question never actually has to be answered. Um, let's move on to Iran, another arch rival, um, when you look at on the map, uh, with uh, brutal uh, crackdown of protests right now after death of Mahsa Amini by, in the hands of uh, morality police. There is still unresolved issue of nuclear agreement. Uh, there is uh, Iran selling drones to Russia. Those drones attack Ukrainian cities. What's the long-term policy of the United States uh, towards uh, Iran and its regime? Um, so first on the protests, which I'm glad you highlighted because they should be highlighted. Actually, the crackdown on the protests should be highlighted. You will have seen uh, in the, just the past several days, both the president and the vice president 
making statements about the rights or what should be the rights of Iranians to express themselves, to freely protest, uh, in particular women, and that's where the crackdown has been mostly focused, and these women should have the right to free expression, free speech, and it is more than regrettable that the Iranian regime, in, instead of allowing them such freedoms, is using violence and, and cracking down, and we condemn that uh, in the strongest terms. Um, in terms of Iran more generally, you mentioned many of the issues and policies we have a real problem with, you know, plotting against foreign officials, destabilizing neighbors, and a nuclear program that needs to be addressed. We've been pretty clear and consistent about the nuclear program. Uh, we remain ready to uh, have a nuclear deal with Iran or to revive the, the joint comprehensive plan of action. Only if Iran comes into full compliance, we've been seeking to negotiate that. Uh, there are still gaps. Uh, what we've said is that's in our interest and we think the world's interest because it blocks Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. It doesn't in any way sweep aside all of the other issues that we have concerns with, which we will continue to deal with. Um, uh, you know, most recently announcing new sanctions about those responsible for the crackdown, but on other things like ballistic, ballistic missiles and interference in neighboring states, those issues won't go away even if there is a nuclear deal. But uh, we have said that a nuclear deal that uh, constrains Iran's nuclear program is in our collective interest because all of these issues would be many, many, many times worse if Iran also had a nuclear weapon. And how do you react to Iran selling the drones uh, to Russia? Uh, we've been clear about that issue, not just with Iran, but in general, uh, it would be a mistake for any country to provide Russia's military with support. Um, and we have put export controls and penalties in place for anybody who, who does so, uh, and that applies to Iran or uh, anybody else. Nobody should be trying to assist the Russian war machine in its uh, land grab and atrocities. And we have sanctioned uh, the Iranians and others for doing so. It's a, a very, um, a lot is going on in the world uh, right now uh, with a war in uh, uh, Russia's aggression on Ukraine, with uh, rising um, potential of uh, China. Do you think that what's going on right now means that the rule-based uh, international order has come to an end, that it's gonna be a new era of just uh, big uh, powers uh, uh, competing and, and global rivalry? So the rules-based international order is certainly under threat. Uh, I don't wanna say it's come to an end. In fact, we're fighting very hard to preserve it. The vice president has talked a lot about this and did so um, most recently on this Asia trip where we see rules being challenged. Obviously, I mean, you mentioned the most egregious example most recently is Russia, whereas President Biden said at the UN last week, um, you know, this is one of the most uh, glaring violations of the rules-based order that we've seen in a very long time. I mean, it's not, there's no ambiguity there. It's just a, a, a land grab um, with horrific consequences that really needs to be condemned everywhere. And that, so that's the most egregious example of violating the rules-based order that we all need to stand up to. Unfortunately, it's not alone. Uh, there are other examples. Uh, you mentioned being in Asia, the uh, North Koreans continue to test ballistic missiles uh, or to use them for signaling in violation of numerous UN Security Council resolutions. We're concerned about Chinese practices um, in the territorial waters and airspace uh, of others. Uh, it is in all of our collective interests to stand up for this international uh, rules-based order. Let's not kid ourselves, it was never perfect. There was never some moment where everybody was always abiding by the rules. But we can sometimes lose sight of the fact that uh, if it were to completely go away, we would all be at, at great risk. And, you know, in a part of the world where we have seen it completely go away, uh, and we know what that looks like. So, uh, I don't want to say that we are anywhere near that now. What is clear is it's being challenged, and it's the responsibility of all countries around the world that want to see peace and stability for themselves and others to stand up 
for it and to condemn violations of it and to give themselves the capabilities to resist it when necessary. Uh, so what uh, needs to be done in order to protect this uh, order or does it need to change in any way to adapt to new challenges? Well, like I said, I mean, it, you know, this is a call for everyone to s stand up for rules and order and to condemn those who violate it and to resist those who violate it. And we have a lot of allies in the, around the world. You know, we've been talking mostly about Asia and Europe who are prepared to do so. And uh, we can only do it collectively. The United States can't do it alone. Uh, but we need to call out those countries that are tempted to violate it. If they get away with it, and that's one reason this Russia's invasion of Ukraine is so important. It's first and foremost important for the lives of the Ukrainian people and then obviously all of the other instability that flows from it. But it's even bigger than that, as huge as that is. It's even bigger than that because it's, there's a principle at stake. Big countries can't swallow up smaller countries or forget big and small. Countries can't just decide that because they want to, they're going to take territory from a neighbor. If we allow that to happen in Ukraine, then where else might it happen? Uh, and that's the whole idea of, of rules. Taiwan or... That's one example. Uh, if you send a message and, and by standing up to it, we, we, when I said, to response to your question, Kasia, what can we do? I, and I said we need to speak out and resist it. If you make a country pay a price for doing that, you're sending a message to others around the world that there's a price to be paid. And other countries that might be tempted to use force to violate international rules and norms or take territory have now seen that for Russia, this has not led to the territorial acquisition that they wanted, but a devastation of the Russian economy, uh, uh, the loss of many Russian lives, uh, m many of whom were probably uh, you know, Russians who were forced to take part of this because of their leader's uh, orders, and, and a failure to acquire the territory that they're trying to take. If we can succeed in doing that and make Russia pay a price for that, then I think others will think twice before they go on uh, such ill-advised attempts to undermine the rules-based order. Thank you, sir, very much for this uh, conversation. Uh, we had the pleasure to listen to Mr. Philip Gordon, National Security Advisor to the Vice President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Again, I'm Terry Martin, if you're just joining us. Uh, I didn't mention, I didn't say hello to the people following this online. Uh, a hello to you too. I'm really glad that everyone can join us here in Warsaw, but I know that a lot more people can't be here and are tuning in uh, online. So thanks and welcome to everyone. So we've now been briefed on US policy priorities, uh, which fortunately still include Europe despite a pivot to Asia. Uh, but what about Europe's priorities? Uh, how will the European Union respond to challenges on the horizon? How, how, does, how does it define those challenges? And how resilient will Europe be in facing those challenges? Those are questions we're going to be exploring during our next panel. Now, before I introduce our guests, I want to bring in a slide here at this point. I've since found out that the 
the statistics that we're looking at here were collected in May and June, a transatlantic poll conducted by the German Marshall Fund of the United States and the Bertelsmann, Bertelsmann Foundation of North America. And what we have here is a clear indication of how important the European Union is seen as a security provider for those living in EU member states. Again, this is focusing on EU member states. There's a lot more to this transatlantic trends poll that was conducted. If you want to look it up, you can find it online, transatlantic trends uh, from the German Marshall Fund and the Bertelsmann Foundation. But this is a significant number. 81% see the European Union as an important provider of security. Well, that's interesting given that the European Union doesn't really have its own clearly defined security and defense identity. Perhaps we'll be hearing more about that in just a moment. So without further ado, allow me to introduce our guests for this ministerial panel discussion. From Ukraine, we have with us Ola Stefanishnya, Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro-Atlantic Integration. Let's see if we can get our, our guests on the stage. Listening? Okay. Um, there's going to be a, a slight delay, I'm told, uh, with Olha's arrival on the stage. So perhaps we can uh, continue with our other panelists. We have three ministers. And again, it's a great honor to have with us people at this, of this stature to talk about the topics we're exploring at this conference. Uh, from Poland, Konrad uh, Szymanski, the Minister for European Union Affairs. Can I ask Konrad to come say, there we are, great. And from Greece, Nikos Dendias, the Foreign Minister of Greece. I'm just going to, yeah, exactly. And I can see all of you very well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, do you all have microphones? You're good, yeah. So we're hoping that Ola Stefan uh, Isnia will join us very soon. Uh, I'm told she, okay, she will be coming. Okay, I'm glad to hear that. I'm, this is uh, new information to me. But listen, we uh, are in a good position to have our discussion, get our discussion going right now. So we have here with us two ministers in governments, serving in governments, dealing with foreign affairs, European affairs in the European Union from two geographically very different parts of the European Union. The European Union, of course, made up of 27 member states, each, each member state still being responsible for its own foreign policy, uh, but trying to coordinate that with the others. And we sometimes run into difficulties in that, but it's the European Union, and we try to work that out, right? So let me begin by asking you this. Right now, we have Europe that is obviously facing massive challenges with the war in Ukraine, uh, existential challenges in that sense, energy security and inflation. Those three things, Russian aggression, energy security, and inflation. Those are three monumental, indeed existential challenges to some degree facing Europe. But looking ahead, do you expect those to be the same challenges facing the EU down the road? Or what challenges do you see on the horizon that, you're, that keeps, you, keeps you awake at night? I'll start with you, yeah. I think since the COVID uh, pandemic experience, we know that uh, security is something wider than, than just the security itself. It, we experience a lot of insecurity uh, coming from the um, interruption of the supply chain, uh, food security, and p in the end, political instability in the Union. I think the Union as a whole is an unprecedented organization, of course, but still dependent on political stability and capitals. So when you see the cumulative effects of all things you mentioned, um, possible effect. Uh, let's, let's meet after winter, we will check. Um, we can be quite concerned um, about this uh, fragility of the European Union, 
coming from the political instability, accumulated because of uh, different things. Of course, for the moment, the, the crucial aspect, the core reason for instability is war. But we have some uh, direct and indirect consequences of the war, and we have to tackle with all of them. And of course, union is a very important uh, context of our efforts because coordinated, orchestrated efforts will be much more effective. Uh, and in the end, we have to secure the integrity of the single market, which is a profound factor for economic stability of the continent. Uh, but in many aspects, uh, we need also a very uh, active role of the member states. And again, we experienced it uh, during the COVID pandemic. European Union has no uh, exclusive, good afternoon, um, has no in, uh, exclusive competences on, on, on health, but uh, it could create it with the trade, for example, um, competences, could create a, a wider context for an effective delivery of security, in that, that sense, uh, health security for the citizens. In war situation, it, it's the same. We have uh, shared competences, uh, shared burden to, to be uh, delivered to our people in our own interest because without political stability and capitals, the whole process will be, uh, will be endangered. Political stability, uh, if I've understood what you just said correctly, that is for you your chief concern aside from the things or related also to the things that we mentioned already. Political stability. Um, we'll pick up on that in, in just a moment. Uh, with the Greek foreign minister. But first, I want to introduce Olha and welcome you to the panel. It's a great pleasure to have, have Olha uh, Stepanishina, okay. <laughs> Deputy Prime Minister for European and Euro Atlantic Integration. So great having you with us. Thank you for, for, for being with us. I know that uh, it's not an easy time. Appreciate your time. Uh, I'm just going to pass this straight on to Nikos Dendias. Um, Olha, we're just discussing challenges facing Europe and what challenges we see on the horizon, uh, whether the Russian aggression in Ukraine and in Europe in general, the energy security crisis that Europe is facing, the inflation crisis that Europe is facing, uh, are going to continue dominating Europe's concerns moving forward, or do you see other things on the horizon? But I'm going to first uh, just bring in Nikos Dendios here for your response. Political stability, do you think that's a, a major issue? What do you see as the main challenges moving forward? Well, you already mentioned through enormous challenges for Europe, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Let us be frank, nobody that I know was expecting that he will see a war in Europe in our lifetime, and yet we see this happening under a brutal aggression of one country against another country. We are facing the total disruption of the basic energy provision scenario on which Europe was living up to now, maybe naively so, but nobody had foreseen that we should stop getting energy from Russia. And also we see the reappearance of something that we have forgotten. If you go to, to a bank now and you see a rather young banker, let's say 45, 46, 47, which is not that young. And we will ask him on advice on inflation. He cannot answer because he has never seen inflation in his lifetime. So all these together, of course, threaten the European experiment, the European project. Can we address these challenges? Of course we can address these challenges. And I have to say the unity, the unity of Europe against the Russian aggression of Ukraine is a very optimistic signal that this project, which in my humble opinion is a young project, I'm always saying that the, Euro the European project is like ne neo, uh, the monotheistic religions with the exception of Islam. They need three, 400 years to take root. So Europe is young, yet being young, it stays united against the Russian aggression of Ukraine. Now, if you ask me what could wake me up at night, like a nightmare, I'm not speaking about the particular Greek agenda because, you know, every night before I go to sleep, I take a look at the Turkish overflights of Greek islands every day. So let's put that in the parenthesis. This is the dissolution of Europe, not just instability. Because instability, I can understand it, but it's something that be addressed. But if in our lifetime, 
the European project does not go any forward, if we see a Brexit in a larger scale, that would be a total historic calamity. As long as Europe stands united and strong, I'm optimistic for the future. Okay, those are two perspectives from ministers serving in the governments of two important European Union member states. All countries in the European Union, of course, are important, but your two countries are significant, and they're representing uh, different parts of the European Union geographically with different areas. But you both agree that political st stability, and indeed to the point of possible dissolution of the European Union, is, is a concern for you. Olha, Stefanischnia. Stefan Nishina, um, forgive me, I'm working on it. Um, you, are, you represent a country that wants to be in the European Union, a country that is currently suffering unspeakable aggressions from Russia and trying to defend its very identity, trying to maintain its sovereignty to the degree it can. When you look at the European Union, who you've an institution that you've applied to join, what do you see as the main issues for the European Union, the problems that it could face with you in it or without you in it, uh, moving forward? Well, thank you so much. Uh, I can share some of the logic we use as uh, leaders in Ukraine um, facing various challenges, including the full-scale war. Whenever we're in a front line of taking any of the decision, we choose the outcome, which definitely gives a positive answer to the question, will that solution make us stronger? Whatever we do should make us stronger. And that is equally applicable to each and every situation or a crisis uh, that is taking place now on Ukrainian soil, worldwide, Europe-wide. So I would just give the example of energy crisis taking place now throughout the Europe and particularly tackled by uh, EU countries. This is an unprecedented challenge. But what will make EU stronger? EU will overcome this winter by having the unity on the restrictions, at the same time minimizing the effect to average household in every EU country. And whatever actions are needed to become stronger after this crisis, they should be taken. Uh, it's equally important to, to listen back the messages which were delivered the years before on the Nord Stream 2 as a project of geopolitical influence, which is, in fact, formally enshrined in the defense doctrine of the Russian Federation is public. So it says, and I'm quoting, that gas and energy resources should remain a major element of geopolitical influence of the Russian Federation. And it has been long before the war started. It's been long uh, before um, the, the, the eyes has been opened to the Russian blackmail. So the full EU sovereignty from our, uh, Russian energy dependence will make EU stronger. And whatever leads all of us to this goal, will make us stronger together. That would cause enormous suffering and that equally important to preserve the political stability in that regard. Because uh, the more determined politicians to make Europe stronger, the more determined politicians to put a price for Russian Federation higher, the more they are subjected to political pressure within their countries. And we, see, we saw this cascade of resignations of the prime minister in, a, in a various EU countries. So uh, unity, mutual support and understanding that gaining the full energy sovereignty within European Union from the Russian energy resources will make us stronger. And whatever leads us to this goal, any action should be taken. Thank you. Uh, I just want to remind our audience that we will have some time for questions from you uh, at the end of this session. I want to give it, uh, try to save 15 minutes for questions. So if you are thinking, mm, I, but what about this? Uh, maybe just hold that thought and, and I'll try to get back to you uh, towards the end of the session. Ukraine's EU membership, it's, 
it's an issue that's been discussed at length within the European Union, also within Ukraine, I'm sure, as well. Uh, talk to us about prospects for that actually happening. What, how do you see the prospects for that happening? Let's start with you, Olha. Thank you. I was wondering who would be the one to start, uh, I mean, the discussion. Well, uh, the very interesting events are upcoming tomorrow and day after tomorrow. This is the first meeting of the European political community and then informal um, uh, EU Council meeting. Indeed, um, I think that the logic I've shared by answering the previous question has been traced by providing Ukraine with a candidate status to the membership of EU. By the end of the day, there's been a lot of hesitation among many member states, but everybody understood and there was a consensus that this decision will make EU stronger, which will bring European Union back to the subjectiveness arena. And in fact, it really unblocked a lot of issues uh, related to other enlargement processes. So. Um, we understand that it's not a one-day process, but we fully support the idea of the French president on European political community because uh, we are now in a situation where we are like around 80% aligned with the EU market and EU regulations. And whenever European Union, and now I'm talking as if we're in a time of peace, right, um, proposes the new era of priorities or policies. Ukraine should be part of preparing these policies because by the end of the day, we consume them, we implement that and uh, implement them and we have no other option because we are part of the same continent and, and basically part of the same market. So for us, throughout the process, it's important to be on the table of the discussion. But uh, uh, our application for membership in European Union on the fourth day of war was basically a part of our reflection of our national aspiration and investment into European project as it is. And we are glad that we were supported. Gentlemen, I, I, I want to ask you to respond to something that Olha just said uh, about Ukraine making the European Union stronger, that Ukraine could make the European Union stronger. Now, that's, a, that's a, an argument that resonates with, with some and perhaps others not, because the European, there are several countries waiting to join the European Union. Some of them have been waiting for a long time. Uh, and within the European Union, you talked about political stability and the concern about the dissolution. There's some who believe that the enlargement fatigue has set in in the European Union and that the European Union cannot afford to enlarge. Uh, I would just like to get your responses to those ideas, ministers. Starting with you. I think Europe uh, cannot uh, uh, afford to stop uh, enlargement. Uh, Europe can, cannot accept uh, no enlargement in the nearest uh, future. This is the problem we face. I, I think the enlargement, in case of Ukraine, it's the most geostrategic uh, decision about uh, candidate status uh, ever. Uh, it's the only way to make Europe more relevant in global scale. Uh, at the moment, we have some reasons to, to, to be satisfied with the role EU can play in this in this uh, tragic war. We can accumulate a lot of political power, economic power to, to be relevant in this situation. It couldn't happen uh, without the scale. The scale of this organization is a basic factor for the general relevance in the international affairs. We can face uh, enormous challenges in the nearest uh, future and all of them will be of global scale. So if Europe won't want to be uh, relevant, uh, we, we need uh, enlargement. And of course, it means that it is not only the interest of Ukraine, it is also in the, in the best interest of, uh, of Europe. We advocated uh, the enlargement revival uh, for years. It's a pity we had to wait uh, till the tragic war to, to get a very reasonable answer, but the answer is, is, is good. The determination of the Central Europe, together with uh, very constructive action presented by the European Commission. I, ha I have to, to stress it because without the AVI, the project, I think it would be not very easy to, to, to adopt this decision. Uh, we have uh, enormous progress and I think we should go this way in a dynamic uh, pace because it mm. is in our vital interest. We mm. see what is happening around us. There, there is a strategic competition with competitive of, or openly hostile countries. 
And to, uh, it is, of course, it will be done at the expense of our security and our welfare. So I think Europe has no choice. We have to expand to show the world that Europe is relevant. Because, Dendias, you've expressed concern about the danger of Europe coming apart, that the, the political instability could go to that degree. Right now, when it comes to foreign policy decisions in the European Union, there's the principle of unanimity on most of those decisions. There's not qualified majority voting, uh, which is an issue that's being hotly debated. We don't need to go into the technical details on that, but if you're going to be a foreign policy, an entity, a political entity with foreign policy weight, you have to be, uh, have a, have a, have a decision-making capacity. Do you believe that Ukraine joining the European Union would increase the stability of the European Union? Would it make it stronger? Well, we Greece, but myself personally, were strong advocates of enlargement. I totally share what my colleague has said. You know, this is the old simplistic approach, the European project like a bicycle that moves forward or it falls, but I will not go to that. It is clear that we cannot allow black holes in our continent. And it's clear that the European countries are entitled to become members of the European Union. Of course, under the set conditionality, that goes without saying. But it's what we'll be looking forward to and what we should help those countries to achieve. And you were right to state that exactly before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, there was an enlargement fatigue in Europe discussions, let's wait, etc., etc., etc. We cannot afford that. We cannot afford to wait. And what we should do, and on that President Macron's uh, proposal is instrumental, we have to help those countries, Ukraine included, to become members of the European Union the soonest. And let me give another example. The Balkans, the Western Balkans. It's very small countries. GDP negligible towards the European GDP. Yet again, if let alone, a huge source of potential trouble. Take Bosnia-Herzegovina. Bosnia-Herzegovina could become a powder keg in the very center of Europe. And yet again, we do not address it. We, we forget about it. So, cut a long story short, we should help those countries to become members of our family. I'm not saying the union, I'm using the word family the soonest. I think this is the way forward. There's been a lot of talk in the past few years uh, much of it put forward by, by the French um, since Macron became president there, uh, concerning the notion of strategic autonomy or strategic sovereignty with it for Europe, how to achieve that. Now, I don't want to go into those terms. Got, that's not going to take us very far. I want to put the question a different way. I want to ask you what to reflect on the idea of what it would take to improve Europe's capacity to deal with major challenges on the horizon moving forward. What needs to happen? We've heard enlargement, maintaining political unity. What else would you say would make Europe a stronger force to be taken seriously in the world and be able to deal with the challenges moving forward, also if they are of a defense nature, of a security nature? Because people, obviously, within the European Union are looking to the European Union, the member states, to provide that security. What, what would it take? What does it need? What does Europe need to be stronger moving forward? Or maybe from an outside perspective, a country that is wanting to join the European Union, also wanting to join NATO. We can talk about that too, but we're focusing on, on Europe. When you look at Europe, how is Europe going to strengthen itself? I mean, you, Ukraine joining might make it stronger. That's your, what you were saying. What else? What does Europe need that it doesn't have right now to make it a more viable entity moving forward? Well, um, we, should, we should be frank to each other. Uh, after the 24th of February, uh, we started the new era of, of, the, of forming the new global order. And in this field, there are like a lot of players. There's like UN, there's NATO, then there's European Union, there's like individual leaders. Uh, but we should be frank in confirming that none of these conventional institutions or instruments has prevented us from this full-scale war and invasion to Ukraine, which caused a multiple military instability around the, con the continent, economic instability, breaking into um, uh, various 
multiplicating various crises. And uh, uh, I think uh, it's very important to recognize that and to think that we all, as Ukrainians, made our investment, we invest in the European project. So far, we believe this is the only instrument of preserving unity, sovereignty and security by economic integration, by political integration. And this has been a very strategic decision on our side. But a part of commitment, a part of belief, it also requires action to preserve. And I want to quote the recent address of a president and prime minister and a speaker of Ukrainian parliament to North Atlantic Treaty Organization. We made an appeal towards active deterrence. We should think of active measures which could deter further aggression, which could build our resilience and to make sure that we are not only trying to punish such players as Russian Federation or reflect to the multiple crises affected by them, but we do the effective measures to safeguard ourselves, to safeguard our values, to safeguard our economies, and we should start talking about uncomfortable things, thinking okay. beyond the boxes. We have been doing it for many times already. We have made an application to EU membership and it came up out of nowhere that something which seemed impossible on 28th of February become possible on 23rd of June. And nothing has happened deadly. It has only made all of us stronger. The same decision has been taken to establish the Rammstein format. This seems absolutely impossible on 24th of February, so that more than 40 countries not binded by NATO, EU or any other form to coordinate ev efforts to provide Ukraine with the military support. On 23rd of February, we were only talking to asking Great Britain to provide us a little bit more stingers than they were doing the years before. And okay. now the situation is different. Okay, well, you mentioned the UK. The UK has left the European Union. We've, uh, to some degree, the European Union has already begun to dissolve, you could say. Uh, in order to be taken seriously on the world, in world affairs, Nikos Dendias, you've been working in the government for, for years in, in different ministerial posts. You know how Europe is seen in the world. What does Europe need to do to be taken seriously? Well, I, I hope we, we are being taken seriously, but we can do better. It is, let me again be an absolute frank, we need a defense arm. In our integration process, we need a defense arm. You know, the, a defense the, the present format, you say? No, arm. Arm, arm. defense arm. We need, Thank you. So for, let me take an example. Uh, in the south, Libya. Now, the European Union is trying to impose on an arms embargo on Libya. Libya is a failed state, as we speak, and also is a route for regular migration towards Europe, which, I'm opening parentheses, can destabilize Malta and Italy, closing the parentheses at least, and also to the south, the Sahel is a terrorist paradise. The European Union is trying to do the minimum, impose an embargo of transfer of arms, and is begging around to create a flotilla of two or three frigates. Greece has given one, uh, but we cannot find the other too easily. So, if we have decided in Europe, as von der Leyen has said, that we need to be a geopolitical player. We need a defense arm. Kornel Szymanski, how do you see it? Do you think that's going to happen? Poland has become a very important player, obviously, in the defense sector. In, in Brussels, we usually, in these situations, we, we go to our details of our institutional arrangements and we start talking about QMV in, in say, CFSP. I'm afraid it is, uh, it's a blind alley because there is no alternative, even in the EU, unprecedented organization, there is no alternative to political will. And to make the political will uniform, orchestrated to the degree which will be better than even today, we simply need better understanding of our own role as a Europe in global order and our role and our part in wider context of the West. 
And this war, I think, proves it very, very clearly that there was no alternative to the West as a concept. You can call it differently if, if anybody would be not happy with this Cold War language. Uh, we can find another. But the concept of the wider coordination across the, the, the Western countries is the key for our relevance in, in situations like this. We accepted uh, very smoothly, very quickly, unprecedented uh, financial section freezing uh, a lot of Russian money in, in Europe and elsewhere. We could do it because we could coordinate this with other monetary uh, areas, like pound, indeed, UK left U EU, but they don't want to left Europe, definitely, right. and it's good news in this gloomy context. We couldn't do it effectively without coordination with the US dollar. And then, with this coordination, we did something significant. And we have to repeat this um, format, this, uh, this um, pattern, in, in any other situation. There is no alternative to political will. No alternative to political will. Uh, I think everyone would subscribe to that. Um, I would like to open the floor to questions. Uh, if there, if we have audience members with questions. I see one hand up here already. Uh, I see another one back there. That's great. Let's collect a couple of questions. We have someone walking around with a microphone. The lady in the third row, I believe. Let's start there, and then we'll go to the gentleman in the back. Hello, everyone. Please identify yourself and, and address your question. Thank you very much for that uh, kind of important discussion. Uh, I am Yana Vanessian from Armenia, alumna of European Academy of Diplomacy. Today, earlier in the morning, a uh, member of uh, Ukrainian Verkhovna Rada, Ustinova, fairly mentioned that in 2014 they were asking and urging Europe to help them to, um, like to escape and to fight against Russia invasion, but Europe's response was not uh, conformant, uh, and today we see the uh, consequences of that silence. Uh, but I want to mention that... Um, so we're looking for a question, in, if yes, you could perhaps... Uh, the inv invasion of Russia to Ukraine encouraged another Eastern European country, Azerbaijan, to invade its neighbor, Republic of Armenia. But EU don't have any actions against Azerbaijan and even today Mr. Borrell mentioned that they don't go to any sanctions against Azerbaijan. Don't okay. you think that... I'm going to have to stop you there <laughs> yeah. if, unless you have a question. Yeah, and don't you think that one day, uh, the, uh, as today Ukraine is uh, surviving, the same will be with Armenia and uh, it will be a little bit later. Thank okay, you. thank you. So, your question regarding Armenia. I'm sure that uh, Nikos Dendias might have a comment on, on Armenia. But before we get to the, uh, the responses, I want to bring in another question that I saw on the back. Uh, someone had raised a piece of paper, I think, so I could see past the camera. Could you uh, please, if you're still with us, uh, raise, your, raise your hand again and we will uh, give you a microphone. But I don't see a hand back there anymore. Any other questions? There's a gentleman at the back right there. Great microphone coming your way. Hello, uh, my name is Iverson from Hong Kong. I'm a columnist at the Estonian newspaper Postimest. We talk about European unity, so I have a question regarding European unity when it comes to China. Recently, um, shortly following um, the uh, Pelosi's uh, Taiwan visit, um, two EU member states, namely Latvia and Estonia, left the so-called um, N plus one Central Eastern European uh, format with China. And a year ago, Lithuania did the same. So my question to the panel is, in particular regarding um, Poland and, and Greece. Um, when will these member states quit the format because we talk about EU 27, not EU 14 or 15, 16 or 17? So if there's no timetable, can you suggest why um, Poland and Greece are not quitting the format and allowing the EU 27 to exercise its unity against China? Thank you. Okay, a very specific question tied to a, a, a grouping, but perhaps we can have a response that uh, embraces the European Union's position on, on China in general. So, uh, if there's not another question at this point, uh, we do have one. Gentleman in the second row, uh, if we could bring him a microphone and then we'll, we'll get responses. Uh, Jacek Kaczewski, uh, I would like to ask a few days ago, Ex-Chancellor Merkel suggested that in the end uh, the security architecture 
in Europe would have to include uh, Russia. Any comments on that? Thank you. So, uh, let's begin. Who would like to, to address? We'll, um, we'll start here. Uh, I, will, I will start with comments on comments made by, uh, by the Chancellor Merkel. I, I think Europe uh, offered Russia in 2004-2005 a privileged partnership as a, a, let's say, initial invitation to be a rational partner for the continent. We in Poland, in many other countries in Central Europe, we're not very happy with this because we see the unproportional uh, attention to, to Moscow comparing with, uh, for example, Kiev. Uh, and we are rather skeptical about this, but, but it happened. And it was uh, bluntly refused. So, so I, I think it is a historical uh, comment. Uh, I think the whole logic of the mutual interdependence which governed uh, Berlin for years uh, is intellectually very attractive, uh, I, I have to say. It would be very nice if it would work, but it couldn't work because in this sort of interdependence theory, you need a partner who share your rationality. Not necessarily values, maybe it's too much, but at least rationality about the international relations. And Russia never been uh, a credible partner in this sense. And that's why uh, um, we, we, we made such a enormous, as a union and some member states, enormous mistake because we missed the point with the rationality of Russia. We in Warsaw, we never been uh, um, mesmerized with, with this uh, logic. But in the end, some national decision made by some uh, capitals restricted, limited, and the um, strategic um, uh, power of the Union in time of war, and we should remember about it. Okay, so th um, this was kind of a, almost a backward-looking question. I mean, Chancellor Merkel is no longer Chancellor of, of Germany, she's ex-Chancellor, but the whole question of where Russia is going to fit in t into Europe's future uh, configuration in, in security terms is something that's going to uh, be explored <laughs> moving forward, I'm sure. Um, what about, so we've got Armenia and China also as topics. Uh, well, uh, the China uh, question, the way it was put, at least China per se is a big challenge for, for the Western world, that is obvious. Uh, it's a competitor, it's a challenge, it's an antagonist, it, it, it's all around it, and a huge discussion is taking place after we left the naive, the naive assumption of the previous decade that China, by becoming more affluent, will become more democratic and closer to us. It's clear that that is not there. Now, we are watching very carefully the next Congress of the Chinese Communist Party, which starts uh, on the 15th or 16th of October, but as far as this uh, mechanism uh, uh, is concerned, I don't remember any European decision to leave this mechanism. So. Uh, that is, I would say, rather a side issue. Now, on the issue of Armenia, I, I was in Yerevan just two, three days ago. And I have to say, I made, as far as my country is concerned, I made a clear statement. But also, I, I saw France and the United States making clear statements as well on the uh, incidents of the uh, Azeri aggression against Armenia proper the last few days. It's clear that the South Caucasus is a, is, a, is a huge, a huge challenge. And Armenia is a country that is facing a big problem. Uh, the European Union should and would try to help Armenia as much as possible. I find it interesting regarding China that when I asked the three of you about challenges on the horizon, China was not mentioned uh, as a challenge on the horizon for the European Union. Of course, for the United States, this is one of the main foreign policy priorities. Now, I know that Ukraine is not a member of the European Union, so talking about foreign policy from, from the European Union's perspective towards these countries that were mentioned may not really be uh, something you want to comment on. You're welcome to comment on it, of course, but I would put a, another question to you myself that I'm curious about, and it regards something that was mentioned yesterday, and it concerns the viability of Ukraine moving forward. Let's assume that Ukraine is victorious. We all wish that the case here, that it will push Russia back and Ukraine's territorial integrity will be restored. Then what? There's already talk of reconstruction, but what we heard yesterday from the German Marshall Fund uh, president was that 
there can be no stability without security. So the question, my question would be, what do you think is needed first? Membership in the European Union or in NATO? And which do you think will come first? What, is your, your first your expect, what are your expectations? What do you see as the obstacles concerning that? Thank you. I have a totally different answer to this question, and it's very closely aligned with what has been um, raised as a quotation of former Chancellor Angela Angela Merkel. Uh, her statement sounds to me like every complicated task has a million of falseful but very easy decisions. It's not that easy. Russia has already been part of the security architecture we seem to be living in. Uh, and we have to learn our lessons first. Secondly, the timing and the conditions under which Russia should be subjected to a discussion on the new security conditions in Europe. And there is like a minimum which shall be the precondition for any discussions with Russia. First is what you've said, regaining and deoccupation of the territory of Ukraine, at least to the borders of 23rd of February, then making sure that Russian Federation is paying by justice and financially paying the reparations to Ukraine and all the nations which has f suffered physically and financially from this war. This is a strong as deterrent for the Russian people to know that there comes a physical price for the decision, for the unilateral decision of a leader. And that is essential so that the, every Russian mother, every Russian soldier, every Russian citizen knows that their, them, their children and their grandchildren will be paying for the crimes committed on their soil. And of course, justice to the Russian Federation, to the Kremlin. And this is the minimal set of things we should be for the preconditions for sitting, I'm not talking about Ukraine and Russia, for the whole world to sit back and seek for the discussion with the Russian Federation. And for Ukraine, of course, the victory, the larger discourse could be based on the reconstruction, which is uh, the baseline for which is the EU membership, Ukraine membership in European Union and making Ukraine stronger, but also becoming the member state of NATO which is so obvious and will be very much obvious when Ukraine is back to the borders of its territory and uh, security guarantees we are now advocating for are in place, which will allow us not to get the military support to defend ourselves, but to make sure that we are secured even when the war is over to prevent another one. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a warm round of applause for all three ministers. Thank you so much. Thank you for being with us. Uh, don't go away. There's much more to come in this room. In fact, what we were just discussing is what the topic of the next panel is going to be. I'll be back in just a moment to introduce that. Stay with us if you can. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello again. I wasn't gone very long. I'm glad to see that many of you are still here. I know that the, there's, an, after something that heady, something that intense that we just, dis, that the discussion we just had, it's, uh, it's important to first reflect. But we're going to take this discussion 
to another level. Because we have a high-level conversation coming up right now in this room exploring the implications of Russia's war in Ukraine and what it means for the EU's internal security. It's my great pleasure to introduce a man, a journalist, a fellow journalist whose work I read regularly in Berlin, uh, Christoph von Marschall, the chief diplomatic correspondent of the German daily newspaper, Der Tagesspiegel. Yeah, it's my great pleasure to welcome here Ilva Johansson on the stage, the European Commissioner for Home Affairs. And what we will do now, we try to think ahead a little bit. Uh, of course, um, the war, the impact of the war is mainly on the citizens of Ukraine. And the citizens of the European Union are not the target of immediate fighting, but they feel the secondary consequences like energy prices, like um, inflation, the national conversation generally has changed. And now we would like to take a bit a broader perspective and assess the short and long-term threats and how the EU can respond to it. And we would start just to make a list. Uh, Commissioner, what is mainly on your mind when you are thinking about the threats and consequences for home security inside the European Union? Well, we have to recognize that the big threat is Putin. This is the biggest threat towards us. Of course, now he's invading Ukraine. He wants to destroy Ukraine totally. He wants to destroy the Ukrainians, but he is also destroying the international global order. And he wants to destroy the European Union. We should not be naive. This is actually his, his goal. So this is the biggest threat. And that means that the, what the most important thing that we need to do in the European Union is to make sure that he will not win. So we have to stay united. And we have to be very strong. And we have to make sure that, this, that he will not win because that will really be the big threat towards us. So this is the overall thing, and that means that we have to deal with his using energy as a weapon. He's trying to divide us. He's trying to put a false narrative and propaganda on what, this, what causes these high energy prices. So this is, this is the biggest thing. But then, of course, we also have to deal with other things like we have more than 4 million Ukrainian refugees. They are not a threat towards the internal security, but of course it's a challenge to deal with this. We have to deal with the infrastructure, the critical infrastructure, and I think we all think about it right now after the attacks on the North Stream pipelines. We need to have, be much more resilient, be much more aware of the huge risk that the critical infrastructure is posing uh, on us, and we need to do more. And that was also clear from the speech from by President von der Leyen today in Parliament. We need to uh, recognize that a war is, of course, a catastrophe for citizens, but it's an opportunity for criminals. We will see organized criminal groups using this opportunity, trafficking weapons, trafficking people, trying to lure uh, women and children, refugees, into trafficking, using them for sexual purposes or other purposes. They will try to traffic drugs. This, of course, we have to stay very vigilant on, on, on this topic. And uh, the last thing I would say is that uh, it's, this is really an area where we need also to better protect our external borders. And this is, of course, an, uh, something that we are already doing, but staying vigilant on how to protect our external borders is also important. So we have a list of these things like critical infrastructure, like... Um new opportunities for organized crime, human trafficking, firearms and drugs. So what can the EU do about it? Because often it's, it's a mixed responsibility. It's not everything in the field of the European Union or the Commission. Sometimes you need uh, to cooperate with member states. Then it's a question, for example, uh, the critical infrastructure, is that more a military challenge or is it a civil challenge? So let, let's go through those points. Let's start with the critical infrastructure because it's uh, on all of our minds. Uh, we, we just have seen uh, how easily it can be attacked. And how do we, uh, how, what can we do to protect this critical infrastructure? 
we can do much more. And actually, the Commission proposed almost two years ago uh, a new legislation to protect our critical infrastructure in the European Union. And actually, just before the summer, uh, the co-legislators agreed on this new legislation that will now be implemented. And for example, what we put in the legislation is that member states are not only obliged, today they are obliged to take into account two uh, different areas, uh, transport hubs and energy sector. Now we are broadening the scope to 11 sectors, like fresh water, food supply, a lot of other areas, cyber security and also the steps that member states need to take. Why is this important on the European level? It's because that many of those critical entities are not only critical for one member state. They, if they are being destroyed, they have devastating consequences for many member states. And also that's why it's also important to make sure that we can restore as quick as possible. So we have a new legislation in place and that member states and parliament has been very happy to adopt actually. So they see the, the use, uh, uh, the need for a European approach here. So we have a lot of social and economic pressure because people are economically more vulnerable and you said that is an opportunity for organized crime. So how can we counter that? Of course, the easiest would say, well, uh, just uh, let's make sure that no household has less money than, than before. Of course, that's not feasible. So what are the options to counter this kind of threat? Yeah, we, you need to, to see that it's the organized criminal groups that are really using this. And the organized criminal groups, they are more and more professional. They are more and more international, and they are more and more violent. We see now that they are organized more or less like uh, international, multi multinational business companies. And that's uh, why we need more of in police cooperation. So each member state, the police is doing a great job, but they can only see part of it because most of those have links to other member states. And that's why the police cooperation is at the core. And that's why Europol is at the core. So we have recently now have a new mandate for Europol with bigger uh, uh, possibilities. But also, for example, to develop artificial intelligence to deal with information. Like, for example, you probably know about the Enkrushat case, the Sky ECC, the ANOM, where we had a lot of information on how these organized criminal groups works. But all these messages cannot be read by a policeman, a policewoman. It has to be dealt with by artificial intelligence. It has to be dealt with together. We also know from this information that they very often target, they're using corruption. 60% of the organized criminal groups think that corruption is the best way to reach their target uh, uh, and, their, and their goals. And that means also that how we're building the resilience towards anti-corruption is really part of fighting the organized crime. But the short answer to your uh, question is better police cooperation, quicker channels for the exchange of information and a, a stronger role for Europol. You made a very interesting remark about refugees. Of course, the war costs a lot, uh, millions of refugees, and especially in this country, Poland. Poland has uh, taken in uh, a lot uh, of uh, refugees from Ukraine. But then you said, you know, that's not a threat. That is a challenge. And mm -hmm. of course, we understand what you are saying, but we have had conflicts before where we would have said, no, wait a minute, uh, refugees can be a threat when we had this uh, ref mass of refugees uh, from wars like in Iraq and Syria, of course there was this concern that it might also be an opportunity to smuggle in people who will be a threat for internal security. Has that changed? Is the structure of the war in Ukraine and the refugees which are coming so different from uh, the uh, refugees which were coming from Iraq, from Syria and so on? No, but we are much better prepared. I think this is important to see. The European Union is much better prepared to deal with a big refugee crisis. We are now facing the biggest refugee crisis since the Second World War. And of course it's a challenge, but actually we are managing. And of course some member states are taking bigger responsibilities than others. The country with the highest number of refugee, Ukrainian refugees per capita is the Czech Republic. Second is Poland. Third is Lithuania. Uh, so these are our countries that really are taking a, a big, but we are dealing with this. And on this security uh, thing, from the day one, 
we really reached out to the member states at the borders to make sure that they do the security check, even though it's difficult when so many people come, but they did. They did a security check on everybody entering into the European Union, and we sent support from Frontex, from Europol, to help with the second line and the third line of security checks. And yes, we found some people that try to use the opportunity to sneak into the European Union that are dangerous or potentially dangerous. But we, the borders worked, actually, in this. The welcoming was huge and, and heartwarming, but the security checks were also there, and they, they worked. So, of course, I have to ask, when you're talking about refugees, and it's a normal complaint that the EU member states haven't come to an agreement how to distribute um, refugees uh, between them. Is that, um, how do I say that? Is that more an artificial complaint or has it practical consequences when you said, you know, it works. Countries are taking in these refugees. It's not that they are refugees which uh, they are not taken care of. So does it have to be the European Union? Do we need this agreement? Or can we say, if something is working, don't complain too much about um, the parts which could be better but um, are not really an obstacle? Both yes and no. You know, when I was appointed commissioner, it's almost three years ago, and my the main topic that I was given by Ursula von der Leyen was you have to unblock the blocked situation on migration. And that has been my main topic. Because migration is something normal. Mi migration will always happen. Yeah? And our task is to manage migration in an orderly way, and we do that better together, and we do it also better together with, with uh, third countries. And we have, I've been working on this. And I mean, we are in a much better situation now. So now I have presented a new pact on migration and asylum, and it's being adopted step by step. And member states have a very constructive approach, and parliament as well. And I think that was, uh, we are dealing with, I should say, we're dealing with migration in a, in a normal way. It's, uh, if I can put it like, my aim was to make migration a, a normal, boring EU topic, <laughs> to say that, that we should, I mean, member states have different opinions in many aspects, not only on migration, but most of the things we are dealing with in the European Union. And then, you know, we, we deal with it, commission make proposal, member states make amendments and they make compromises and parliament make compromises and then we find an agreement that is maybe not perfect, but quite good. Yeah? And that's how we now are dealing with migration as well. So we are making, taking, adopting, adopting part, part step by step, and that is going well. They make no headlines because we are actually <laughs> adopting it. So it's not like, you know, the big, uh, the big conflict. And I think that was, it's a long answer, but I think that was the reason behind that it was possible this time to activate the Temporary Protection Directive. In my view, that should have been activated in the migration crisis in 2015, but the political situation was not there. This time, we had worked very hard to find a better understanding between member states, a better, uh, if not, not a consensus, but a, a better understanding on different uh, views and different realities. And when I proposed to activate this directive for the first time ever in the Union, we had a unanimous decision. One week after the war started, I think this was great, and this was really showing that we can deal also with very difficult issues together. And when we do that, we can be real proud of each other, and then we can manage things that, and challenges that are bigger than we thought we could mm -hmm. deal with. You were talking about migration, now we are talking about refugees, and of course uh, the world would be much easier if it would be such a black and white thing. This is one thing, that's the other thing, and of course it is mixed, and it can also develop uh, over uh, time. So it is quite clear at the beginning of the war, people are fleeing uh, the fighting in, in Ukraine, and they need, uh, of course, um, a place uh, they can go. But then comes the second chance, or this is, is, is a second uh, part of, of the whole game, and they will be needed needed in Ukraine to rebuild the country. So what are your thoughts about handing that? Uh, to, to which degree could we also say that, you know, there's a time when you need help and there's a time when the country, but all of Europe, needs some people to go back in order not cause a brain drain, which might be the obstacle for rebuilding those parts of the country which are not under war anymore? 
people are going back right now. Quite a number of the Ukrainian refugees are going back right now. I was in Kiev two months ago and I met with several of women that has been fleeing to the EU and now it was back in, in Ukraine, back in Kiev, rebuilding the country, going back to work, being part of the resilience, being part of the fight. So. A lot of people are going back to Ukraine right now. And I think it's important with our message, go back. If things get worse, you are welcome back to the EU uh, again. So this is actually happening right now. Then it's important to say that the temporary protection directive is a temporary protection. So it will last until March 2024. So it's not a, a, a forever protection. Uh, hopefully, we are at the, the war had ended and uh, Putin is defeated then. But if not, then we have to have other solutions because this solution has a, a, a limit in time. You mentioned one more a challenge, obstacle, however, and that is um, our borders, the external borders of the European Union. And again, it's a mixed responsibility. Uh, it is. Uh, in the responsibility of member states at the external, but it's, we have also Frontex, the agency, which is an EU agency. So you said that has improved enormously, but in the Mediterranean, for example, we still see uh, a lot of problems which are not um, managed uh, well or to a degree uh, satisfactory. So uh, what can be done to secure these borders, these external borders better? And is this mixed responsibility really an obstacle in practice? To which degree is it? What are your thoughts on that? No, it's not, uh, it's not a, an obstacle at all. We are now developing uh, the integrated border management, which management with, will be the, the most modern uh, border management in the world, actually. So we are rolling out the coming years uh, a really uh, a very much higher ambition when it comes to the digital uh, digitalization of our uh, protection of the external borders. We will have much more information on, on everybody that will enter into the European Union and Frontex is being building up and are working with more and more member states. So I really see a lot of progress in this area. But we also need to look at our uh, partner countries. So for example, a few weeks uh, after the war started, uh, the Moldovan Minister of Interior called me, Anna Revenko, and she said, help! I can't protect my borders. I don't have the people. Can you send Frontex here? Because that was how the criminals used uh, that border, because it was a weaker one than mm -hmm. towards the European Union. And then I said, oh no, F you know, negotiating an in uh, international agreement with Frontex takes usually one to two years in, you know, in negotiations. And before that, we are not allowed to send border guards to a third country. But I said, okay, let's try. We finalized the ag agreement and they negotiated in two weeks. And the same day as I signed the agreement, Frontex border guards were uh, actually coming to the borders. And they are doing a great job right now, helping uh, Moldova at their uh, external borders. So this is also important how we work uh, with um, weaker part, uh, so say, that is also outside uh, the European Union. We have just one minute left, but I would like to raise an issue you started with. Uh, the biggest danger or threat at all is Putin, him in itself. He is trying to undermine us. He is trying to undermine the cohesion. Uh, yeah. And he is using tools like pr uh, propaganda. So what is the best counter, uh, countering option for the European Union to counter this kind of propaganda that raises doubts in us whether this is our war to fight, whether we should suffer inflation-wise, energy, and, and so on and so on. So what is your advice in that direction? We have to fight this in, in many aspects, I must say. I was just having before this uh, conversation with Google, and I think that the tech companies are important here, what they can do to counter disinformation and propaganda, but also that we need to have a uh, we are democracies. That makes, of course, uh, that when people are uh, having another opinion than the government, that makes sense that it could, uh, could make the government lose, yeah? And that's how it should be. But that means also that uh, we have to have a, a, a very broad democratic debate and we have to speak out on the role of Putin. And I'm a little bit afraid that sometimes we are focusing 
too narrow on the problems that we are having, you know, and, and exactly close to, to me, like my high energy prices and, and other problems, the inflation. But we have to have a broader a view to see what, uh, what is causing this and what is the biggest threat what is the biggest threat towards the energy supplies in the long term? What is the biggest threat towards the internal security in the European Union in the long term? So we really need to see where the real threat, uh, where the real threat comes from, and we have to fight it together. So I think so far we have been much more united, much stronger than Putin thought that we should be. Uh, he we surprised him, mm -hmm. and we surprised ourselves a bit. And I think that we should continue to surprise ourselves to show because when we are united we can do so much more more than we think that we can do actually we can achieve so much more and this is really what's at stake right now that would be psychological resilience of yeah. the whole society please join me in thanking uh, the commissioner Ilva Johansson and I wish you. you a successful day thanks Thank you very much and a timely message for where we are right now that united we can create and achieve much more than we imagine that let's continue to surprise ourselves well we've got a couple of surprises coming up this afternoon um, I know I might have surprised you by moderating that one panel session you might have been expecting someone else I, uh, if you were using your paper program we don't update everything all the time but online on our app you should probably see what's uh, what's going on there quite well now our next session is on a topic that's getting a lot of traction at the Warsaw Security Forum, and that is designing Ukraine's recovery in the spirit of the Marshall Plan. And for that, we have with us a, a very special moderator. Thomas Kleine-Brockhoff is Vice President and Executive Director of the Berlin Office of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. The stage is yours. Good afternoon. Eventually, this war will end. And on the day after, we need a plan. A plan to reconstruct Ukraine and a plan to help Ukraine reconstruct. Now, some people say, why worry about this now? Aren't there other priorities? Isn't there a war to conduct and to win? Isn't there an ailing country to be kept afloat? To that I would say, yes, that is true. But remember, you can win a war and lose the peace. And remembering World War II, the post-war planning started in 1942. So reconstruction planning, in fact, has started in uh, July uh, in Lugano. The first international reconstruction conference took place. And Ukraine, in fact, presented its national recovery plan there. The problem was the Western donor countries did not present a plan. Three weeks from now, there is another such conference, an expert conference hosted by the German government and the European Commission in Berlin. And again, we're not at the point where such a comprehensive plan is to be expected from the Western donor country side. Now, there is one such plan, and it is this. It is not, I admit, a government plan. It is not an EU plan. It's just a think tank paper, but it is the first of its sort. It's the first comprehensive attempt to look at the challenges of reconstruction from a, from a donor country perspective. It's a framework to think about. Now, there are a number of thorny questions connected with uh, reconstruction and with helping Ukraine reconstruct. First, who should pay? How should we organize burden sharing? Who should lead? Which institutions to use or to build? When to start? During the war, after the war, regional differences? How best to enable investments? 
what to do with Russia's frozen assets, how to ensure accountability and avoid corruption in a country that has a history thereof, and how best to involve civil society. Now, the Berlin Conference in three weeks will focus on two of these questions, on governance and on finance. So I will concentrate in the minutes I have with you uh, on these two, acknowledging that important pieces, especially the accountability piece, that is very important, especially for Western donors, needs to be, be left out here. Now we've come, there is a shorthand we've come to use uh, for uh, Ukrainian reconstruction assistance, and that is the Marshall Plan for Ukraine, a modern Marshall Plan for Ukraine. And indeed, the Marshall Plan is a parallelism, is, a, is an inspiration for, for the ambition that, uh, that is necessary for this task. But what it is not is a blueprint. And I'll tell you why. I'd actually call what we need now an inverse Marshall Plan. And why is that? In 1947, one country was helping many. Now it's many help countries helping one. In 1947, there were no institutions, also no aid institutions. Now we have a full spectrum of institutions available, which is why donor coordination will be the key governance challenge and the key construction challenge, I should say, uh, of this endeavor. Which is why we suggest in this report that we should not build new institutions but adapt the existing institutions to the task. Let's not reinvent the wheel, let's not uh, waste time on the design of new stuff. This will be a monumental undertaking, it will be large. A big coalition is, is going to be needed to finance this. Uh, this is why it needs strong leadership. And the leadership necessary for such a task, we feel, needs an institutional anchor. And that institutional anchor should be the G7 as a group of like-minded nations that can build a coalition, let's say G7 plus larger than the G7 itself. And it needs leadership, if you will, Mr. or Mrs. Marshall. We think the initial coordinator of such an endeavor should be an American of global standing. Why an American? Because the international coalition that needs to be constructed, needs to reach far uh, beyond Europe, and uh, America has shown to be able to build such global coalitions. Also think about the fact that such a coordinator needs to convince, cajole, and coordinate. That's what this American of global stature, we hope, can do. It is also because it is not self-evident that the United States would be part of such an effort. It needs to be drawn in. There is a, a conversation on Capitol Hill that says, well, we've invested so much into arms, into the security of, of Ukraine, why don't you Europeans do the reconstruction? We actually think that's a recipe for disaster in transatlantic affairs because the finger pointing will start immediately. You're doing this wrong, the other side is doing the other wrong. We actually need a compact in which we acknowledge uh, the nexus between security and recovery and both sides need to be keep engaged in both. The second big piece of this uh, coalition that will need to work with Ukraine is the European Union, because Ukraine, the final goal of recovery for Ukraine will be European integration. So the EU is a non-enumerated member of uh, the G7, so it already sits at the table, and that, rec uh, that recovery coordinator that we need can draw on the European Union, on, on the European Commission, on a task force hosted there uh, to get the work done. Now, the financials of this are large, but at this point, unknowable. There are uh, different, uh, different estimates ranging from the destruction uh, for at 120 to several hundred billion. Now, those are large numbers, 
But when you look at them, don't let yourself be convinced that this is not doable. It is. It's going to be stretched out over many years, covered by a number of countries, different institutions, and different financial tools to be applied to this, to this task. When you break it down, it does become realistic and doable. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. And it's not easy because the most important thing that is necessary for this is grants. Grants to start early, to be flexible, and not to overburden uh, Ukraine with debt to make it ins debt, debt insustainable, uh, which would be another disaster. So the gold standard is grants, and that's Western taxpayer money. Now, the debate has not started, and it needs to get started, how the EU uh, wants to finance the European part of the reconstruction aid. I can see four options on, on those, and when I enumerate these four options, I will see many rolling eyes. And I'll read them to you. First, collect national contributions, pledging. Secondly, reopen the multi-annual financial framework. Third, a, another COVID-type relief fund, next-gen EU. Fourth, introduce common bonds. None of these options are appealing. That is why we don't hear anything about it, because there is a game of duck and cover. Nobody wants to come out with this first. But if no politician has the courage to open this debate in Europe, then others beyond Europe will not commit either, because they'll say, if you, Europe doesn't move first and doesn't commit, after all, Ukraine is a European country, we won't. So therefore, this is a tough, this is a thorny debate, has a lot of overlay of other issues, but it needs to start now. No, no amount of, of, of government money can reconstruct a country like Ukraine. Ukraine needs to become investable, and investors will tell you what they need is peace and predictability. What if we don't get peace immediately or some intermediate stage that we can't really call peace? Well, for that, we need something that we call war insurance to help reduce the, the risk of private investments, and such risk can only be reduced by sovereigns. This is a sovereign task, and it hasn't yet been done. It needs to be constructed. Then, finally, my final point, Russian assets. I think we need to tell Russia that they will never see these frozen assets again. But freezing assets is not seizing assets. There is a legal and a political gulf between the two of them. We actually, in studying this issue, found that we don't expect Russian assets to be usable and used anytime soon also because of the, the impact on the international financial system and the precedence this would set. But what you can do is use the frozen assets for leveraged financial products, where you, they produce interest, and they beca can become a reparations element or reparations replacement in whatever settlement uh, uh, there might be. So there's different ways to use that money but it is not a straightforward, quick seizure of those funds. So, in summing up, Ukrainian recovery is a massive undertaking for Western donor countries. It is doable, and it needs to start now. And reconstruction planning, that is my last sentence, shall not be a fig leaf. A fig leaf for all those who don't want to do what is necessary now. And what is necessary now is to keep an ailing country afloat and help it to end this war soon. Thank you.
So, recovery for Ukraine. Uh, it's good to be planning for that, as we just heard. Uh, but first, of course, the war must be won. Europe, uh, Russia must be pushed back uh, to the previous borders, and Ukraine's territorial integrity must be restored. Now, we're not going to, in our next session, we're not going to go too far from Ukraine. In fact, we're going to stay on the shores of Ukraine. We're going to be looking at what's happening there. It's been the focus of a great deal of news reporting. I'm a, I'm a newsman, I'm a television news anchor, and have been dealing with this subject a great deal ourselves. Everyone is watching what is happening in the Black Sea. It's militarily significant, but it's also significant for the su food supply, the world food supply. So there's a lot at stake in that region, uh, and not just food, much else as well. So we have a panel discussion coming up right now on the future of the Black Sea region. The moderator is Piotr Marciniak. I invite him to the stage now. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? I think it's, everything is right. It's high time to start. We have a, a delay, I'm afraid. Uh, are you tired by the long discussions? It's, it looks like a tough day. Tough, tough times, I, I could say also. My name is Piotr Marciniak. Uh, I'm uh, the news anchor for the Fox uh, TVN, Poland's most watched uh, television newscast. I also work for TVN24, which is a uh, Polish 24-hour uh, commercial news channel owned by US-based uh, media company Warner Bros. Discovery. Welcome you all to the panel, Future of the Black Sea Region, Complexity of Interest in Times of War. The participants are uh, Brigadier General Remus Bondur, Chief of Strategic Planning Directorate, Defense Staff, Romania. Romania, nice to have you here. Uh, Admiral, Admiral Rob Bauer, Chair of the NATO Military Committee, and uh, Mariana Bazuchla, Deputy Chair, Committee on National Security, Defense and Intelligence, Verkhovna Rada, Parliament of Ukraine. Uh, there will be a lot of questions. We have limited time, as always. And uh, I, I still hope there will be also some time for some additional questions from the audience. Mm, so let's hope it will be possible. Uh, the first uh, group of questions will be to all, to all of you, but uh, we'll start with the guest from Ukraine. Uh, is Ukraine able to defend Odessa, regain Kherson, the south of the country, and Crimea? How can NATO help Ukraine to achieve this? What if Putin uses tactical nuclear weapons? And do you think Ukraine will be admitted to NATO and when? <clears throat> um, before the stroke, uh, actually, I asked if to answer honestly or positive. Uh, because uh, if we're speaking about the overall possibility of uh, usage of nuclear weapon, uh, we need to be honest that uh, uh, all the steps that were made by Russia before, uh, they cannot be rationalized. Uh, speaking about the um, middle-term and long-term outcomes they received. So those uh, situations when they actually activated their uh, doctrine of uh, uh, restricted nuclear war, and started demonstration politically, and even if uh, we are now speaking about Black Sea region, so about maritime, uh, also aspects, uh, they um, uh, activated one of the greatest submarine in, uh, um, in the world, Belgorod, with uh, uh, nuclear capabilities to demonstrate their power. So the overall possibility exists. So, and uh, the question is, having this possibility now, uh, how it can be used? According to their doctrine, it can be used as uh, even a demonstration um, without uh, uh, big uh, 
uh, destructive um, outcomes, but uh, to demonstrate the overall usage of this nuclear weapon. And uh, uh, the question is uh, only and firstly how NATO and world will react. Because uh, the main aim of the main possible aim of such usage will not, not will be not would not be not to make the destruct, uh, destruction, uh, but to uh, see their reaction to cross one more red line, and the overall reaction will definite the future of the world order really. But. Uh, where, of course, uh, it's uh, about Ukraine. We are preparing for such scenarios, and uh, also with different uh, variant of uh, execution. So I will not be optimistic, or I will not say that there is no possibility. And uh, now, in diff different dimensions, political, organizational, our world should prepare to make it how to react on this situation. Uh, the second moment is about uh, Crimea, and you asked uh, about perspectives uh, of Black Sea region. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> to say that Black Sea region is unstable, it would be too, very, too banal. Uh, now, Black Sea region is uh, a great uh, area of battle. And uh, uh, there are actually, in fact, there are two stakeholders there, and I dare to say it's not, uh, Russia, it's not Russia and NATO. It's uh, uh, mostly one NATO country, which is playing uh, some kind in the middle game, it's Turkey. And uh, they even, uh, uh, start, uh, they even uh, don't only, uh, I can speak not only about military presence and overall security format, but also about uh, different uh, connected uh, uh, measures as help uh, with, uh, um, uh, with uh, um, uh, transportation of uh, goods. Uh, and uh, now even uh, the situation is so tangled that even to transport, to transport food became the military operation with the uh, uh, diplomatic and military dimensions. I speaking, I'm speaking about um, no, sorry English uh, uh, about transportation of our agriculture culture uh, of our agriculture goods. That firstly, uh, having occupied. Uh, a lot in Black Sea region, we needed uh, to win the battle for one island, then uh, have a di diplomatic process of uh, negotiation uh, with the uh, help of Turkey, and then uh, have the possibility to export our agriculture goods. So it's an example that uh, the uh, Black Sea region became so extremely dangerous and so extremely unpredictable that even after the win of Ukraine, it would not be stable for uh, many, many years. And uh, uh, it will be some kind of vacuum of uh, uh, proper order. And uh, uh, we predict that uh, 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 Turkey will be some kind of main player, and of course it depends uh, in what state would be Russia and what the role uh, would be after the uh, overall war conflict we have now. And uh, uh, we know the Montre uh, doctrine, which prevents uh, uh, for, uh, to make uh, real uh, enforcement of NATO countries present in Black Sea region. So uh, that's why it's also questionable how uh, NATO can react to enforce the presence, uh, for example, in Romania, in Bulgaria, or just uh, in other countries uh, as NATO representatives forces. 
Uh, you had uh, a lot of questions. Maybe um, I, I tried to describe the overall environment and threats, uh, and uh, will be happy to answer uh, additional, or if, you, if I did not answer it in uh, some. But tell me something more about the possible reaction of uh, Ukrainian soldiers in case of, uh, if, if Putin uses uh, nuclear weapons. Are you afraid of this? And what about uh, the NATO's? Uh, um, membership. Uh, I mean, Ukraine, Ukraine want to be ad admitted to, to, to NATO. Of, uh, what is your opinion? Is it possible or not? Honestly. Honestly. <laughs> Honestly, <laughs> yes, of course, uh, I'm Ukrainian and I cannot avoid wishful thinking component. Uh, but uh, uh, comparing even uh, one half of year before, now we have uh, far more, chan more chances to be the member of NATO, I suppose. Because uh, the uh, Russian invasion, full-scale war, uh, provoked those which uh, they uh, did not expect and they did not want. The two Scandinavian countries uh, which uh, have borders with Russia became uh, NATO members very quickly. And uh, it's uh, one of uh, uh, example when, uh, and, and what is very important, after they became in the process of uh, uh, gaining NATO membership, after they became NATO mem members, uh, Russia did not react in that full scale, possible scale, that world was uh, uh, expected. So, and it's not only one example. We see that, and as I previously said in another discussion, we see very clear moment, and uh, which was the mistake, I, uh, I can say, of tens of years. Russia cannot be calmed down. There is no way of ca to calm down aggressor. Every enforcement, uh, every force action, Every de demonstration of the power of the democratic world, the power of decision, the power of NATO has a positive effect on the outcomes and Russian decisions. Every demonstration of a step back, every demonstration of uh, some kind of neg negotiation possibility uh, in paradox, uh, as a paradox, enforce a Russian aggressively systemic position because uh, they see it like weakness. And it's the principal moment of the mentality of the state. And it's a principal mistake, uh, the outcome of what is war in Ukraine now. Because in 2000, uh, we, if we, yes, now we are about uh, Black Sea region. Black Sea region, it's about also Georgia. It's about reaction of NATO and world in 2008. And uh, while having powerful reaction in 2008, with 10, I don't know, 5, 10% of efforts, we would not have all the other steps by Russia. Or at least we would have uh, much less and this is example, and I try to explain what we have now, the outcomes and perspectives. So uh, enforcement and powerful position, it's that way out of conflict. In uh, what is the last sentence, it can be paradox for European country, uh, European culture, postmodern European uh, culture, and even NATO perspectives. It can be paradox, but it's very, very understandable by Russia. The next question is to the guest from uh, Romania. Uh, General, how does Romania help Ukraine? Um, do you believe in its victory, honestly? And what do you mean by victory in this case? And uh, will the use of nuclear weapons change a lot? Or maybe not? What's your opinion? So, um, I will start with complexity there. So, we are talking about Black Sea region where we have, uh, we have the war ongoing, two belligerents, three NATO member states, 
two partners, the flow of the grains coming from Russia and Ukraine moving out through the straits and spreading around the world. So it's a, it's a very complex region moving back to history, cultural differences, religious differences, complexity in relations between states. These have to be taken into consideration. That leads to a conclusion that we need to have a strategy for the Black Sea region, extensive Black Sea region, to discuss very careful what is the future of this region and how we can continue to support our values into this region. This is very important. Now, going back, Russia wage a war of choice. Ukraine wage a war of national survivability. And we, all of us together, the West, we are carrying a battle to support Ukraine again, to protect our values. Uh, starting from this, I will say that Romania started to support Ukraine to prepare for this war immediately after 2014. We were part of training the Ukrainian troops through the Partnership for Peace. Um, the Ukrainian troops participated in multinational exercises in Romania starting immediately after the intervention, the Russian intervention in Donbas in 2014. So I think we were part of the response of the Ukrainian forces at the beginning of the battle because I assume that we contributed to, to the fact that Ukrainian forces were better trained in order to stop the aggression. How we helped Ukraine, I think the most important thing was the way Romania prepared and carried on the migration flow. We've processed about 2.5 million migrant, migrants from, from Ukraine moving out, refugees. Mostly of them were women and children. And it was not only the government, the local authorities, but the simple Romanian citizen that put heart and their fortune and their values into the support of these refugees. Uh, for the moment, I think we have about 80,000 still hosted on, on our territory. They, they move in between 80,000 to 85,000. There is a, a change in the figures on a, on a daily basis. Secondly, we offer support in treating heavily wounded soldiers into the military hospitals and also, we provided military support, both lethal and non-lethal, in support of Ukraine. So I think Romania was, together with all the NATO countries and within the NATO uh, and EU uh, policy, in support of NATO. We opened on the, on the EU side a hub, and we've transported all the goods provided by other nations into Ukraine through that hub. So I think the support was from the beginning and will continue until it's necessary. Um, speaking about the nuclear threat, the nuclear threat needs to be assessed. We need to think about this. It can happen and uh, for the moment, I think uh, NATO take into consideration this and there will be plans to, in place to respond to such a threat. Uh, about the victory, the question that you asked, it's very difficult as a soldier to predict the end of a war. Uh, but uh, that battle to support Ukrainians, I think, is critical now. Because the Ukrainian, they need to assess what, is the, what the victory means. And then diminishing the military power of Russia would be a sort of, uh, let's say, support for all of us for the future life. But coming to the end, I come again and I say, we need to discuss a strategy for the uh, Black Sea area, extending Black Sea area to include all the complexities that are in that area and what the future looks like for, the, for this region. You've just been talking about uh defending of the values, but maybe, what about security? Where does Romania see 
uh, threats to its uh, security, is uh, Russia a threat not only to Ukraine but also to NATO countries in the Black Sea region? And what about uh, the Russian fleet? Say again the last part. I was. Uh... What about the Russian fleet? Uh, do you think uh, Russia is a threat not only to Ukraine but also to NATO countries, also to uh, uh, to Romania? Are you feel threatened by so, Russia? So of course that um, you know through the history Russians never came with flowers in Romania, uh, and uh, I assume that we need to address within uh, NATO the collective defense and we have plans in place and uh, after the Madrid summit the Black Sea region came up into the strategic concept uh, we were we treated Russians at part as partners for a long time and uh, we were strategically surprised from the moment we treated Russians as a threat, we predicted almost with pinpoint accuracy the moment of invasion. Um, and now I think what NATO have done with moving the collective defense battle groups into the southeastern part of the Eastern Front, how I like to say, is uh, a reassurance of the nations we are working and we are grateful to France to assume the Framework Nation uh, Collective Defense Battle Group in Romania and some other nations are willing to support the increase of these, the, the raise of this battle group to a brigade level. Uh, we also took advantage of the presence of the air assets in Romania to increase the air policing with uh, extensive uh, uh, number of jets, fighter jets. We are keeping, NATO is keeping, a, a, let's say, an eye on a Black Sea to see what is going on there. Um, and uh, for the moment, I think, the evolution of the situation reassured Romania. This happens also with our neighbors in, in Bulgaria. So I think now there is a coherence of the, of the deployment of forces. The United States deployed also additional troops in Romania. And uh, for the moment, we are looking to increase this presence and to provide the host nation support in order to NATO to help us with the collective defense. I will probably ask uh, also about uh, the role of Turkey in the region and about uh, the situation of uh, Georgia. Uh, you said about before, but maybe a little uh, be be uh, later. Uh, General, uh, Admiral, sorry. Um, what are... Ukraine's chances of defeating Russia, in your opinion. Do you think that Putin can really use nuclear weapons? Or, it is a bluff, what would be NATO's response? And will the arrival of radioactive pollution on the territory of the alliance countries be, 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 will be treated as aggression? That's that's an important question. And the last question is, does Ukraine have a chance to be admitted uh, tonight? I know it's a political question mostly, but maybe you have your opinion, military opinion about that. What are the arguments for and what are the arguments against? So what's, uh, let's start with the defeating Russia. Um, <clears throat> I think it's very important to, uh, to state that NATO sees Russia as a threat. But at the same time, NATO is not at war with Russia. And that's a fact, whether people like it or not, but that's a fact. Um, that's one. Uh, second, w with regard to membership of NATO, that is a political question. It has military implications, but I'm not going to talk about how big the chances are. Uh, a decision was taken in uh, the Bucharest summit in 2008. It is reiterated in the last uh, Madrid summit, uh, and at the same time, um, as always, the door remains open. The nations that want to join can uh, say so. They have to live up to certain rules and regulations, and then it is up to the allies and no one else to actually allow 
those nation, that nation to become a member. So that is the procedure. And whether the nations are willing to do that is a political question first and foremost. So I'm not going to answer uh, that question there. The second one with regard to um, is Ukraine able to win this war? I think um, as my colleague uh, the Brigadier said, it is very difficult to actually predict anything uh, in a war because uh, things can change overnight. But if you look at what Ukraine is doing, that is remarkable. And I think if they continue that way and they're able to continue to uh, successfully supply their forces, to maintain their forces, to be re-equipped by the Allies and other nations in the world, then I think Ukraine is able to win that war. Uh, how long will that take is a, is a completely different question. That depends on many, many things, and uh, so I'm not going to elaborate on that. But I think what changed the situation since 2014 is that NATO and allies helped to train Ukraine forces in a completely different way than they had done before. Ukraine had many similarities to the Russian forces that we see now before of until 2014. So basically, generals leading the soldiers, uh, no mission command, what does that mean? In NATO, we use that term to actually s explain to our soldiers why they fight, what they have to achieve, and then to leave the how to as low a possible level, uh, to, to, to leave that to the lowest possible level. So it's not the generals telling the soldiers what to do, how to do it, but only why and, and, and what, and then leave the execution of the operation to as low a level as possible. And that's what we see now, uh, after eight years of that support from NATO and allies, you actually see the success of Ukraine, what is happening. Ukraine is extremely successful because the soldiers in the units actually take the initiative, while the Russian soldiers are waiting for an answer from Moscow. And then within, their, within the answer coming back from Moscow, Ukraine forces have achieved something new, creating a new problem, and therefore they are within the Russian cycle time and time again. That is what is happening at the moment. That is the result of, first and foremost, the Ukrainian courage and determination. Secondly, the help of 50 nations to supply Ukraine with weapons and ammunition and money and other goods that are required to fight a war. Uh, but of course also this change in the, in the way they conduct warfare. So I think that is, uh, uh, that is why I believe it is possible that they win this war. Then with regard to nuclear, uh, I understand all the questions. I will not going to answer uh, whether we are prepared. Uh, I'm not going to tell you anything in a public forum on what the options are and what we are going to do when what is happening. It's so many how, uh, so what's, that it is uh, not even the radi radiation question. There are so many uh, factors that will determine the answer. The one thing that has been said many times by the leadership in NATO and in uh, a number of uh, allies is that the response will be such that the Russians will regret what they have done. And I think that is extremely important. And it's not only from a military point of view important, that answer, to make sure that we will respond, but it is also important from the point of view, and I didn't hear that so much uh, today and yesterday, is that the Russians will lose the last support in the world if they use nuclear weapons. I'm convinced of that. Whether that is part of their rational decision-making is something else, but uh, they will have no more friends other than maybe North Korea. Uh, so I think it is not a smart thing to do. It is a stupid thing to do. Will it not happen, therefore? No, that is not necessarily the case. I mean, we've seen, as uh, Mariana said, there's many things in this war, in this conflict, that is a surprise to us. And then you have to react to that. 
But the most important thing is there will be a response. The next question is uh, to our guests from uh, Ukraine and Romania. Uh, what role does Turkey play uh, in the region? Ankara provides Ukraine with drones, as we know, but also uh, lets Russian ships uh, through the Bosporus. How is the military cooperation between Ukraine and Turkey and, and between Romania and Turkey? President Erdogan, we know, we know that, continues to meet with Putin. Is it an, an opportunity from your point of view or, or a problem? Um, could you uh, clarify what about opportunity? Pardon? Which part of the question? Yeah. I was asking about Turkey, the role in the region, and you know that uh, Erdogan continues to, mm -hmm. uh, to meet with Putin and also to support you with uh, the drones. So uh, is, uh, is uh, those other meetings in, in Moscow or somewhere else uh, with, uh, between Erdogan and, and, and Putin an opportunity uh, well, I think about uh, peace negotiations, for example, or a problem for you. Okay. Uh, frankly, again, uh, I will try to avoid a lot of uh, uh, talks about, and uh, some kind of impressions about uh, polit um, external policy making by Turkey. Uh, and uh, actually, uh, those positions, they... Uh, they are playing now some kind of the, in the middle. Uh, it's very hard to, to, um, to verify and to uh, say about, because they are NATO country from one side. Uh, they, are, uh, they have ambition, amb uh, they are ambitious. They have ambitious to be the first uh, in the uh, Black region. From other side, they are keeping ties with uh, Russia. But uh, anyway, um, those partnerships that we have in defense industry, in uh, their help uh, in agriculture project, which is, as I previously said, in fact, military operation now, uh, and also uh, that helps that they uh, provide a sort example with our um, uh, with our military in prison to, um, uh, uh, in prison military uh, liberated uh, with the help of Erdogan, uh, so it's fact. Um, may I uh, stop on the uh, statement that in fact they are more unpredictable than to comment them. Uh, so I just hope that uh, Turkey will uh, find and keep that balance uh, that uh, would be at least acceptable in the, uh, those uh, unacceptable and extreme situation. And of course, if we, uh, while uh, having the topic about Black region, it's better to have uh, uh, such leadership by Turkey as a NATO country with the potential uh, more on over um, cooperation with others uh, than Russian. Uh, and so that uh, um, uh, that natural play uh, to exclude and to balance Russia is uh, better for everybody. Uh, so, but uh, I need to add about Black Sea region uh, because now it's really it's like vacuum of uh, security. Uh, even uh, those uh, civilian objects, and you know this, which are in Black Sea region, and also uh, uh, which were uh, Ukrainians, now it's uh, uh, small or more uh, military bases with special equipment. Uh, for example, it's uh, different technical issues, uh, uh, and uh, what about um, gas industry? Everything is used is. Uh, took by Russia and used for military purposes. And Crimea, we were cried about this because uh, two years, three years, four years ago that they made Crimea a big atomic mm, submarine, may I say in this way. And uh, uh, to demilitarize Crimea, it's one of the main uh, issue to be sure in uh, Black Sea region. I'm afraid we need to, be hur to, to hurry up, so uh, please let us uh, short uh, answers. 
Uh, I, I will ask you about uh, the, the role of Turkey, but also about uh, the security of Moldova, uh, which is your neighborhood. Uh, what about the Transnistrian, not the Dniestre problem? Uh, uh, so Turkey respects its status as a NATO member. So we, uh, Romania have a strategic partnership with Turkey. So nothing to comment on this. So the Montreux Convention, it's a document that completes the laws of the sea. And uh, immediately after the outbreak of the conflict, Turkey closed the, the straits. And that meant two Russian cruisers were not allowed to enter the Black Sea. I think the presence of those two cruisers would have changed the naval situation into the Black Sea. So um, I think like any other countries into NATO, each of the countries follow their national interests. I think Turkey is doing the same. But as a NATO allied and uh, owner of the Montreux Convention, they just put it in practice. So that's all on my side. Talking about uh, Republic of Moldova, indeed we are very, very concerned about the, let's say, the most dangerous course of action when a land bridge can move from Crimea down to Odessa and then in connection with Transnistria would bring the Russian troops very close of Moldova. Moldova needs help to improve their defense system and within our partnership for peace we work together with them on this and I think some other NATO countries should do the same. Um, that's the perspective now from, from this point, but again, it's crucial, as I mentioned, two partner states, Moldova, Republic of Moldova and Georgia, they need to be supported, even though the pressure is now to support Ukraine, in order to increase their military capacity and to be more aligned to our values than to a future occup uh, occupation. Admiral, uh, short question about Georgia. I'm not asking about uh, uh, the possible, um, you know, I would like to ask you, can Georgia ever be NATO? But I know that you will not answer this, uh, this question. So is, is uh, Georgia safe in your opinion? And uh, what do you think about uh, Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia conflict? Uh, Georgia is a partner uh, of NATO, like Ukraine, uh, like Armenia and uh, Azerbaijan. And uh, in that way, and some of, and all of these nations have done or are having uh, contributions to NATO operations. So, uh, in their own way, and in their uh, in in the different, uh, in, and not in all operations, but in in, in some. Uh, in that sense, we will remain having that relationship with these nations. Uh, we are not part of that conflict. It's maybe a boring answer, but it is important that uh, people uh, make the distinction between the involvement of allies or the alliance. And I am talking on behalf of the alliance. And that means that 13 nations agree to do something or not. It is not the NATO headquarters that decides on its own to do anything against any nation. It is a discussion that we will have and then when 30 nations want to do something, help a nation, as an alliance, we will have to have had that discussion. Because that is difficult, you therefore see that a lot of the allies are helping, most of the allies, or all the allies, are helping Ukraine in different ways, either financially or non-lethal aid or lethal aid. It is not the alliance when it comes to lethal aid, it is with other aid, it is non-lethal aid, there's the assistance package that was decided in Madrid, so there is a combination of what NATO does and what the Allies do. And the same applies with our relationship with the partners you were talking about. And in this case, uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, are having a, a problem together. And uh, that is first and foremost their problem in terms of what they, uh, what they do there and how they... Of course we will talk to both nations 
in terms of uh, 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 if they need any assistance, um, uh, but we don't want to, again, become part of that conflict. And, um, and I think it is important to make that distinction and to understand, to, because if all these conflicts become a conflict between NATO and other nations, the world is not necessarily a safer place. I mean, we, we should keep the conflict as long as possible, and it, it, may, it maybe doesn't sound nice, but in Ukraine. Because if it becomes a bigger conflict, uh, we are much further from home. We need to continue to help Ukraine, as we do, as we do, on a daily basis. Uh, and I saw um, that with my own eyes in Zeshov, uh, with the uh, Polish Chief of Defense, when I visited that place two days ago, uh, and that's an impressive operation where NATO allies, where other nations in the world send goods and that is then being sent to, uh, to Ukraine. So that is the sort of help where we, where we uh, participate in, that not, that not being a NATO operation, but uh, it is, uh, there is a lot of support from NATO to Ukraine and to our partners. Well, it's time for Kanji I questions. We are short of time, but uh, please introduce yourself and, uh, and address the question to a specific person. Uh, who is the first? Maybe you. you. Uh, Ray Wojcik from KC Consulting. I agree with Mariana about... Uh, sorry. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I, I agree with Mariana about the... Is he first? I'm sorry. No, you can, okay. you can continue. I agree with Mariana about the weak uh, deterrence posture after 2008 absolutely shaped the conditions for Putin. I agree with the general about the Black Sea strategy, and I agree with the admiral about Ukraine will win. My question is on the deterrence front going forward, what can NATO do on the Black Sea reference standing NATO maritime groups. There's only two that can do patrolling and it allowed the Black Sea over these years to be exposed or not have the presence it needed. So what would you say about the standing NATO maritime groups? How can we increase that and have more deterrence going ahead? Thanks. Maybe we'll collect some more questions. Uh, your question is? Thank you very much. I am a member of Turkish Parliament. I am a diplomat by profession. Now I chair Turkish delegation in the Council of Europe. So I wish there was a Turkish admiral also here who had participated in the negotiation of this grain corridor deal or who is observing now the implementation. But anyhow, let me try to fill the gap. First of all, Turkish cooperation coordination, Turkish aid with Ukraine, didn't start after 24th of February. It started long years ago to help Ukraine develop its capacity to defend. My problem is here, I, EU colleagues especially, they are trying to design a strategy in the Black Sea without Turkey, or just criticizing Turkey in the Council of Europe. Or they are trying to design a Syria, we have 900 kilometers, without Turkey. And they ask us, why don't you follow the EU sanctions? The answer is simple, because we are not member, you don't consult us on any issue, you are not allowed us to get involved in any decision shaping. This was the same in the 90s, we couldn't design a proper strategy on getting the hydrocarbon resource of Central Asia and Kashmir to Europe, independent of Russia. At that time, all the EU countries rejected it. We could only make one pipeline. So the question is, within the strategy we should design from now on, should we take into consideration the taking energy resources of the area in Kazakhstan without Black Sea and without Russia through pipelines from Turkey? Thank you. And the last question, shortly, please. Wojciech Łuczak, Defense Analyst, Warsaw, Poland. Uh, uh, Mariana said about the submarine. I would say that this, uh, the Russians are going to turn Crimea into unsinkable uh, aircraft carrier somewhere in the Black Sea. And this uh, tactics of the Russians is very straightforward, to cut 
Ukraine from the Black Sea and to control Black Sea. And this is, Admiral, this is a not Ukrainian business. This is our own business. If the Russians will succeed in such a strategy in Black Sea, what will be, a, uh, what is the tactics on uh, eventual cutting, uh, let's say, uh, predictable democratic world from the Black Sea area? Thank you very much. So we have, we have three questions here. Who is going to answer? We are limited of time. Yeah, Admiral. many of the questions to NATO, I guess. Uh, the energy question I'm, I'm not going to answer. I think in general, Turkey is a good ally. Turkey is playing an important role. Mariana said it as well uh, with regard to the grain deal and uh, with the Montreux uh, uh, and the Straits. So I think um, there is... Uh, uh, there, I, 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 I don't think there is criticism there in, in NATO on, on the position of Turkey. With regard to, uh, to the Black Sea and being cut off, uh, and the, uh, whether it's an aircraft carrier or a submarine, uh, a Crimea, I think uh, it is interesting because the Russians actually have no maritime superior, superiority in the Black Sea at the moment. It is interesting because uh, everybody thinks that, but it's not, and Ukraine has been very successful to actually uh, not only sink the Moskva, but also to uh, attack the uh, naval air station in uh, Crimea. And so um, th the Russians are not effective, as effective as they want to be. And the same applies for air superiority. They don't have that at the moment. That is the reason why uh, the operation actually is not successful at all. So. We have to be careful to talk about the Russians always as if they are 11 feet tall, because they're not. They have actually not uh, achieved any of their strategic goals in Ukraine. So strategically, they have lost this war already. And of course it is up to, because of the bravery of the Ukrainian people and the armed forces, that they are successful on the ground. And that is fantastic, with the help of many. But uh, I mean, the Russians are not successful at all. And, and the, the, the discussion, as we had before, is what does it mean if they are cornered in a way to a point where they start doing uh, unpredictable or things that are unthinkable? And that is, of course, something we, we will have to think about. We will not talk about what the outcome of that discussion is until we see it happening. Uh, but uh, it is, that is part of warfare. You have to prepare for the worst and then you don't talk about it. The only thing, as I said before, the, uh, the alliance is talking to the Russians, as Jake Sullivan did from the United States when it came to the response to any attack from the Russians in the nuclear. And uh, I think that is a very strong signal uh, coming from the US on behalf of the alliance. I'm afraid we are out of the schedule right now, so we need to finish. Um, the only thing I can add is that the Turkish minister was uh, supposed to be here, but he is not, apparently. Um, it's a pity. This concludes the panel. Thank you. Thank you to all participants and uh, spectators. Thank you very much. NATO and the Black Sea region and Ukraine. There's, this is, these topics, these words have popped up again and again and again over the past couple of days. It's obvious that there's deep concern about what's happening in that region and what will be happening there moving forward. Right now, we're going to come back off the water, as it were, onto the land in Ukraine and address a question that is very difficult 
it must be said. We're talking about war atrocities being committed in Ukraine, what they mean, what, how prosecution of those atrocities will proceed. It's again a topic that I deal with as a television news anchor covering Ukraine a lot. Uh, but what we've got right now is a high-level conversation on that topic, one-to-one, -to -one, involving the responsibility of Russia for mass atrocities committed in Ukraine, and we've got just the right person to host that. Uh, a good friend of mine, a very accomplished moderator, you see him on world stages everywhere, my good friend Ali Aslan. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Terry, indeed, for this kind introduction. It's wonderful to see you up on stage uh, doing your masterful work as MC. And yes, uh, this is indeed a very crucial, very timely discussion we're going to have here right now. I couldn't be more delighted uh, to be joined uh, when we talk about war crimes committed uh, by uh, Russia, to talk about the one person who is at the forefront of this uh, fight, ladies and gentlemen. Please welcome the Ukrainian Prosecutor General Andrei Kostin is here with us. Please give him a hand. <laughs> Andrei Kostin, obviously the aim on your part and the part of the international community is to hold Russia accountable for its war crimes against Ukrainian uh, people. Uh, before we go into detail, perhaps you can give a very quick overview over what is the nature of R Russian crimes committed and what sort of crimes uh, are you actually investigating? Um, thank you, Ali. Um, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, before I start my introductory remarks, I would like to thank government of Poland and Polish people for their invaluable assistance and support from the very first day of Russian aggression. Um, coming back to your question, currently my office is investigating three types of international crimes. The crime of aggression, the war crimes, and the crime of genocide. Russia's unprovoked and unjustified invasion of my country is clear violation of the U UN Charter's prohibition of the use of force against territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. This act requires adequate response, entailing Russia's state responsibility as well as individual criminal liability of its political and military leadership. We have already identified more than 600 suspects for the crime of aggression. As of now, we have around 37,000 registered incidents of war crimes with death toll among civilian population amounting to 7,500, including 418 children. Number of wounded exceeds 10,000. And these numbers are incomplete as we are unable to have a whole picture of the situation due to ongoing hostilities and lack of access of, to occupied territories of Ukraine. Since the very first day of this brutal war, we have witnessed Russia's deliberate targeting of civilian population and civilian objects in urban settings, along with intentional starvation of civilians in besieged cities. Undoubtedly, acts of Russian soldiers, such intentional killing of civilians or detainees, torture and mutilation, rape and other sexual violence, acts of terror and intimidation, forced displacement and pillage amount to war crimes. We all remember bombing of Mariupol Maternity Hospital and Drama Theater, shelling of Krematorsk Railway Station, mass killings and torture in towns of Kyiv region, or the very recent missile attack in Zaporizhia killing 25 civilians. Last night, city of Bila Tserkva has been attacked through kamikaze drones. As of now, we have identified more than 170 suspects and successfully convicted 10 war criminals. These illegal acts have nothing to do with the com combatants' in in engagement in armed conflicts. This brings me to the crime of genocide. 
Since 24th of February, we have heard loud and clear how Kremlin's leadership incited Russian army to carry out the Ukrainization process. Step by step, rhetoric became more aggressive and the first signs of attacking Ukrainians as a group appeared. We all remember atrocities committed in Bucha and Irpeny. With the recent liberation of occupied territories in eastern and southern parts of the country, we have been witnessing the manifest pattern of similar conduct. In Izum, more than 440 graves were found at a mass burial site in the woods at the edge of liberated city. While killing of large number of groups may be the most direct means of destroying a group, persecution can also be committed by other acts that does not have immediate result, such as practices of forced deportations and confinement to filtration camps practiced by Russian Federation. Deliberate policy of forced deportation of Ukrainian children and initiation of adoption processes in Russia is particularly alarming. We have already identified up to 7,000 children victims of this policy in course of the ongoing criminal proceedings, whereas potential number are tenfold, if not more. We all know that forcibly transferring children of one group to another group is a classical example of genocide. Thank you so much for giving us this overview. And uh, I want to pick up on some of the numbers that you have shared with us. Uh, you said you have so far uh, 37,000 documented war crimes, but so far only 170 individuals have been charged as suspects. And if I understand, only about 25, 30 people have been indicted, 10 convicted, if I'm not mistaken. But those are still relatively small numbers compared to the crimes and the numbers of documented war crimes we're looking at. Why is it so hard? So what are some of the main challenges that you're encountering here? Um, the main challenges in our investigations are, first of all, we have lack of access to occupied territories. And often with recapturing of the occupied regions, we might discover that certain piece of evidence is already distorted or simply the witnesses are in unavailable due to massive displacement, forcibly deported or fled the territory due to war. Some crimes are of a sensitive nature, for example, conflict-related sexual violence. It becomes extremely difficult to seek testimony from survivors. In general, coming forward and talking of the atrocities committed or horrors witnessed is quite traumatic for people. Therefore, we are being very cautious in our efforts and sensitive to the needs of victims and survivors. Coming back to, to these figures, um, a lot of, we have two sources of uh, registering of uh, the incidents of war crimes. First of all, it's a shelling or bombing of civil infrastructure. It could be apartments, it could be homes, it could be other uh, civil infrastructure. So there is a fact and, and uh, we register it as a fact of war crime, as an incident of war crime. The others, we have, uh, um, the other source are reports of people. So people can claim that their property was destroyed due to attack of the aggressor. And we, of course, register such cases. So, for instance, if it's multi-story buildings and all of the flats have lost their windows, then, then many people then, at some time, that come and register that their property was damaged or their property was uh, uh, completely destroyed. And there is also one, uh, one interesting, uh, interesting uh, situation that it can happen that the same fact of war crimes committed, for instance, destroying of property, could be reported by different members of the same family, for instance, who fled and who report uh, this, uh, you know, in weeks or months after that. So that is why we are now, with our international partners, we are now preparing some IT solution to find this duplication and to, uh, to uh, reduce this right number so that we will be concentrated on specific facts. So the overlapping of numbers then ought to be Yes, uh, we understand reduced. that this exists. Yeah. It's interesting enough that you, if I understand correctly, you and President Zelensky, of course, um, you are calling for a special tribunal 
for the crime of aggression. They, you think that it is the best way to find injustice against Russia. This is not unprecedented, of course. You've had the International Tribunal, Criminal Tri Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia back in the early 90s. Why do, you, why do you think that such a special tribunal here for the crime of aggression is needed? First of all, we all understand that crime of aggression was the first crime committed by Russian Federation because the aggression was the first. We, we name it as the mother of all other war crimes. There, was, there would be no other war crimes if aggression was not committed. Due to legal constraints, the, the crime of aggression could not be prosecuted and tried by the International Criminal Court. This is understandable for everyone. Then, everyone understand that act of aggression was committed and the all civilized world supported this on the level of General Assembly already and also supported this fact on the level of Council of Europe or OSCE. So we have this fact already, uh, this, this is no doubt that the, uh, that the, that the uh, crime of aggression was committed. Then we all understand that this aggression is another attempt of Putin's regime to ruin the basics of international law. So if this crime was committed, we need it to be punished. And the only legal way to punish this crime is to have a special tribunal. Of course, the easiest legal way to make it was via the resolution of the Security Council of UN. But we all understand that at least one permanent member of the Security Council will, will impose veto on this decision. That's why we're seeking the support of General Assembly, because every Ukrainian, it's not only about the political uh, position of the president of, and political leadership of Ukraine. Every Ukrainian wants this tribunal. I will mention historically, our people gave name to this tribunal and the first name for tribunal was Kharkiv Tribunal. When at the end of February, Kharkiv multi-storied buildings where people live, uh, apartment buildings were destroyed by Russian missiles, which they deliberately target these buildings. Then, then if you remember, the people changed the name into Bucha Tribunal. Mariupol Tribunal. So this is about Ukrainian nation. They want this to be happen. Uh, they want this to happen and indeed I see a rationale for wanting a special tribunal here. A new institution as a matter of fact that as you say would have to be approved by the UN General Assembly. There are some scholars out there, well the ICC, the International Criminal Court could also go after Russia for war crimes. As a matter of fact the ICC has opened investigations into war crimes in Ukraine. Uh, so so where's the distinction here? You, you, you want to, the ICC is um, is running its course, but the special tribunal has to act in addition, is what you're saying. Absolutely. These two mechanisms are complementary. So Ukrainians and we all together are talking about full accountability of the aggressor. And if the aggressor should be accountable for war crimes, for crimes against humanity and for crime of genocide, then the ICC is the best forum for this uh, for, 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 for these cases. We work in very close relations with the Office of Prosecutor Karim Khan. I actually uh, met with him yesterday. We have another round of, of you know, meeting and we have spoken at the Night of Law event in Paris together. And on this, our understanding is that these two mechanisms are complementary. So for war crimes, once again, for crime of genocide and crimes against humanity, the ICC is the best solution because it's in place already. It's international, judiciary, independent institution. But for the crime of aggression, which was the mother and is the mother of all, all these war crimes, we need tribunal. Interestingly enough, the United States, which obviously is uh, very much at the forefront of supporting Ukraine, on many levels. It's my understanding the Department of Justice has so far not publicly endorsed your idea of such a tribunal. Um, how, how are you going to convince them? How are you, you're talking to your American counterparts, obviously, on a regular uh, basis. Um, how to turn this around? You know, uh, first of all, is absolutely open and honest communication. Second, the 
legal argument I have already mentioned that otherwise no one would be punished for the crime of aggression if there will be no international credible instrument. For this instrument to be credible, we need wide support and, of course, support of nations like United States, UK, countries of EU. We need this support. In this case, the result, the outcome of this tribunal will be trusted. I think that coming back to the beginning of this dialogue, we are moving ahead, we are moving forward, and we are close, I think, to support of US on the level at the moment of the resolution of General Assembly. Then we will go ahead. Obviously, you would uh, like to see, ideally, President Putin, the Russian leadership being held accountable for those war crimes. There are some legal scholars out there who are rather skeptical about a tribunal as, as such as the one you described, being able to go after Putin and senior Russian officials. How do you respond to that? You know, I have responded uh, to this question yesterday. I will just repeat. There is no competition between the ICC and the special tribunal in which dock Putin and his team will be held. So it's important for Ukrainians to, to feel, to know, and to be sure that Putin and his team will be accountable for what they did. And there is no problem to make them accountable on the level of the ICC, and there is no problem to make him accountable on the level of tribunal. Because in any case, the creation of a special tribunal would be held, uh, would be based on the international treaty. The practical issue, how to capture and to deliver him and his team to the ICC or the tribunal, this is not a concern which need to stop our activity. We are optimistic. You're optimistic, and uh, one cause for optimism is, of course, looking at the battlefield right now. The, Russia, uh, the Ukrainian military is making headway, seems to be uh, moving from success to success on the battlefield. And in that process, of course, you will be capturing Russian uh, soldiers, colonels, generals. Um, but you know, the, the, at the end of the day, a lot of Russian soldiers whom you will be capturing will say, well, I was merely following orders. This is what they will say. They say, this is the order I followed. This is, of course, a, an argument we've heard many times when Nazis were captured after World War II. I was following orders. Uh, how, do you, how do you intend to proceed here? This is actually, first of all, this is a difference uh, between uh, specific cases. For instance, the case of bombing of uh, the multi-storied residential buildings in Borodyanka, and actually Mariupol Drama Theater, Mariupol Maternity House, they were bombed. So the pilot of this aircraft intentionally, he understand, understood at that time what is the target. And it's not about the order, it's about the violation of the rules of war, of international humanitarian law. If we are talking about the battlefield, of course, we treat uh, Russians prisoners of war in Ukraine on basis of the international humanitarian law. So we uh, divide those who committed war crimes against civil population, against civil infrastructure, from those who are just combatants. So this is, uh, I mean, the best example. See, what, with what, how Ukraine differs from Russia, because Ukraine respects rule of law, and Ukrainian people want justice based on the rule of law, while Russians, Russian Federation, are really, you know, destroying all basics of law and international order. We're almost uh, out of time, but before we uh, let you go, uh, how can the international community, we're in Warsaw here today, you're speaking in other countries obviously, making your case, how can other countries, how can the international community aid your country in your efforts in, to investigate and prosecute cases of war crimes committed by Russia? You, you know, we have a wide range of support and we are very grateful for 
all of the initiatives, I, I, I will just name all of them, just not, 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 not to lose. We have, uh, along with five European states, we have established joint investigation team, uniting our investigatory efforts against international crimes. Similarly, 14 European states have initiated domestic investigation for crimes committed by the Russian Federation in Ukraine. First time in history, 43 states unanimously referred the situation in Ukraine for the investigation of the Office of the Prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And as I mentioned, we have established excellent cooperation with Prosecutor Khan. In parallel, my office receives strategic advice from Atrocities Crimes Advisory Group created by European Union, United States, and United Kingdom. We have also adopted just recently the strategy on conflict-related sexual violence crimes and closely collaborating with UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, Ms. Pramila Patan. Mm -hmm. They will open office in, in Ukraine shortly. We have now a team of French police and experts, forensic experts, which work, which returned back to Ukraine after mass atrocities in Izum, and they now work in Kharkiv. And I will, I will mention, this is important, the last case we delivered to them, it's a very tragic case. Uh, we have found six cars where 24 civilians were killed near Kupiansk. 13 children, one pregnant woman, all of them killed in their cars. They tried to escape. All their bodies, so with the help of our special forces, we are transferred now to Kharkiv expert facilities. And French experts, forensic experts, are the first to make examination. Because we all need to find what was the cause of death of all of these people. So we are absolutely open and we are absolutely transparent. And this raised trust in what we found, found in Ukraine and what was committed. These are just small examples of our cooperation. 60 seconds left, Andrei Kostin. You were appointed as Prosecutor General by President, President Zelensky in July. You know what you were getting into. This is a very, very tough job, emotionally, psychologically. Has it been tougher than you expected, than you imagined? You know, um, I have a tough job uh, starting from 24th of February because I was not only doing my job as a, a chair of parliamentary committee, I was involved in many negotiation processes and, and many actually projects started for uh, compensation mechanism, the tribunal and others. So for me, it's just another front line of our fight, now fighting for justice, for Ukrainian people and for the old civilized world. Thank and, you. And we wish you the best of luck with that. Obviously, Ukrainian Prosecutor General Andrei Kostin, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you didn't leave the room. Um, we're really happy you're still with us because we were supposed to have a networking break right now, uh, but because we're running overtime, we're going to go straight into the next session. So uh, I hope you uh, are also glad that you stayed. It's going to be really quite an interesting session. You don't want to miss it. I think we're now getting back on, on track time-wise, um, which would be gr greatly beneficial for those tuning in and following, uh, following our panel discussions. Right now, we're going to really broaden things out now. Uh, we heard about Europe's policy priorities earlier. We heard about American policy priorities, foreign policy priorities at the beginning of this Global Outlook track this afternoon. And now we're going to look at one of those priorities that 
obviously the United States is focusing on, but Europe, even though it's concerned obviously with what's going on in Ukraine right now, has to have on its radar as well. And that is the Indo-Pacific region. So our topic is how the Indo-Pacific relates to European security. And it's, this session is going to be moderated by someone I, whose work I read regularly in the Washington Post. You may know him too, David Ignatius, associate editor and columnist at the Washington Post. I welcome you to the stage. So I'm uh, David Ignatius, as the announcer just said. Uh, let our panelists get seated. We're going to be talking today about how the Indo-Pacific looks at Europe, yes, but we're going to focus, as we have in every aspect of this conference on the war in Ukraine, this momentous event, and how the Indo-Pacific region is looking at the war in Ukraine, how the war affects security decisions, economic decisions uh, facing um, uh, the Indo-Pacific region. So let me introduce our, our panel. Um, seated uh, closest to me is Masami Oka, who is Vice Minister of Defense for uh, International Affairs in Japan. Uh, next to him is Niels Schmidt, who is a member of the Bundestag in Germany and is spokesperson for the SPD group. Um, uh, next is Minhua Chang, who is a re research fellow in Asian studies uh, for the Heritage Foundation's uh, uh, center on Taiwan, is herself from uh, Taiwan. Uh, and finally, Tobias Elwood, who's a British member of parliament and chair of the House of Commons uh, Defense Select Committee. And I should just say uh, that he, unfortunately, to catch a plane uh, back to Britain, uh, where there are a few party issues going on, uh, is going to have to leave our session a bit early. Uh, so if you see him get up, it's not because he's furious at anything that anybody has, has said. So let me uh, begin our discussion by asking you what to me is the baseline question when I think about the uh, Indo-Pacific region's uh, response to, to Ukraine, and that is where do the two key powers, the, the largest uh, countries and economies, China and India, stand. Uh, at the summit meeting that took place uh, a month or so ago in Tashkent, it appeared that the Indian Prime Minister and the Chinese President had indicated some distance from Russian President Vladimir Putin. I'd be interested in whether each of you thinks that's so and how you'd assess uh, their positions. Let me start it with Tobias at, at the far end. Well, thank you very much indeed, and I apologize that I do need to slide away. I'm delighted to be on this panel and uh, with so much expertise. And I'm pleased we're covering this because so much focus, understandably, has been on Ukraine. But what's happening here is being watched very, very carefully indeed. And the bigger picture that I believe we need to step back and see is perhaps the demise of the international rules-based order and how that's being taken advantage of by authoritarian states, possibly working in unison or collaboration together. You might recall the Beijing Olympics when the one main visitor to watch that uh, was President Putin himself. And he didn't go there to talk about ice hockey. He clearly, in my view, went there to discuss whether this is the moment that that baton of international leadership be handed from a Western nation or Western nations to uh, other nations outside of the Western Hemisphere. And I believe, unfortunately, that the peak, the high tide mark of Western liberalism since the Second World War was our departure from Afghanistan. And that's where countries have decided, actually, the West have become a little risk averse, a little bit timid in what we stand for, what we believe in, what we're willing to defend. It's now our moment to perhaps to flex our muscles a bit. And Ukraine is a great example of that. The difference between the two, I think, is that China does things far more slowly. Why do today what you could do in five years a lot more easily? Whereas Putin, perhaps, uh, given his age or whatever like that, uh, he wants to be on the stage. He wants to, uh, the world to know that Russia is back. And therefore, what he's actually doing is all part of a grander plan. But I think we must treat both uh, areas uh, in connection with each other. Because what happens here, as I say, could be repeated in some form or another in due course uh, in the uh, South Pacific. 
Then what, what, do you, what do you think, uh, and in particular because you're a specialist in economics, uh, what do you see in terms of Chinese and Indian uh, willingness to support the sanctions regime that the United States and Europe have announced? Uh, as far as I understand, I think uh, China's support to Russia can be observed from two ways. One is the energy. China continues to import energy from Russia. China benefited from the cheaper energy price right now from Russia. And uh, the other one is um, the greater use of RMB in bilateral transactions. And these two uh, kind of support to Russia uh, is not uh, restraint is not limited by the sanctions right now, but uh, as for the current sanctions, uh, China Chinese companies, for example, they uh, they withdraw their business from Russia uh, as soon as the, ro the 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 war started. So I mean, uh, basically, China try to obey um, the internet international sanctions and try to help Russia as long as uh, something like uh, buying energy or uh, use of RMB, they are not restrained by the sanctions. Uh, so I think to some extent, China is still aware, aware of the international sanctions. China is still trying to be um, second, receive the secondary sanctions. Thank you. Needles. Well, I think we have to distinguish the reaction from China from that uh, from India. They are uh, in a very different situation with regard uh, to the invasion in Ukraine. And we have also to make the distinction between two stages. Uh, immediately after the start of the war in uh, Ukraine, the focus of uh, the Chinese reaction was about the effects of sanctions and the possibility of uh, uh, China being sanctioned as uh, widely as Russia is and there is there was a reflection starting in China okay look uh, this might happen to us as well whereas um, in the case of India it's not so much about sanctions because the Indian economy is not as open uh, to foreign trade as the, the Chinese economy but uh, it's more about how can we bring India as a potential partner in countering uh, Chinese influence in the Indo-Pacific and the effects on that uh, were what, what uh, was really concerning uh, to us because uh, we had expected that a democracy would uh, sideline with uh, uh, us democracies in the West on, on this issue and the Modi government uh, uh, chose not to do so. Now after the um, meeting in Tashkent and the partial mobilization, we've seen another type of reaction coming out. And in this respect, the Chinese reaction, the Indian reaction were more or less similar. That is now a, a first doubt about the reality and the possibility of um, Russia prevailing militarily in Ukraine. And the idea that maybe it's better to be on the side of the international community and of international law, especially when it comes to the potential use of uh, tactical uh, nuclear weapons. So I think uh, for us, in order to influence the course of things in the Pacific, it's very important to make the, these sharp distinctions among, uh, between India and, and China. Fair, fair point. Uh, Masami, how does this look from, from Tokyo? And I should just add, since we're talking about Asian reactions to Ukraine, one of the startling things has been what a strong supporter Japan has been of Ukraine, along with South Korea, but, but, but Japan right from the beginning uh, supporting sanctions and, and in other ways uh, helping Ukraine. What do you think about, about uh, China and, Japan and, uh, and India? Um. Oh, well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak in front of uh, uh, such uh, distinguished guests. And, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine has, at least from our viewpoint, reminded us of the indivisibility of security in Europe and security in the Indo-Pacific region. We view the uh, uh, aggression against uh, Ukraine by Russia a, a kind of a blatant uh, violation of the principles of international law and attempt to change the status quo uh, in a coercive ma manner. And, you know, that kind of unilateral action could potentially occur in other areas as well. 
And unless the international community is united to resist that kind of action, uh, that might uh, 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 have other uh, potential uh, actors miscalculate uh, and they might do the same kind of things in other regions. So, uh, uh, as a member of the G7, Japan has been very active in, and uh, take a lot of responsibility to support the efforts on the part of Ukraine. And uh, with regard to India, uh, we do have a lot of interactions even in the defense field, and uh, we do share uh, the uh, demo democratic principles and other fundamental values with India. And uh, there may be some historical background which uh, lead to some kind of difference, but still we would like to engage in a lot of uh, endeavors, including uh, uh, bilateral or trilateral, or for that matter, quadrilateral military exercises and so on with them, so that we could have a closer uh, relationship with India. Thank you. So uh, I want to direct a, a follow-up question to Tobias because you sit on the uh, Defense uh, Committee in the, in the House of Commons and have access to a wide range of, of information. Um, what do you think the reactions of China and, and India, but more generally of Asian nations, would be if uh, Putin did use tactical nuclear weapons uh, or chemical weapons in the Ukraine conflict? Well, I mean, that's the big question that we now need to face. And unfortunately, uh, Putin has taken advantage of how risk averse, how timid the West has uh, become. We didn't think he would uh, invade and he's done so. We didn't react to uh, Georgia when, the, uh, when parts of that were invaded, nor Crimea or Donbass originally. Go back to Syria and there were some red lines crossed there. So he's exploiting perhaps our collective weakness. I think after 30 years relative peace since the Cold War, we've lost that Cold War statecraft capability of being able to look our adversaries in the eye and stand up to them, but controlling the escalatory ladder to make sure things don't get out of control. We now face a precipice. What do we do if a low yield tactical nuclear weapon might be used? Something very small, not like we've seen 70 odd years ago, uh, but something minute, but it, you'd still be crossing a threshold. And I think as a deterrent, the West needs to think very, very carefully that this idea of strategic ambiguity, of being vague about what you might do, but you might do something, is not strong enough. Putin is on the back foot, he's humiliated, Russia has been intimidated on the international stage, and there's a lot at stake, this is his war, and he could find an excuse, a uh, false flag or whatever, to actually launch or cause some sort of, of, of nuclear uh, attack. And today, now, at this moment, we need to be crafting what our response should be and tell him it should be conventional, probably involving every F-35 in NATO's arsenal, taking out perhaps every asset there is in Ukraine itself. But the danger that we've got is that he's claimed four chunks of uh, eastern Ukraine to be Russian territory, and therefore that being the excuse that he can use to use those, those nuclear weapons. We're in a dangerous era now, and we need to qualify and be strong and stand up to this adversary. The, just getting to the specific question that, that I asked, uh, I'm interested in whether you or anyone else on the panel think that the Chinese reaction, which has been muted, to put it mildly, would change if Russia used, crossed that nuclear threshold and took this war into a different, different stage? That, again, I think is something uh, that China will, Russia will factor in. But what unites Russia and China together is seeing a weak United States and a weak international rules-based order. Because when you talk about openness, transparency, and democracy, that challenges the elitism in Beijing and in Moscow. It would challenge the very existence or continuity of President Xi or President Putin. So they are united in wanting to see a weaker West. So probably China will be upset and, 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 and perhaps affected by this, but in the longevity of time, I think Putin will factor this in to say, actually, I'll get away with it probably. It probably will, they'll say something public about it, but their long-term uh, projection, perhaps to splinter 
uh, our globe into two spheres of competing influence. I'm afraid my view is that Putin has made his decision to try and pivot Russia to point eastwards, to sell his oil and gas uh, and other weapon systems to China uh, in recognition that China will not ask difficult questions and will allow him to continue his activity, whereas the West, we ourselves, need to upgrade uh, our engagement uh, and our willingness to stand up to this. This is a pivotal point. We've entered a new era of insecurity. I'm not quite sure that the West is really appreciative of just where we are and how dangerous our world is becoming. Certainly that, that appreciation grows day by day. Um, so I want to turn to uh, the question of Taiwan. From the beginning of this war, uh, one question that people have asked is what are the lessons of, of the war in Ukraine for the Taiwan Straits conflict uh, if, it should, if it should become a, a, a military conflict? And there are two sides of that, and I'd like to ask the panel to address uh, each. One is what are the lessons for Taiwan in terms of what it buys, how it conducts its economic affairs, uh, what uh, strategic position it takes. The other is what's the lesson for China? Does China see this as an uh, indication that it should move quickly, that it should be cautious uh, and avoid uh, the kind of catastrophe that's befallen Russia. Let me ask uh, Minhua, who's from, from Taiwan, to begin our discussion, but then I'd love opinions from each of you. Thank you. So I think <clears throat> there are economic lessons and political lessons for Taiwan. Economically, we know that Taiwan has relied on China a lot uh, in terms of export and uh, investment. So uh, uh, the economic reliance has declined in recent years, but the U.S.-China trade war has accelerated this economic um, separation, uh, less and less China Taiwanese investment in China. And the outbreak of war has warmed Taiwan even more about the danger of these uh, economic ties with China. Uh, another uh, lesson for Taiwan is that uh, we see that in the beginning of the war, um, Ukraine uh, fight, fought by itself for in the first few days, first uh, few months before a country received the support from the European countries, from the United States. So an uh, important lesson for Taiwan is that we must be able to sustain the war in the first, uh, in the beginning, at least a few weeks for the, may, maybe the major countries may have to reach a consensus how to do with China and the Taiwan. So that's a very important lesson for Taiwan because Taiwan has never experienced war since uh, the end of uh, World War II, since the end of the civil war uh, in China. And uh, so that provides Taiwan a very important lesson that we must be, uh, be careful that uh, China's attack is real and can happen any time in any unexpected moment. And for China, I do think that uh, the, the, the Ukraine war also provides lesson for China is that um, the assumptions applied to Russia today can be applied to China. The difference is that China has greater economic linkage with the international community. So that means if the same assumptions apply uh, to China, China may suffer more than Russia today. And also, um, um, Today, when uh, Russia receives the sanctions, Russia is isolated economically, but Russia has China to support its economy. So China, Russia can have the minimum survival economically. But for China, if China receives the sanction, who is going to support China? So that's a very important question uh, for China. And I believe that Chinese leadership perceive this, um, this danger. They have this concern. So, um, the, the economic uh, is their biggest uh, weakness if they uh, want to launch any war against Taiwan. Thank you. Yes, Tobias. Uh, I've got, I've got to go, so I do apologize. Apologize. Uh, uh, British Airways flight, so I do apologize. Thanks very much indeed. Bye-bye. Thanks to our, our panelists. Let me uh, turn to Nielsen ask. Uh, try to put yourself for the moment in, in the mind of Xi Jinping in Beijing. You've been watching uh, Russia's 
uh, enormous difficulty, uh, one can almost say catastrophe, in trying to uh, subdue this smaller uh, but, but very feisty nation. What's, what's the lesson for, for Xi? Um, is it that he should get even stronger armaments, a bigger army preparing to invade, or that he should think about a way to win Taiwan without war? Well, I guess in, in his place, uh, I would be more on the cautious side uh, of, of the matter. Um, since um, Taiwan over the last decades has got many things right. So they've built up a position as an indispensable provider of uh, high-tech goods, uh, semiconductors and uh, uh, other materials. Uh, they have uh, built up very strong state institutions and they have a very well-equipped modern uh, army at their disposal. So the odds are even uh, uh, more turned against any aggressor, aggressor than in the case of uh, U Ukraine, uh, which uh, had not uh, uh, built up uh, this kind of capacities. And then looking at the aims set by himself and by the Communist Party for the development uh, of the country, um, I would argue that it's a high risk for China to get involved in a full-fledged war in the Indo-Pacific with regard uh, to the uh, objective of becoming uh, a major economic uh, power, superpower, um, because distortion of uh, um, value change and of uh, the international economy as a result of a war in Taiwan uh, would be even more disastrous than in the case of um, uh, Ukraine. And then there's one last point, because we talked about sanctions. Um, um, in 2014, Japan and South Korea did not join the chorus of sanctions uh, against uh, Russia uh, in the aftermath of uh, the annexation of Crimea. This case, they did. And this showed to China how strong the possible uh, reaction of the West could be. And this is also a sort of bet uh, by Japan and South, South Korea in case of an invasion of Taiwan or aggression in the, in the Pacific that Europeans would also join in. And once Japan and South Korea would have elaborated a sanctions regime, they could rightfully expect from us in, the, in, in Europe that we would do the same, that we would follow suit as they did uh, after uh, the uh, attack uh, at the end of February. So, uh, Masao, the, the Japanese government, certainly under uh, Prime Minister Abe and, and now under uh, Prime Minister Kishida, has had a tough-minded view, as near as I can see, about China. Uh, not a lot of illusions about about Beijing and, and its uh, military strength. Do you feel that the United States and the West um, now uh, see the potential dangers from China um, in, a, in a way that's compatible with Japan's view? And if you'd maybe speak a little bit about uh, the interesting new um, organization, if you will, the Quad, which has in it Japan, uh, India, the United States, and Australia in a, not sure just what it is, whether it's a partnership, uh, uh, informal cooperation agreement, but talk a little bit about, about how you see China and how you see the Quad as a force to perhaps constrain Chinese power. Um, from my point of view, what China has been doing, for example, in South China Sea, as well as in East China Sea, um, they have been uh, 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 attempting to change the status quo, and they did, uh, uh, to a certain extent, successful, for example, in South China Sea. And they are kind of uh, increasing their military operational tempo in East China Sea and uh, uh, in, uh, in our neighborhood. So uh, we, are, uh, very, uh, we have a certain degree of concern about what they are doing and doing uh, our, our self-defense forces have engaged in a, uh, very close surveillance operations about what they are doing. So uh, 
I, I'm not sure if it is true that the current administration is more tough-minded against China or not. Uh, we are certainly neighbors and we do have a lot of contacts and there may be some differences, but we have to say what we have to say, tell them, but at the same time, uh, we have to manage our relationship with China, certainly. And uh, speaking of a quad, I do not necessarily, uh, I'm not necessarily so sure what characterization is the most appropriate thing, but you know, the relationship among those four countries ha have been developed in such a way that we could contribute to the free and open Indo-Pacific. That would be a very useful for the uh, prosperity of relevant countries on the, for that matter, uh, global communities. So uh, in, in that, uh, from, uh, from that viewpoint, we have been engaged in a lot of things by those four countries. And, uh, you know, uh, we, so that's kind of uh, uh, our attempt to uh, contribute to the peace and stability in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you. I, I want to turn now to a question that's been very much on uh, the minds of uh, business leaders around the world, uh, and that's the supply of, of semiconductor chips. Uh, Taiwan famously is the world center for manufacturing the highest end uh, chips. In this period of chip shortage, a lot of countries, including the United States, have been spending money to develop their own new chip-making facilities. Uh, Minhua, maybe as a, uh, somebody who follows economics carefully, you could speak uh, uh, first to whether you think Taiwan's chip-making uh, industry is um, vulnerable to Chinese takeover or threats or other manipulation. And second, what Ch uh, Taiwan's reaction has been to the CHIPS Act in America, similar legislation in the EU to provide subsidies for domestic chip making in, in those countries. Yeah, I think this is a very important issue uh, since the outbreak of the pandemic crisis because of the chip shortage. So people started to notice about Taiwan because Taiwan produced over 90% of the advanced chips. Over uh, about 70% of the chips used in the smartphones today is actually put, produced by Taiwan's TSMC. So Taiwan played a very important role in this semiconductor industry. These chips are widely used in almost uh, all kinds of manufactured goods today. Uh, so China has the ambition to uh, take over Taiwan, so that poses uh, the danger, the uh, vulnerability, uh, vulnerability of this supply chain network. If China becomes, uh, has become uh, uh, imp uh, important player in this supply chain network, then we will have to ask China's permission before we can buy all these chips and uh, produce the goods we need today. Uh, so I think uh, nowadays many countries, they have the concerns about the potential um, tension in the Taiwan's trade, may may maybe the outbreak of war in the Taiwan's trade. So they try to um, attract, try to call back all these manufacturing production back to their home countries. But the thing is, um, from the business per perspective, this may not be very cost effective. This is... Uh, um, not, this is not the, uh, over the past few decades, we follow the so-called globalization, global division of labor based on each country's comparative advantage. So nowadays we have uh, national security, national interest concerns. So these concerns uh, outpass the cost considerations. So first of all, if you uh, call back all this manufacturing production, you will, the, the, those countries up there will face uh, very important question that is the higher higher cost uh, to produce the same chips in, in your own country, and also um, if um, we, we we are not sure if the supply chain network uh, disrupted due, during the pandemic crisis between countries, but there could be also a disruption of supply chain network in the domestic uh, production line as well. Uh, so this is a very, it is still a question under debate. And uh, I think over the past few, few decades, uh, the global division of labor we constructed is based on the um, greater trade and the 
investment liberalization. This is like uh, every country agreed to do so. This there is a global consensus, formal or informal. Uh, this is like a global trend. Today, if we want to reverse this global trend, I think we need to have uh, also a global kind of global consensus. How should we do to to uh, best secure our national interest, each country's uh, national security. At the same time, we don't uh, co we don't need to spend uh, so much money on rebuilding another supply chain network. Um, we don't cause trouble. We still want the economy to continue to prosper, to develop. At the same time, we. I also understand we have the national security, so I think uh, there is a need for uh, every country to uh, find out, to look for the balance between the national security and the economic interest. Thank you. So uh, we're getting uh, down to just uh, 10 minutes or so left. I'm going to turn to the audience for your questions in a minute. Not quite yet, but, uh, but I'm glad that uh, people are thinking of them. I have one more question that I want to ask to, to Neil Schmidt. Um, so uh, there has been a question in the United States uh, uh, for, for many years whether U.S. and European interests differ when it comes to China. There's been a, an argument, say a fear among many, that Europeans uh, see their economic interests, their trade interests with China as being so important that they would be reluctant uh, to engage in the kind of um, uh, uh, competitive behavior, um, consider the kinds of constraints the U.S. Uh, really is advocating these days from both parties. So I, the simple question is, do you think the U.S and Germany specifically are aligned today and have a similar view of China and the potential threat that China poses? Uh, certainly, Germany has been a latecomer in the China debate and it took some time for German, German uh, policymakers to understand the comprehensiveness of the China challenge. But I think since Biden took over, um, alignment has uh, taken place. And there's no talk of decoupling in Washington any longer. Uh, and there's a convergency of views on China and on both side, uh, sides of the Atlantic. So what I call the Holy Trinity is now the guiding principle. So you have systemic rivalry, competition and cooperation. And within this Holy Trinity, uh, the China strategy on, uh, in Europe and in America is spelled out. It takes for us more time to disentangle uh, uh, from, from, chi from the Chinese market, that's for sure. But on the other side, there are also huge opportunities for cooperation because after all, the European single market is the most attractive market in the world. The EU is a regulatory superpower, so when we start investment green screening, when we start public procurement uh, limitations, when we start maybe outbound investment uh, controls, when we start uh, anti-coercion uh, uh, instruments. Uh, so this really makes a difference. So F I think this all bleeds for much closer cooperation between the US and Germany and Europe on, on, this, uh, on this account. Yeah. Thank you. So let me now turn to the audience, the gentleman in the first row, uh, if you'd uh, identify yourself and then if you have a particular person you'd like to direct the question to, please, please state that. Jacek Kaczewski, I'd like to ask a question to Minister Oka regarding relations with North Korea. Uh, as I understand, your Prime Minister has declared that he is willing to meet uh, Mr. Kim uh, without any preconditions, and uh, that also uh, uh, he's willing to settle with South Korea. Uh, some outstanding historical matters that they are. Uh, he is open to discussion on, on settling all those matters. So could you comment on that? Because uh, North Korea uh, supplying arms to uh, Ukraine, to Russia, to, to in the fight uh, in Ukraine, it's all, it's all interconnected. Um, on North Korea, you know, uh, from the viewpoint of the security of Japan, they have conducted six nuclear testing already 
uh, they conducted new signal testing already in the past, and uh, they have uh, tested a lot of uh, uh, ballistic missiles. And uh, particularly this year, they have uh, they launched ballistic missiles at an unprecedented pace. And I left Tokyo yesterday, as a matter of fact, right after the their launch of IRBM class or higher level uh, ballistic missiles uh, flew over the territory of Japan. And that's a kind of a uh, very much uh, 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 something we cannot tolerate at all from the viewpoint of the security of Japan and to, from the viewpoint of protecting the, uh, defend, uh, uh, the, uh, our country and so on. And uh, th those uh, missile threats certainly have a very important impact, not only in Japan, but they are also uh, uh, engaged in developing ICBM capabilities, which could uh, at least uh, potentially reach European countries as well. So uh, I, I think uh, it, it would be very important from our viewpoint to uh, 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 have a unity of the international community, including the, including the United Security Council, to uh, have a effective measures against North Korea. And uh, speaking of uh, uh, South Korea, uh, you know, I, probably I'm not necessarily in a good position representing only the Ministry of Defense to talk about the entire Japan ROK relationship. But, uh, you, you know, uh, there are certain uh, issues between the two countries, but as a, a, a very important neighbor, uh, I think uh, uh, we have been engaged in a diplomatic uh, uh, consultations with ROK so that we could reach some kind of uh, 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 some kind of uh, good understanding between the two sides, I believe. Ed, let me just to clarify, I wasn't sure whether your uh, prime minister is prepared for open-ended discussions with Kim or, or not? Uh, with Kim Jong-un. Uh, I think what he basically said is he is prepared, uh, uh, I'm not sure, I precisely remember what he said, but he is prepared to uh, talk without conditions to meet and discuss issues between the two countries. And obviously we have a very important agenda which is the abduction issue. And that is a very important issue for our government and for our country as a whole. So that's something uh, what our Prime Minister may have mentioned. Thank you. Yes, in the second row, please. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Maria Berlinska. Uh, I'm a Ukrainian war veteran. When war started in 2014, uh, I was a student and uh, uh, I had to join to the army on volunteer basis and became a specialist in air reconnaissance and I'm a drone operator. But my question will be not about weapons. Uh, we will discuss here about weapons, drones, how to protect Ukraine. Uh, but my question will be about a different thing. You know, uh, sorry, I'm nervous a little bit. Oh, please. Uh, during past uh, seven months, I lost a, a lot of my friends. Some of them, uh, some of them tortured and uh, killed uh, in, in very horrible way. Uh, a lot of my friends who, uh, sisters in arms, uh, women, they, 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 a lot of them raped, a lot of uh, children killed. Uh, and uh, I understand that this war for us, as, as well as for Taiwan, is about existing, how, how, to, uh, how, to, uh, how to exist in this world. But you know, sir, when war started, uh, I did, I joined to the army. I'm pacifist by myself, but I, have, I had to join to the army because uh, of my people of Ukrainian people. I did believe that I have to protect my country, it's my duty. But as of now, in 2022, I, I did understand that I, uh, I do everything not, not for my country, not for my people. At the end of the day, after bomb shelling 
and uh, after I did uh, under uh, a lot of uh, artillery attacks, I understood that I'm, I, I do everything for my soul. Let me just, we're moved, deeply moved by your story. Do you have a question for our yeah, panel? Yeah, my, my question here, one, one simple question. Uh, at the end of the day, we all here are not people from Japan or America or from, from, from Poland and, and so on. Everyone, we are humans here. And everything that i done, I, I, I do for my soul. Because at the end of the day, I will die, sooner or later. Be because of Russian shelling, because of Russian bombs, because we are discussing nukes. Let me, we're over time now, so I'm going to have to ask you, the, the, we, we, as I say, we're, we're very moved. I'm going to turn, turn this back to the because panel. Thank you. Because we're discussing nukes as, as usual things. And uh, sooner or later, Putin will strike us. And I, I know that he will strike us by nukes, by tactical or strategical nukes, doesn't matter. I'm not, not politician. I don't understand all these high geopolitical things. But I would like to ask all of you, let's do everything for our souls. Let's protect Ukraine for your souls. We all d will die. And at the end of the day, I would like to, you to, to, to pass with free soul, free hearts, with love in your hearts. And with this feeling that you Ma die Madam, every I, single I've got to ask you. So, Ma I've got to ask you now, now please, da thank you so much da for what da you said. Da we've, da got da it. we've got to ask you now to, to sit down. Thank you. Thank you. My, my ask is, please, please tell me what we have to do to, to protect innocent people in my country and all over the world. Okay. So I, I, does anybody want to take a, a response to that? If not, we're going to go to one more question. Okay, so um, uh, let's uh, go to the uh, woman there, and this is the last question, then we'll come back to our panel. Uh, uh, thank you. Sorry. Uh, I'm Olena Tregup, uh, Independent Defense Anti-Corruption Commission uh, from Ukraine. Uh, my question um, is very simple. I'm, I'm really curious, as a Ukrainian, uh, to be a Selwood who left, he said that uh, maybe Russia attacked because um, Euro Atlantic uh, community was perceived as weak uh, by Putin. And I wonder, uh, my question is to our democratic friends from uh, Taiwan, from Japan. Uh, your societies in uh, Japan, in Taiwan, as of today, as of October 22, do you think that the Western uh, support for Ukraine is good enough to help us win? or you still think that it's not strong enough? What, what, what is the position of majority? Good, good final question, and let's ask each uh, member of the panel to make uh, closing comments and answering that. Minhua, why don't you start? I will just give a very brief uh, final word. I think uh, I'm very touched to what this girl just uh, mentioned about. I think international uh, uh, solidarity is very important. Uh, to support Ukraine, to support the weak countries like uh, Ukraine and Taiwan. Taiwan nowadays is a peaceful place, but who knows what will happen in the future. So by showing the support to Ukraine, it is also a way to deter China from uh, their uh, military ambition toward Taiwan. Thank you. Niels, uh, closing thought? Well, first of all, let me uh, stress that uh, Ukraine, as you mentioned, is not only fighting for its uh, national sovereignty, it's, it's uh, a fight for humanity. And that's why we all side with uh, uh, Ukraine. And that's why the durability of our support, military, economic, uh, diplomatic for Ukraine, is of utmost importance. And in democratic societies, in order to maintain this level of support, we of course need support from our own people. And that's why with the rising energy prices, it's, it's so important that in, in Europe, uh, governments offer subsidies, help uh, for households and for companies in order to preserve employment and uh, a, a decent uh, standard of living. And so for, there's, a foreign, uh, there's a domestic foreign policy nexus in our own countries as well. But we are ready to invest lots of money to maintain this level of support in order to preserve lives in Ukraine, that's for sure. Yes, Mr. Um, 
uh, as I said at the, at the outset, uh, we cannot tolerate such blatant act of uh, aggression against Ukraine, uh, disregarding the principles of international law. So we have been uh, uh, energy, uh, strongly support the uh, Ukraine. And uh, as far as Ministry of Defense is concerned, we provided certain, we have provided certain types of equipment to Ukraine. But uh, we will continue to consult closely with the international community. There are various forums where we are discussing how we can support Ukraine. And uh, we would like to continue our support to the best of our ability. So let me bring this uh, to a close. I want to thank uh, our panelists, including uh, Mr. Elwood, who I, I hope is on the way to the airport. And I also want to just close by, by thanking the member of our audience who reminded us of the intense uh, human suffering that's a part of this story that we've been talking about these two days, uh, the, the cost of it for individuals. Uh, so th thank you for, for sharing that with us. And thank, thank you all. on board a Mercedes-Benz. A glimpse at your smartwatch and our intelligence system activates. A cool breeze, change of lighting, a massage, and a bouquet of citrus and... Jasmine. Lovely, yes. Our Dolby Atmos system transforms into a 360 fully immersive soundscape. Meaning music comes from here, here, and here. Upgrade your experience with... Hey, Mercedes. Loading your profile, Jen. Playlist on. Seat adjusted. Temperature. Cool. Battery. Check. Stop over for charge. Set. Magic, isn't it? Innovations by Mercedes-Benz. So... A message there from one of the partners of this year's Warsaw Security Forum. Now, we are a little behind schedule again, but that's the nature of these events. There's so much to discuss, it's really hard to, uh, to keep it contained. So we're about 20 minutes over time. I'm not going to, uh, to dwell then. I'll just introduce our next moderator in the session. It's uh, a panel discussion looking at how the Kremlin might impact Western democratic societies and political parties moving forward. Uh, the session is held in partnership with the Wilfried Martins Center for European Studies, and it is moderated by Peter Heffela, Policy Director at the Wilfried Martins Center for European Studies. The stage is yours. Good afternoon and a very warm welcome, ladies and gentlemen, here in the room and online and YouTube and Facebook. My name is Peter Hefle. I'm very delighted to chair this session. I'm with the Martin Center and we are a strategic partner of the Russian Security Forum. The topic of our discussion is the end of populist area and it's an ambitious topic. As ambitious as our time frame, so we will keep very closely in time, and there is a roughly 30 minutes discussion among the panelists, which I will in brief introduce later on, and then of course you are cordially invited to share your opinions of roughly 10 minutes. Well, I must admit, I was tempted a bit to answer the question, <laughs> the two questions to be precise, um, 
very easily by my own because it's also my own business in Brussels. Well, the first question would be, uh, no, there is no end of populist era. I'm definitely sure that that will continue. And, well, the Kremlin either will stop its activities. So, but this is not something which you are interested in, my opinion, so to say, but I'm delighted to have way more better experts here on the panel. I'm very delighted to have three politicians very actively from Ukraine, from Germany, from Poland, and our general Ben Hodges, who lived in the US and in Germany, so spanning European and American perspectives at the same time. Well, let me begin with the two politicians, Mrs. Klempusch and Mrs. Özegun. Um, we in Western democracies have faced tremendous challenges and changes during the last 20 years, and there are some common developments, I would say, uh, we have to share that's the weakening of the centrist left and centrist right movements, the People's Party concept, the rise of extremists both on the left and the right side, and a revolution, for example, in communication spaces. But we have seen other threats uh, coming from outside. And this has been a more shocking development. There had been powers, authoritarian powers, interfering in our core political processes, such as elections, corruption politicians, distorting public and virtual spaces. The methods are very sophisticated, um, ambitious, and very adaptable. And if it had not been so to the detriment of our societies, it would consider it great admiration. So let me get into the first question. Uh, did the war in Ukraine change the way, or maybe other powers, not only the Kremlin, in how to interfere into the political scene in Europe? Or have we become now more resilient? Did we learn something on these permanent impacts and are more aware of the strings the Kremlin and other authoritarian forces are drawing? Ladies, what is your opinion? Maybe, Mrs. Klempusch, we start with you being one of the hardest hit victims and later on to Germany because we have relevant cases in Germany as well. Mrs. Klempusch, please. Well, thank you, and thank you to everybody who is uh, joining this session. Uh, well, I think answer to your questions um, are both yes and no, because definitely um, we, we will not see the, and we are not seeing the end of the populist era at this particular moment, and unfortunately we also do not see that um, those governments and those forces that have been trying to impact internally on, on the politicians, societies, uh, different stakeholders um, across Europe or across the free world, that they are going to give up on that. Uh, they will continue doing that, they will continue attacking, uh, and uh, they will not resist the tools that they have been using before. So they will continue buying politicians. It might be that it will cost more a little bit, because uh, being you know, on the side of um, total evil has, uh, is, is becoming uh, not fashionable. And, uh, but at the same time, uh, they will not give up on, on using those tools. And unfortunately, uh, if we are talking about our resilience, uh, we can say, yeah, we have become maybe, um, mm, we, we have started looking with more sobriety on some of the processes. We have been shocked in many of the communities uh, to learn something that we Ukrainians have been uh, saying for years and years by now. And uh, it was just going as the water in the, in the sand, you know. I, I remember how many conferences I attended and tr was trying to warn about those things that, are, that have been happening, that are happening, that, that unfortunately are continuing to happen. Uh, but that was not taken as seriously as, uh, as it is being taken right now when people are seeing the atrocities, the, the, uh, the, the real face of the, um, of, of the Russian aggression. Uh, so we are only working on our resilience. I would not be uh, kind of um, calming down in terms of um, being, um, recognizing that we, we have already reached the, the resilience level, unfortunately. And um, I think some of the mistakes that we are making at this particular point are actually not helpful in terms of building that resilience. For example, what do I mean? And maybe that, that will bring us and bridge us to the, to the German experience. Because I, for example, think 
that not expelling uh, Mr. Schroeder from a uh, social democratic party means a big, big mistake. And that paves the way additionally to, um, you know, to encouragement and indulgement of Kremlin to use those tools that he has been, that they have been using before. Or for example, when we are talking um, about how some of the states like Hungary are taking hostage um, yet another um, level of the, of the sanctions package in the EU and not coming with the harsh response to those countries um, by protecting values where I think that values should actually come first, we are making another mistake. That is actually continuing our vulnerability as opposed to producing our common resilience. Thank you very much. Uh, well, the bridge to Germany has all been laid and, well, Germany is in a quite awkward situation to some extent. Uh, you as the Vice President of the German Bundestag, you had also been victim, of course, of attacks to the core of our political institution, the Parliament. So what lessons Germany has learned? What can we share in the wider European context? You know, the European Commission is also very much aware and had set up steps to protect our political space and core political issues. Well, I think there are a lot of lessons to be learned, um, as you said, and um, I might say, first of all, I mean, especially to you that uh, you're absolutely right that we didn't understand everything in the last years and we made a lot of mistakes and we know that. Um, and on the other hand, I would say, um, or maybe I would start to answer your question with, Populism will always be as long as mankind is there. The question is from who against who, and how can we maybe um, have more solidarity among each other? And um, this is why I am telling this, you know, like we have to learn our lesson. But let me tell you just one experience. Um, I, I arrived last night, and this morning I attended a panel and um, first of all, I heard there a, uh, a sentence like, uh, Germany is an enemy. And I was really shocked, you know. I, I was kind of, you know, I know this from German parliament, but I know this normally from right-wing people who transport Russian um, stories even into our parliament. And I wasn't really, um, well, prepared to hear it here. And I thought, how far is it going, you know? I, I was convinced when I came here that in among the EU, especially with Ukraine, of course, but among EU countries, we are getting closer now, and we, we should be closer now. We should work according, you know, our plan really against Russia and to help Ukraine. And this is something that um, um, I saw that maybe it doesn't, work in all aspects. And what we should look at is um, why is there or why are there still these stories and what can we do against it? One is for certain that we have to address the things, we have to speak about them and, you know, just not to be, um, yeah, just to know about how we are acting together. On the other side, Germany has this Zeitenwende, you know, that um, some people ask, of course, what does it really mean? Is it something that the chancellor said and what are you going to do? And I think, you know, um, or maybe I can tell you that this is something that even in Germany we have been discussing for several years, but it hasn't really been being done, you know, like to have more um, for our defense, to do more for our defense structure, for, to do more for energy. And um, we definitely had these mistakes um, for sure. But now it was Chancellor um, Scholz who said we will totally change our energy um, policy and our structure, and there we need Europe. And I'm convinced that if we can overcome these kind of stories against each other, and if we can really rely on each other, then European countries, especially Poland, Germany, and others, can play a very important role to overcome this kind of um, populism, this kind of populism, and to be a good partner for Ukraine. 
Well, General Hodges, uh, you live in the US now and in Germany. You have both worlds apart, and we had an interesting discussion yesterday also on transatlantic relations in this respect, bunging the ball forth and back from the US, and we all know this polarized political situation in the US, and much of the stories go to the US, come back to Europe. Russia is perfectly playing this game. So what are your experiences uh, in both, having lived in both societies and closely observing, of course, what's going on? What about the resilience in the US, for example, lessons to be learned from there? Well, first of all, I don't know who that very young guy is uh, up in the, uh, <laughs> that, was, that was several years ago. <laughs> uh, so look, for, first for some context, um, in about a year from now, we are not going to be worrying about the Kremlin spending all their effort and resources trying to undermine us because they are going to be fighting for their own survival. Uh, Ukraine is going to push Russian forces uh, out of Crimea by next summer. Uh, I don't even think Vladimir Putin will still be in power. And uh, we should be thinking about what comes after that. And hopefully it's somebody that we can, in fact, deal with. I'm not keeping my hopes alive for that. But it'll be a different kind of threat to us. I, I can't describe it. I would also say this is the last winter, the last winter, we will not have to worry next winter about Russia using gas to harm us or disrupt energy supplies in Europe. They played the gas card too soon. Germany very quickly, I very well uh, adjusted, um, have storage capacity. I, I live in Frankfurt, so I hear from my German neighbors. At first, it was like, oh my God, it's going to be terrible. Now you hear people joke about, I'm going to get a new Mutza, you know, and yes, this winter will be hard and expensive, but that's it. So, so we have to, so the point is, we have to toughen up a little bit. I mean, we have all become quite spoiled in the United States and frankly in much of Western Europe. We've had it pretty good. Um, so the lesson is, uh, be more uh, resilient. I mean, kind of the way our parents were and our grandparents. They would be embarrassed to see the whining that we and our kids do uh, today, I think, if things get a little bit uncomfortable. Now, the United States, we are very vulnerable to this kind of influence that has been coming from the Kremlin. I mean, all of you see it. I imagine as I look out there, probably at least three quarters of you have been to the States for school or holiday or work or, or whatever. Um, and democracy is not a ballet. I mean, it's more like rugby. It's hard all the time. And uh, I hear people sometimes like, oh my God, it's unprecedented. I've never seen the United States like this. We had a civil war 160 years ago that killed almost a million people. So it has been a lot worse. And I would ask you to uh, don't give up on your American friends. Uh, it'll never be perfect. Um, and uh, being such an open society, um, you are vulnerable. Um, but I can still remember when I was in the seventh grade, so that would be, uh, I would have been 11 years old, so uh, 60, 1969, uh, not exactly, you know, the most peaceful time in American domestic history. Uh, and my teacher, Mrs. McKendry, said, Ben, you have got to have more than one source for news. Now, this is about 100 years before iPhones and the internet and all that, okay? And she was telling me, you have to have more than one source for your news. You can't read just the local Tallahassee newspaper or Life magazine or U.S. News and World Report was the magazine that I really depended on when I was a kid. Uh, and we had three TV channels. So even then, she was saying it's our responsibility in a democratic society to inform yourself. And if you just look at one thing and you're so vulnerable to manipulation. And the last point I would make, of course, the attempt by the Kremlin has been about causing us to lose trust and confidence in our institutions. Right now, the Supreme Court, confidence in the Supreme Court in the United States is the lowest I have ever seen in my life because it has become so uh, politicized. When, when the former president talks about, those are my judges, those were Obama judges, I mean, that's a grossest violation of his constitutional oath I could imagine. 
because they're not his judges. Unfortunately, uh, many people thought they are, and that's going to influence the U.S. elections that are happening in November. Many, millions of people are going to vote for a guy in the state of Georgia who was a legendary football player. He has paid for multiple abortions himself, but yet he is a, a pro-life advocate. And so people are going to vote for him without caring about all of these other problems and integrity because they want one more Senate vote to try and make sure that uh, they can uh, pack the Supreme Court. So th this is the problem for us. We're very vulnerable because people are losing confidence in the Supreme Court. Um, when you have a, a president or other politicians start talking about, I mean, months before the election, I'm not so sure that we can be confident about the outcome. <laughs> you can be sure that the election two years ago was the most closely watched, fairest, most uh, accurate election we've had in our history because the entire world was watching to see if there are any problems in it. So th this is the, the uh, effort to undermine our confidence in those sort of things is for real. Well, I appreciate very much your optimism. I think we should put you more to the German marketplaces because, Ms. Ozegund, we have huge debates and fears of a cold winter and further undermining the resilience and resistance and the unity of Europeans against the Russian aggression. Um, but, Sigmund, um, we're facing a lot of elections over the next two years, and your home country is among one of them. Um, the attacking of this core political process, elections, voting, corrupting politicians, is a big issue. Do you think that um, the stories will be kept on, maybe changed, or are we in, eff in efforts to limit the impacts of these kind of disinformation? Are we going too wide, too far, um, restricting the open space of debate, labeling others as pro-Russians or fascist or whatever we have heard around that, or the same goes for the left side. Do you think that we have already found the balance of limiting discussion, protecting ourselves, or did we go too far? You know, I think it will be very difficult, you know, to, to solve this situation, to heal it instantly. I think that first of all, we should uh, really concentrate on some basic totally fundamental things right now. And you asked uh, the question if uh, there is a chance that there is the end or we are near the end of the populist era. Of course we are not. Of course we are not. We are in the middle of it. Because every populism feeds on two things, two factors. First is frustration of people. And second is, I would say, inability of these mainstream political parties to address social issues, to address these frustrations. And when people see that there is no answer to the real questions, or sometimes they are not maybe, sometimes they are not real, they are inspired by some, I don't know, trolls from the internet, you know, trying to do a little mess here and there. Uh, but if uh, this mainstream politics is enabled to answer, they will be trying to look for the answer somewhere else. And these guys of Putin working in the internet very hard from Minsk, from St. Petersburg, they are ready, you know, thousands of them thousands of fake troll accounts, uh, um, you know, everywhere in the internet, in Polish Twitter, in probably in German Twitter as well, in Ukrainian uh, um, internet, they are just everywhere. First thing we have to do right now is to stabilize the fundament again. We should stabilize the, 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 the basic level, you know, we should take the oxygen out of this process, you know? We should suffocate them to death. I mean these trolls, these, uh, these, uh, these guys from this Putin stable, because they are not able to attack us from outside. They want to destroy us from inside by divisions, by creating instant divisions amongst us. So if you will ask me what is the, the, the answer and what is the, 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 the healing, what is the idea, how to fix it, I would say that first of all we should 
be, um, we should know that they are doing these things with us. We should be, you know, um, we, we should know it every time we are opening the internet, every time we are opening a mailbox, every time we are opening TV, we are turning on TV. We should uh, be careful and uh, we should be together because for divisions, this is only one healing I know. It's being together, working together. Look at the situation in Europe after Second World War. Look at Schumann and other father founders of European unions. They saw the disaster of the Second World War and they thought to themselves, okay, uh, we don't want it to happen again, never again. What should we do then? We should cooperate, we should trade, we should uh, make, uh, you know, this uh, European community of steel and coal and then European Union. I think we are in a very similar moment right now, after this Putin's war started in February. Right now, we should think again, what should we do together uh, uh, if we want, we, if we don't want these uh, things to happen again. And I would say that the first, the most important thing is to make a green transformation again. Uh, you know, here in Poland, we right now are facing very difficult situation because of the prices of the energy, of, uh, you know, of the electric energy, of, the, of, of gas, of everything. And people will be not... Uh, they will not feel very comfortable and very stable with it. And you will have a very wide field, you know, to, to inspire it from the bottom, you know, some movements, uh, some, some aggression, uh, uh, some divisions. And we will be probably seeing a lot of it uh, uh, in this uh, coming winter. So first, green transformation. And the second thing, together, because together is much easier to, to do this. And the second thing, we should rethink European Union, not on, because this, this should not only be the common trade zone, but we should think about our military potential, our defense potential. Uh, we should be ready to defend ourselves. That's great that we have this great uh, ally uh, in the United States. That's really great that we have NATO. But we have to ask ourselves the question, how to prepare to defense here on European continent and how to make Ukraine member of NATO, member of European Union as soon as possible, mm -hmm. because this is the matter of our safety, not only their safety. Well, Mr. Klimpers, uh, Ukraine has shown an incredible increase of resilience, of unity, well, further impacts from outside, but I think, could you describe us a bit what happened in your society and maybe lessons, we talked about a lot of lessons in these events, could be drawn also from, uh, for Western European societies, which we consider maybe as the most vulnerable one and most affected by disinformation, by Kremlin, by Chinese forces, whatever. Maybe some short remarks, some short reflections on that. You know, I think that one of the things that will be started, studied after the end of this war and after our victory, with your assistance and with your help, is um, the resilience of the Ukrainian society and the horizontal ties that the Ukrainian people have managed to very quickly uh, build upon. And I think that that is something that irrespectively of um, working institutions, which are, I think, incredibly important for our actually resilience to populism, to, to all the other um, ch um, shaking kind of things that, that might happen to, to our democracies and so on. Uh, I think this um, incredible texture of the society um, has proven to be one of our major strengths. And I think uh, that that is something to, uh, as it that will be taken away as a lesson, positive lesson learned. But you know, I wanted to, to a little bit just reflect on, on what was said. I would like to, to share um, General Hodges' um, optimism. <laughs> and uh, I do believe that, uh, I do believe that with, it's in our common interest to stay united, to stay together. And it is not only about survival, uh, of Ukraine. It is definitely about our survival and our uh, continued existence on the map of the world, but it's also about survival of the Western civilization. If you stay united, you and we all win, win together. And we have to ensure uh, 
that actually that um, gas station that pretends to be to be uh, the country uh, stops receiving these billions and billions of, of uh, dollar, dollars of indulgement or euros indulgement uh, for its ener energy resources, uh, that it stops having access to, to any technology, uh, real technology, that this Karpagan has to be destroyed. And uh, I don't mean physically destroyed necessarily. I mean weakened to that point that they cannot attack in any way, not through trolls, not through economic um, impact, not through military means. But I think that we are not there yet, altogether, understanding. And we, are, we have not crossed the line altogether of agreeing that it's not only that Russia cannot win this war, that it is about Russia being defeated in this war and that has to be our common goal and we are not there yet so i think bringing all the societies with all the understanding that it might be hard that um you are paying with money with uh, some un uncomfort uh with uh, some you know maybe less heat in your in your homes in this winter for something that you believe in and uh, this is the easiest price one can pay to preserve the future, to ensure that whatever you are having uh, and taking for granted today is there for your children and for your grandchildren tomorrow. And I think that that is also a lesson learned from us Ukrainians because, um, you know, we are not counting what exactly we are paying and we are paying dearly, unfortunately, mm. in lives and in and, and, and tortures, in, in destruction and, and so on. Uh, but we know why. We know what we want to achieve and we believe in our goal. So we want to get everybody on board, believing in the goals, in the good, in the laws, in the international law, in the order, so that we can preserve the way of life that we are, um, that uh, you are still enjoying here. Mm. Thank you. I liked very much your expression of the texture of a society, and Mr. Zugun, that is something which we should think about as well in, in rebuilding probably institutions, cohesion in our society. Um, and Ben Hodges, I think this is an issue which is as relevant for the United States as well, to get this sense of, of community, of belonging together, sharing common goals as well. That is, I think, one of the most effective measures to strengthen our immune system against these threats, which will continue, definitely. Well, our, our leaders have to keep reminding us, you know, what, what is really important. And it's, it's a huge burden on any elected official to try to bring together everybody when they're thinking politically also. I mean, this is just the nature of it. But to find those things uh, and reinforce those things that remind us what we care about. And what, you know, I'm appalled that we have millions of Americans that are still asking, like, why are we in Europe? Why, why should we support Ukraine when this is about, uh, not just about Ukraine, it's about democracy versus autocracy. And it's to America's interest that Europe is stable and secure because when Europe is prosperous, America is prosperous. And then, of course, the Chinese are watching. They're waiting to see if we crack the West, if we cannot bear up against the uh, economic pressure from Russia, then the Chinese will not be too impressed with anything that we say about Taiwan or the South China Sea. So this is, this is all um, connected and our leaders have to kind of help make sure we do remain coherent so that we're not as vulnerable. This is a good one. <laughs> Comments on that from the German perspective? on this cohesion and increasing maybe some comments from the German discussion, which is quite intense these days. Well, yeah, I mean, actually, we started with it already, but um, of course, this is one of the most important things to, to just assure us and to know what we are defending. It's Ukraine, of course, but it's the way of life we have. It's our freedom. It's the values that we have. I mean, we're defending so much, and we started with populism. And how can we really um, fight against populism? I mean, you gave us so many examples. And... Uh, EU started and NATO too to fight against it in a way, maybe let's say in a conservative way, you know, like we banned Sputnik, we banned Russia today, but that's not the media of today, right? I mean, we have the internet and how much do we really support those guys 
who, you know, just started by themselves to bring up all the fake news, to tell us what is going wrong in the internet. It wasn't really the states who really, you know, in the very beginning supported them. It was just people from the societies who did it. And it's people from our societies who are friends, who are supporting each other. I mean, just look mm. how many Polish people um, host and support Ukrainians, how many Germans do it. And um, it, it, this is so important to see that the friendships are still there. And I think maybe one thing is also important because I heard this. It's like, you know, when, when people are friends, there's nothing wrong about this. I mean, you have Ukrainians and Russians who are friends, who are families. You have like... Where? Excuse me? Who were friends? Who were, okay, yes. I think, I mean, still there are probably people very sad about, you know, like they split. I know um, families who split because of this war. This is so, um, yeah, it's a real tragedy. And we have to be clear on whose side we are. And we are clear on the side of Ukraine, and we are cl clearly on the side of our values. And this is something, of course, it's being also discussed in Germany. But again, I hope that as European nations, this brings us closer together, which does not mean that we don't discuss the things, you know, like mistakes and things that has been done in the, in the past. Absolutely, we have to do that. And as you said, um, in 2014, when Putin um, talked in the Munich security um, conference, I, I just, you know, when I watch this again, I really don't know why nothing happened. I mean, it, almost nothing happened. Mm -hmm. you, you said, you know, like how um, um, dangerous this all is, and we just have to admit nothing happened. I mean, my grandmother uh, was a Tatar from Crimea, so it was weird for me to see, you know, there's something going on and we're just all living our normal day life, right? And of course we have to work on this, but this shouldn't hinder us to, you know, stay together, to stick together, and to not let Putin have this kind of, um, let's say, success that he brings us apart, you know, that he tears us apart. We, we have to stick together and we have to be quite clear that whenever something like a, a war happens or su such a tragedy happens, we are a real power all together. Mm -hmm. I mean, also with the US, of course, we always need the support of the US, no doubt, but we are a real power and we stick together. And this is something that I really want to just stress so much. Mm -hmm. you know? Before I would like to give you the opportunity for a couple of questions, uh, Sigmund, I see you're about to say something. Yes, because um, I've heard a lot of very important things uh, and uh, from all of you, and I know that we uh, have a lot of things, a very long list to do externally, right? We should be together. Uh, we should defeat Putin together. Uh, we should make this green transformation together. Uh, we should build up our... Uh, for, our common potential together. But I uh, once more want to underline this uh, inside, inner factor, because, uh, uh, because it's very important for the resilience of every society, any society. It's very important, uh, th this integrity of the society is the crucial and fundamental thing when you are playing games with guys like Putin. Uh, who is very good at this game of making the vision. So once again, I want to tell that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the one of the most important and difficult lesson to be learned by politicians right now is to show people again that unanimity in this liberal democracies we are all living in, it's, it's the utopia. We should not avoid the difference between us, differences between us. We should not avoid the conflicts between us. We should civilize the conflicts. We should uh, learn how to discuss again. We should learn how to, uh, you know, make confrontations of our positions uh, again in a civilized way. Mm -hmm. uh, because, uh, because these guys like Putin and the other dictators, they are trying to make a sect. Every time they are trying to make a political party, the sect is the pro 
final product of it, right? Mm -hmm. And they want our nations to be sects, and they want to be leaders of their religious sects. We cannot allow, allow them to do this. I can quote uh, the, my, my very last word, very last sentence. I can quote, uh, probably Yuval Noah Harari said that, that in any society, uh, if, uh, you see that um, some politician, I don't know, president, prime minister, whoever, reaches the level of 70% of support. There are only two explanations. This is a war or this is not a liberal democracy, right? Uh, we should learn again how to be together with all our differences mm -hmm. and then we will be stronger. Then we will be stronger. It will be much less pressure inside this teapot. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I hope that uh, we are very close to this moment. And I hope that we won't waste this crisis. As Churchill said, never waste a good crisis, right? So, so we are just a step uh, from it. And I, I really want to share this hope of Ivana and Gen General Hodges uh, that the next year will be, after this terrible winter, which is coming, the next year will be the spring of hope. We will ex experience the summer of hope and we will mm. experience the beginning of the complete new era in the history of Europe and the world. Well, mm. These issues you mentioned, this is a topic, I think, even for next year because it raises far more fundamental challenges. But I have a gentleman here uh, too, and I think I have to limit it. Well, if you keep all your answers very short, then I get more. Please. Well, Jan Farfall, European Studies Center, University of Oxford, thank you for all your interesting points. I would like to relate to the topic of this discussion, albeit from a different perspective, namely uh, with the war going on in Ukraine, but also with the ongoing hybrid war going on the Polish-Belarusian border. To what extent do you think that the geopolitical considerations in the region will overshadow the democratic considerations. So um, from the eyes of our partners, the need for a stable regime that will be actively countering the Kremlin's influence versus mm -hmm. the performance of the democratic society. Thank you. I add the other comments to, for the sake of the time. Um, well, thank gentlemen, you had been first and then the two others, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Jakub Knop. I'm from University of Warsaw. Uh, so I'd like to direct my question to General Hodges and uh, I'd like to ask about the issue of bolstering uh, the resilience uh, in Western societies and shaping strategic culture. And so I was wondering if uh, measures such as conscription or creating a proper civilian defense in Western NATO countries could be, you know, possible solutions to improve those areas. And I think that we're lucky that Finland is about to join NATO because it, it could really act as an example for other Western uh, countries uh, on how to improve resilience of the whole society and really integrate uh, civilians with uh, military. So that's my question, thank you. Well, thank you, I take the other two ones. The gentleman here, please. And the lady then after, but short, please. Hello, my name is Aditya Nair and I'm a master's student at the University of Bologna. My question is very short. Uh, I would just like to know what do the speakers think will be the future impact, Kremlin's impact on the democratic peace theory? Mm, thank you. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, could you repeat the last? We, we didn't get it here. Oh, what, is, what will be the Kremlin's impact on the democratic peace theory? Peace theory? Yeah, democratic peace theory by Immanuel Kant, which is basically dem democratic systems don't fight with other democratic systems. Okay. In short. Good. And the lady, please, and be very short, please. We are already running out of time. Uh, hello, my name is Maria Berlinska. Uh, my both grandfathers fought against uh, German Nazis in World War II, and I fought against Russian Nazis in, since 2014. Uh, I have a very certain question. Uh, as we are talking about nukes and uh, potential nuke strike um, against Ukraine, uh, my question is, I believe that it's a responsibility of Ukrainian society inside about, uh, in order of preparation, but it's also a responsibility of Western world as well as we all together, as is our common values. So uh, please, could, me, could you please tell me uh, what certain thing, things you can do for Ukrainians to prevent this nuke strike, the first mm -hmm. thing. And the second one, my question is... Sorry, could you please keep... I have yeah, to keep the well, time frame. Uh, my question is very certain. 
You know, I, I risk my life every day with my friends. So where is American tanks? Where is German tanks? Where is air defense systems? Could you please tell me? Because it's, uh, uh, we, we don't need boots on the grounds, but we need uh, weapons. Could okay. you please tell me when you will send us this enough of weapons? Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have several quite diverse issues, which I expected in this framework. Uh, ben, you had been addressed uh, more the, the conscription issue, the military issue. Maybe you start. The others I will raise later on. Okay, so uh, Sweden and Finland, I think, are the model. Uh, Estonia, very close uh, for Europe, uh, for rapid mobilization, uh, but also uh, for societal resilience. Uh, in Sweden, they have a program where children in the very early years of their education are taught how to become critical thinkers when they're watching news programs, for example. So to be critical, that, making that as part of education. And also, um, governments talk to their citizens like they are adults. Don't be scared to say, hey, you're gonna have, we're going to pay more taxes in order to have more security. And yes, we're going to practice things. Um, talk to your citizens like they are adults. And don't be, don't be uh, afraid to, to do that. Mr. Klimpersch, one issue was raised about Ukraine, the next steps, fights, how we can support an issue for Germany, I think, as well. But I'm not supposed to, to answer where are the tanks, right? No, well, like the, we yeah. leave this question <laughs> rather to others. Uh, you know what, I'll just uh, touch on one thing. Um, with nukes, with blackmailing of using of the nuclear uh, tactical a weaponry against Ukraine, I think we all find ourselves in, in totally surreal situation. Ukraine, among the, to put it very mildly, the very few countries in the world that has given up nuclear arsenal, is being threatened with nuclear weapons. And then the whole world, including, you know, we, we deeply appreciate all the support that we are getting from the, from the US, from the UK, from other, from other nations and so on. But guys, we did have that fig leaf, which is called Budapest Memorandum. And supposedly, that should have meant something exactly, maybe now it's the time to reinvigorate it. Because otherwise, there are dire consequences for any NPT in the future and for any um, possibility to ensure that, that we have some restraints or constraints for any uh, state that wants to, to acquire nuclear power. So I think that right now we would like to see much more straightforward readiness of many nations who have the capacity to actually say very directly what they are ready to do in response. And don't be afraid to escalate. Putin and Russian Federation does not need an invitation to escalate. They are doing it every single day. Well, <laughs> I have to really cut now. It's an awkward issue for moderators to cut these interesting discussions. Because I think we have a lot of topics identified, which I would love to, to continue next time. This is, goes way beyond the issue of Ukraine that goes into the very core and heart of our societies, for liberal open societies. I would like to thank you and please have a clap to all of our guests here. Thank you very much for your contributions from the audience. Thank you for the organizers and, well, up to the next session. Thank you very much. So, Western democracies, as we've just heard, are dealing with malign influence from the Kremlin. But what about influence from Beijing? Well, we have another transatlantic trends poll for you, if we can get that up on the... Uh, up on, there we go. And this trends poll, again, this is from the Bertelsmann Foundation, as well as the German Marshall Fund, done on both sides of the Atlantic, this transatlantic trends poll. It shows that majorities on both sides of the Atlantic see Chinese influence in global affairs as negative. Well, but why? Our final panel today, ending this program, will 
It's a panel discussion offering some insights. It, the session should look, will look at China and the notion of China's splendid isolation. It's a concept you may already be familiar with. But before that gets underway, I just want to say at this point, thank you. It's been my pleasure being with you. I'm going to bow out at this point. After this session, we're going to have Katarzyna Pizaska back up with you, who has done an amazing job putting this whole War uh, Warsaw Security Forum together. And now, it's my great pleasure to introduce someone uh, whose judgment and insights I've valued now for years, uh, particularly on China, the wonderful Teresa Fallon, the founder and director of the Center for Russia, Europe, Asia Studies. The stage is yours. Thank you. Hello, I'm so glad that you're here still. We saved the best for last, and I'm so delighted to see you here for this very important panel. We're gonna dive right in. I know that's been a long two days, um, but China has been so much in the news. The Shanghai Cooperation Organization, how many of you heard of this before? I think I've never seen so many people pay attention to the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting that happened recently in Uzbekistan, precisely because of the optics between Russia and China, the Xi Putin meeting. So I think the world is really engaged on how the, what this means in this region, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. We understand that Russia and China, everyone's trying to tease out what type of relationship they have and what does this mean for security issues as well, especially in regard to Ukraine and the war that's taking place there. So let's begin our discussion. We have an excellent panel here. Uh, I'm gonna start off with Reinhard Budikofer, who's an expert on transatlantic relations and Russia and China, and China US relations. So can you give us a state of play of how uh, you see the landscape right now? Thank you first for having me. I do believe that we're just experiencing a very historic moment in the developing of China's international role. The um, no limits friendship that Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin signed at the beginning of February amounts to a revisionist pact that aims for overturning the international order and creating a uh, post-Westphalian order where authoritarian regimes would dominate global relations. China has been more aggressive with its foreign policy over the last years than we used to know from them. And I don't see any change coming anytime soon. Uh, a few weeks from today, uh, in fact, on the 16th of October, the CCP will organize its 20th party conference, and Xi Jinping will be crowned party emperor for life. And I think he will double down on absolute control domestically and an aggressive policy where they don't aim for self-isolation. They aim for constructing, constructing an alternative system of international relations that would put them at the center of the global stage. Thank you very much. This kind of follows up naturally for what's happening to Lithuania. It's a country that has experienced China's economic coercion. You've been on the front line. Uh, now it's called the 14 plus one, but originally it was the 16 plus one. It's a sub-regional grouping uh, of Central Eastern European countries. Please tell us how you see the landscape right now. So um, first of all, I want to apologize to everyone. I had a very bad case of COVID and now, now I have a temporary memory glitch. So that's the note, sorry. But talking about uh, Lithuania, uh, yes, we disrupted that regional format 17 plus one, which in uh, uh, the essence was not actually for cooperation. It was one of the long-term strategies of China to divide European Union. So of course there could be only one format, European Union format. So 
Lithuania left it, and then Latvia and Estonia left it, and I'm hoping that instead of 14 plus 1, it will cease to exist like this. But we had a very consistent and systematic approach towards uh, China as a threat because our institutions, our uh, special services and intelligence agencies have been telling for years that China is a threat. So first we limited their ability to invest and control into our critical infrastructure. Look at Greece, the seaport of Piraeus, what happened there, so we had lessons to learn then uh, ability of them to expand 5G network based on Huawei technologies because they always have back doors and if you want to broadcast all your information to China, hello, you are welcome there. And then my resolution on Uyghur genocide as a co-chair and one of co-founders of IPAC in their Parliamentary Alliance on China, I was really happy to sponsor it and I got the honor badge sanctioned by China and then of course our uh, Taiwanese representative office in Lithuania and our discussion about the name of that office. So how we're doing? We're doing okay. We have partners, we have understanding from European Commission, and even though I'd say as a Lithuanian, because we're stubborn and very direct people, in the beginning there was confusion, but now I think everybody has this wake-up call that China is going to get more and more aggressive, and globally, China's threat is no less than Russia's. Thank you very much. I'd like to turn to Uli now. Uh, I, I had the opportunity to live both in Russia and China, and I did that back to back. Some analysts have described uh, the, the current situation between Xi and Putin as being handcuffed to a corpse. Maybe you can describe how you see, from Germany's point of view, how this Rus Russia-China relationship is working out. Well, thank you very much. At first, uh, China's plans are deeply disturbed by uh, the war that's not been uh, win by um, Putin. And the friendship between the two, um, that was built in 200 hours, I believe, on 39 meetings they had together. That's uh, something special in international relations. And we remember the times when uh, KPC or uh, the uh, KP of the UDS, USSR um, weren't, were enemies in a way, and now they, they turned to a friendship. They reduced uh, boarding control, uh, border control, they made maneuvers uh, in the region, and so China has a friendship with Russia, but the plans of China are disturbed. So she is, was on a slow path to get the new superpower in Asia, and he wanted to get the number one place in the world. And I think there was an insurance made on the visit uh, that Putin has uh, to uh, Beijing in front of the Olympic Games. And that insurance was only for the moment when the war wouldn't go the way he thought it would be. So everybody thinks that two weeks in between uh, Olympic Games and Paralympics were the time when Ukraine should have fallen, and then they would have been combined with the Belarusian Russian Union. And at that moment, everything would be fine, and China could go onwards, uh, going on Taiwan and all that. And the insurance is now taken, and uh, she realized that that's not good for his standing in the world, for his economy. He relies on the economy. His nationalism in China relies on that economy. And that's what I see as the point uh, of the going down of the friendship between the two, because the long-term plans from China uh, are not functioning with uh, Russia, with Vladimir Putin anymore. Thank you very much. I'm going to turn to General Petraeus with your expertise in Central Asia. How do you see the, the, the balance now playing out between Russia and China? Because we saw the Global Security Initiative being pushed at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and Putin has really kind of diminished. Uli mentioned the February 4th No Limits Agreement that was signed before the Olympics, and everyone was very deeply concerned about that. And now, fast forward to just a few months later, and Putin, the timing couldn't have been worse. He looked so weak. People were disrespecting him, showing up late for meetings. How do you see this play out, and what will that mean for the bigger geopolitical picture? Well, let me start, I guess, with the, very quickly, the China-Russia relationship, then Central Asian states, and then let me give it some global perspective. But first, let me just note that I salute everyone who is still here in the seats. Uh, you get a, an A-plus uh, big time for effort. Uh, and I also 
we recognize that we are all that stand between you and a beer at the final reception. So uh, don't worry, the clock is ticking down. 26 minutes and 21 seconds. Um, first of all, I think that the, I think you characterize the relationship between President Putin and President Xi just right. Yes, it was announced as a partnership without limits, but it's very clear there are limits. China has not, for example, uh, unfrozen the $300 billion worth of foreign reserves that are in uh, China that Russia has there. Remember, Russia tried to uh, de-risk itself by placing $600 billion of foreign reserves around the world, never thinking that everyone would actually freeze those they have, including China. Uh, China has also not sold them any kind of military hardware, microchips. They have not violated that export control established by the U.S. and others. Um, so there are very distinct limits. And I think it really shows that, in truth, this relationship is not one between equals. This is a transactional relationship. China is happy to buy natural gas from Russia, especially when the price is down. Uh, it's happy to, again, get other energy resources and so forth. But at the end of the day, um, again, they're not going to be there for Russia when the going really gets tough, and they have not been. And in fact, President Xi clearly, as did uh, Prime Minister Modi, is, uh, expressed reservations, concerns, challenges uh, that, in fact, President Putin had to acknowledge when they had their summit meeting. Um, the Central Asian states, I think quite clearly, are drawing back a bit uh, from Russia. Uh, it's very instructive to see Kazakhstan, uh, which welcomed Russian paratroopers into Almaty when they had demonstrations right before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but since then has actually drawn back and again has also sought n not to get involved uh, in Ukraine. Uh, and has concerns about what is going on, needless to say. But if we put it in perspective, and I think this is actually very important, perhaps as a final session for this particular forum, which understandably has been preoccupied, as all of us have, with the situation in Ukraine, Russia's unprovoked invasion, and the extraordinary performance of the Ukrainian armed forces and people. It's worth remembering that especially perhaps arguably from a U.S. perspective, I am American after all, the U.S. is like the guy in the circus who has to get a lot of plates spinning and keep them all spinning. So there is a China plate, there's a Russia plate. These are all the, the challenges, if you will. Uh, and there are innumerable challenges. And they're each represented, if you will, in this metaphorical image of the guy who gets a plate spinning. Uh, there's a North Korea plate. The Russia plate's gotten much bigger. It's much more pronounced, it's much more urgent right now, but there are still, there's an Iran plate, perhaps Iran plates, because there are different uh, threats that it poses. There are still individual plates that represent the individual Islamist extremist groups that are still active in various parts of the world. There are cyber threat plates. Again, the list goes on. There's even a domestic populism uh, issue, uh, as the previous panel discussed. But the China plate is bigger and more important than all of the other plates put together. It can never be allowed to fall. Now, the U.S. has allies and partners, and it, again, great to see the EU response uh, as it has drawn together. And this is, the, therefore, the objective of this administration in particular, but really of the U.S. in a bipartisan fashion, is to have a comprehensive, integrated whole of governments with an S on the end, because again, all the allies and partners approach to China, most significantly to deter, to dissuade uh, the policymakers in Beijing from ever taking a decision that could result in actual conflict. That is crucial, and we're very seized with that. The key is deterrence that rests on two elements. It's the potential adversary's assessment of your capabilities. We're working hard to transform those together with allies and partners, and then the willingness to employ those capabilities, which we're also uh, seeking to demonstrate. And frankly, the response to Ukraine has been quite impressive in that regard, I think. But that perspective, I think, is actually really, really important, even maybe especially at a conference which is so seized with the issue that is so nearby. Uh, but nonetheless, the big issue facing the world is the relationship 
most significantly of the U.S., but also then the EU and all other countries uh, with China uh, and making sure that that relationship never evolves into conflict. Buti, I see you, you nodding your head, and I'm reminded that the title is Tran The Changing Transatlantic Landscape and Worldwide Interests. And I looked at your, your um, blog, uh, and you wrote about the TTC. And how do you see transatlantic relations evolving in regard to China? Because there seems to be a desire to coordinate economically and to kind of not share certain technologies with Beijing. How is that going in your point of view? Well, we had a wonderful period of globalism in the last three decades arising, and so all the economy of the world um, made a big of boundary. So Germany is involved on the Chinese market with big players like Volkswagen or BMW. Uh, on the one side, it's part of markets, so we have um, big economic uh, relations with the US as European Union, but also with China. But talking about uh, system rivalry, we are, out of my opinion, right in a system war already. And we have transatlantic relations, NATO, the US helped uh, Europe in, uh, after the Second World War, it helped Germany to become that uh, country of freedom and democracy that we are today. And um, I don't want to live in a Chinese-ruled world uh, with a social credit system and all that stuff. And I want to be in a democratic free world. And so, you see, what I would like to, to say is that if U.S. has to go to conflict with China, NATO is, out of my opinion, not one way. It's also in the other way around. So if China takes U.S. In, into a conflict, or China is installing nukes, 250 uh, nukes are new installed um, who have arranged to, uh, to reach Washington DC. I always tell the people, if you can reach Washington DC by China, you can reach every point in Europe as well. And so we are all endangered by what's happening right now. And that's uh, my answer to your question. Okay, thank you. General Petraeus gave me a two-finger. We'll keep it short and sharp because the clock is ticking sure. by. And if you want to jump in as well, just give me a signal. I, I think the biggest geopolitical development of the past decade, at the least, if not a little bit longer, has been the evolution of the world from one that could be described as an era of benign globalization, in which ec economics largely determined geopolitics, to an era of renewed great power rivalries in which geopolitics are largely determining economics, are constraining it. And I don't say that just because I'm the chairman of the KKR Global Institute, but we have seen this transform during my nine plus years uh, at KKR where geopolitics are now becoming vastly more important in every investment opportunity that we examine. I would agree with that. A hundred percent, but I don't think that transatlantic partners are fully living up to that analysis. There are positive efforts like the Trade and Tech Council, or that we coordinate efforts to get the right candidates elected at the helm of international institutions and organizations, but there are also um, obvious downsides. Look at the recent legislation in the U.S., the IRA. It's a great example of protectionism and economic nationalism, and it hurts transatlantic cooperation. If we want to stand up to China, we have to work together. And that implies that we need each other. We around Europe have known for 70 years that we can't stand tall without the United States. But in the present day and age, the US will not win the race with the Chinese without teaming up with the allies. If you want to team up with allies, you have to play a partnership game, another nationalist and protectionist game. So we're not fully where we should be.
I couldn't agree more with Reinhardt. And uh, to say frankly, I've been saying a couple of years that uh, China, as a long-term player, long strategy player, as different from us for on our short political cycles, we can't see more than, I don't know, four or five years, depending on the country. China is taking notes on what Russia is going to do with Ukraine. And our main, I don't know, winning point is that we, as it was told during those two days numerous times, surprised even ourselves by being able to play as a team. We have to play as a team regarding China as well, and I agree with Reinhardt, because again, what will happen to Taiwan is being decided now in Ukraine. Because it's not only about the victory, about weakening of the main imperialistic, genocidal, murdering state in our region, Russia, but it is also the, like instruction for China. Is it going to be too painful? Is it going to be efficient? Are we going to finally move from uh, punishment to denial? That's the most important thing. And then when we look at the strategy of China, if I you know, can run ahead a little bit because the time is pressing us, China is actually very successfully using the war in Ukraine for its alternative uh, strategy, this so-called string of pearls, which is going to suffocate Europe and Asia and Africa. And from Djibouti to Equatorial Guinea to Pakistan, to Greece, Pyrenees uh, um, seaport, and again, hello, my unhappy COVID, to Sri Lanka, to Solomon Islands. This string of pearls is being constructed right now. And just to mention some very cool moments, I mean, when they are parading their really heavily militarized intelligence ships in some seaports where, for example, India is heavily protesting that, but how many of us are talking about it? How many of us understand that now we are in an even bigger teamwork, democracy against autocracy, and there are countries that are sitting on the fence. So yes, let's not forget another huge player, India, which is now sitting on the fence because 65% of their armors, arms are made in Russia. But if Russian military industry collapses, then it could be a chance for us to get India off of, this, of the fence. So yes, let's not be naive. It's not regional, and it's not like United States and China. Now, the fate of all our world is being decided for at least a decade. That's a really good point where I would like to add something. You mentioned 16 plus one. It's 16 because Lithuania left that group. And I can only tell the people, think about what's happening. We have to be on a one Europe policy against a one China policy. If somebody of us is attacked by China in the European Union, it's our part to stand together and tell China, no, that's not possible. We are not uh, a club of 27 who is just in for there for the good times, but also for the bad times. And that's something we uh, approving right now in our support for Ukraine. And just a, a quick note, because I heard some noises in the audience. It was uh, 17 plus one when Greece joined, it went from 16 to 17. Lithuania was the first country to leave, and then we've seen the Baltics leave. And I have good rumors in Brussels that two more are going to be leaving soon, so it'll be 12 plus one. So I think the Chinese perhaps learned a lesson, never put a number on these organizations because it becomes a barometer of relations. So, uh, but what I wanted to talk about also on this, because Beijing, the idea of Halford McKinder's the his, his, uh, historical pivot, the, uh, a geopolitical paper published in 1904. The Chinese, to my mind, really take this seriously. That's why we, they tried to create this sub-regional grouping, because they really feel that whoever controls Eastern Europe controls the, you know, the island, the continent. So they, they really invested this idea, but it hasn't proved it was over-promising and under-delivering. Nevertheless, everyone's watching quite closely now because after Ukraine, there seemed to be a big break with Europe and China. So many people are concerned, perhaps by uh, a rapprochement, China is going to start traveling again. Chinese diplomats will be making a lot of visits to Europe, trying to patch things up. How, are we, how do you see that? And in addition, uh, there's lots of rumors circulating in Brussels that both Macron and Schultz will be traveling to Beijing. 
how is that going to affect EU policy? Because we know that China's strategy is always to try to drive wedges in the transatlantic relationship. And economics will be very key in all of this, especially in a post-COVID inflation, high energy landscape. So how, how are we going to be able to keep the EU all together? Who wants to grab that one? Okay, Reinhardt. Well, President Biden talks to Xi, so why should Scholz and Macron not talk to him? The question is not whether they talk, but what they say. And um, if they stick to a good balance of dialogue and deterrence, I'm all for it. And I believe indeed that um, this is something where Europe should play a role. Deterring China against an aggressive course that the country seems to be about to pursue even more strongly than they have. Everybody has heard President Biden saying four times that the U.S. would come to the defense of Taiwan. Every single time his administration has um, uh, corrected his remarks, but even if you're a very uh, gaff-prone person, you don't put your foot in the mouth four times just the same way. So that is indeed signaling a ch change of policy. And I think that's adequate. Because when the um, policy of strategic ambiguity was developed decades ago, the military balance between Taiwan and, and China was very different from what it is today. If the U.S. would not come to the support of Taiwan in the case of an attack, Taiwan would fall into the lap of Xi Jinping. And that would be the end of any credibility of the United States as an ally and guarantor of peace and stability around the globe. Because of that, Japan is also moving. And I believe, and Australia is going to move. And I believe Europe should also move. Now, I don't foresee a real relevant, really relevant um, military role that we could play. But we should develop a policy of deterrence in the economic and in the political sphere. And that, of course, presupposes that we get rid of some of the dependencies that we have developed. If a German company makes... Um, rakes 50% of its profits and does 40% of its turnover in China, they have put too many eggs into that one basket. That's a dependency we cannot allow ourselves to be uh, subjected to. So I think there's a lot to do where Europe has to play a role. And I don't subscribe to a theory that I often hear that the European task would be limited to the European subcontinent and we should uh, watch what Russia does and leave the Indo-Pacific to the United States. I think Europe should also play a role in the Indo-Pacific. No, I agree here, with here. you. And we've, we've seen uh, Indo-Pacific strategy at the EU level. Germany has updated theirs even. France, the Netherlands, they all have an Indo-Pacific strategy. So I think that this is a really positive development. And in addition, Czech Republic, which is a landlocked country, one of the things that they're um, promoting during their EU rotating presidency is Indo-Pacific strategy. So I think we're seeing consistency from the French, now the Czech presidency, and then uh, the next presidency will be Sweden, and they are also picking up the Indo-Pacific thread. So I think it's quite clear that Europe sees this as very important. And I just want to pick up on your point about one first time as a gaffe when President Biden uh, talked about Taiwan. Uh, fourth is a policy, four times saying, so we call it gaffe ambiguity. <laughs> gaffe ambiguity, I think we can try to uh, coin a new term. But I think uh, you wanted to chime in there. Uh, well, actually, Talking to a genocidal um, emperor, I think, is very risky. So then again, uh, to be very direct, it's very important not to make the mistake which was made with Russia, believing that there can be an agreement with genocidal murderer, because that's who they are. And the states themselves are like this. 
And based on that, I just think that we need to have in our heads a warning that some people believed that there could be agreement with Russia, well, maybe from some of our American friends, agreement with Russia to have them at least not on China's side when the global conflict erupts. But I think that's as naive as thinking that maybe we could have China not at least on Russia's side if the conflict develops further. Because so far, and let me tell that also openly, Russia has been wonderfully synchronizing with China. China has grand strategies. Russia has none. Russia is a street fighter. So whenever China needs something, you know, from global development initiative, which then turned to global security initiative, Russia barks like a dog in all international organizations, disrupts the process, makes chaos, and etc. They are synchronizing. Let's not be naive. I, I would also challenge a little bit the assumption that because uh, Xi Jinping is unhappy with the lack of success of the Russian aggression, that he would be moving away from Putin strategically. I don't believe that for a second. Their alliance is built on uh, mutual benefit and shared grievance, and it is designed to create a new world order. That is, as the NATO strategy says, posing dangers to our interests, us, our values, and our democratic way of life. And tactically, they operate differently. China has many more tools than Russia has. Russia just has a military. China has an economy and all that. But, and they're not marching in lockstep. But whenever they disagree tactically, and China doesn't want to pay a high price for backing up Putin, we should not be deluded into believing that they're not strategic allies. Exactly. I think that that one phrase that uh, Putin read from a card, so clearly he was told to read it, stating that he understood that China had concerns, made the media go crazy, and they're like, oh my gosh, there's a rift, but I don't think that's the case at all. That's all it took for people to see some daylight between Russia and China, which is what they want in some areas, especially in Europe. They want them to think that there's some sort of a rift in order to claw back more influence. But I think that they are... They agree to disagree on certain areas, but they have a greater goal together strategically to kind of change the system and work. It's better for China to have Russia in the tent than outside the tent because Russia is a huge disruptor. So we have just a few moments left. Why don't we go through and give us your last comments? Well, it's obvious that the partnership between Russia and China has developed over decades. We saw that on Security Council in the last years um, on, on the UN system. Uh, we saw that on the um, project uh, they had in Venezuela when uh, China was financing and Russia was defending Maduro. At that conflict, uh, we saw it in the emergence of the, the BRICS. Uh, partnership. We saw it on the Asian Development Bank and all that stuff that was done and also on the same financing system they tried to um, to raise up so having something against SWIFT. So I don't see that that is all broken away but China is not pleased that um, their plans are disturbed too early. So I think that uh, it would have been fine if Ukraine would have fallen in two weeks and everything would have been good between the two of them. But now China has to find a way to, to cope with the situation, but don't want to let loose of, of, uh, of Russia. But a weakened junior partner, Russia, with all the resources uh, on stage for China's hunger uh, on resources and economical uh, development, that's a wonderful situation for Xi. General Petraeus. Let me make three points if I could. Uh, the first is that I think it should be very clear, at least clearly stated, that there is bipartisan support in Washington for the policy on China that began with the previous administration and has continued in this administration. This is one of those issues in a, an incre increasingly partisan city uh, on which there is bipartisan agreement. Ukraine would be another example I would submit. The second is that when I describe the comprehensive approach, 
One of the elements which didn't come out here that I think is hugely important and that involves very significantly the U.S. and EU and U.K. Uh, and then others uh, in the Indo-Pacific, Japan in particular, is that we need to compete with the Belt and Road Initiative. You mentioned the String of Pearls, of course, the land, that's the maritime uh, activity. On, on the ground, it is, again, the Belt and Road connecting uh, Asia with Europe. We need to compete and we need to do it together because only that's the only way we can generate the resources that can truly compete. And it should be that promotes our values, our, our traditions and so forth. And then the third, I strongly agree that what, matter, what happens in Ukraine will reverberate very significantly throughout the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and un the unfortunate withdrawal from Afghanistan and the way that was conducted was seized by President Xi personally as an example that the U.S. was not a dependable partner. He stated that and that we were a great power in decline. I would contend that the response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated exactly the opposite uh, by all uh, engaged, and we have to keep that in mind. It is hugely significant uh, that the outcome in Ukraine is one of victory of democracy over kleptocracy. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the, the audience. It was a shortened panel. I'm sorry about that, but I think that we have such great pros here. And we also have to keep in mind, we have the Party Congress coming up. Uh, Reinhold Buterkofer is going to have a panel on that. So tune in to that, please, for more information. And also, we should remember, you know, this is uh, an ideological battle. It, what was so interesting after the, or right before the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting, number three person in the Chinese Communist Party, Li Jiangshu, traveled to Moscow. And he, you know, they, they tailored their message for different audiences. So on one hand, they're saying these things like, we have concerns, but then Li Jiangshu, the, the Russians released the videotape of him speaking to the Duma saying, we're with you boys, you know, we're, we back you 100%. And so the, the Russians were rather annoyed by that. So we should also keep that in mind that they tailored the message thinking that the door is closed and no one is really uh, going to broadcast it. The Russians chose to broadcast it to show that the Chinese were behind them. But there's one little piece that wasn't even reported on. And Li Jiangshu traveled to Lenin's the place where he died, the house that he died in, uh, that's on the outskirts of Moscow. So it took time for him to go there. So I think the message is ideological, back for the domestic audience in, in China saying, you know, Russia is our ideological buddy. I mean, this is how the, the, the narrative that they're trying to, to shape. So I think, watch this page, Xi Jinping doesn't tweet. We don't know a whole lot about him, but we're, everyone's trying to understand where China's going. We're gonna have Xi Jinping, it appears, for quite some time. So thank you for your attention, and I'm so delighted that you're here. Let's give it a round of applause for Reinhard Budakoffer, Ulrich Lechte, General Petraeus, and Dovila Shakti Lin. This is a wrap up uh, of the Warsaw Security Forum. I would like to thank you so much for being with us for the last two days. Uh, it was over uh, 100 different sessions, formats, 2,000 participants, over 200 speakers, uh, and of course, a lot of advocacy on behalf of Ukraine uh, for Ukraine to win this war. Thank you to our partners, thank you to our, uh, our uh, sponsors, and we wish uh, to see you all, and we hope to see you all next year, uh, hopefully uh, in a Europe whole uh, and free, and with Ukraine having won the war. So thank you very much, and I just would want to ask you to stay for a minute to recognize our team, who's going to join me in just a second on the stage.